This 12 hour vocal production and mixing course is going to turn you into an absolute pro at getting that radio ready vocal sound. And if you've ever recorded vocals, expect them to sound like this. But then they actually end up sounding like this. Sweet self sabotaging out on me, flooding. Then everything you need to know is inside this course. You'll learn how to get high quality vocal recordings from the get go, how to comp and edit your vocals, creative vocal production like dubs, harms, and stacks, and finally taking a deep dive into vocal mixing with EQ, compression, delay, reverb, and more. If you watch this whole course and complete the practice activities, there's no way you're gonna come out the other side and not be extremely confident at producing and mixing professional quality vocals. Okay, let's dive in. If you're new here, then welcome to marshing.com. Our mission is to re-engineer audio education from the ground up and create a more impactful way to learn mixing, mastering, and production. Now, we created a free vocal EQ cheat sheet that goes with this course. And EQ is the most important tool you're gonna be using when it comes to shaping the sound of your vocal, which is why I highly recommend you go grab that free cheat sheet and reference it as you're going through the course and applying what you learn. And we've also included some additional resources to help you follow along, including assignments and multiple multi-tracks to practice on. So just click the link in the description below and enter your email address to get access to those free resources so you can follow along properly with the course. All right, I'm gonna hand you off to Chris Georgiou in just a second, otherwise known as Takota. He's a professional producer from here in the UK and an incredible teacher. I think you're gonna really like him. And he's gonna kick things off with section one, which is vocal recording. After that, section two is comping and editing. Section three is vocal arrangement and workflow. And finally, section four is vocal mixing. All right, take it away, Chris. Welcome to section one. We are going to be covering room reflection and minimizing them, some basic signal flow, microphone selection and placement, and some tips for getting the best performance. Let's jump in. This course assumes that you have the basic requirements of a home studio setup, namely a laptop, headphones, microphone, audio interface and any form of digital audio workstation to allow you to capture those recordings. That being said, I'm going to walk you through some observations to guide you through getting stellar recordings from even the most modest setup. Basic signal flow for recording. So what exactly is signal flow? Well, think of it as the journey your voice takes from the moment you sing into the microphone and when it's captured by your recording software. Let's break it down step by step. Step one, the microphone. This is where your voice is first picked up. Now, if you're just starting out, you might have a USB microphone, which simplifies things, or an XLR microphone that connects to an audio interface. For today, let's assume you're using an XLR microphone with an audio interface. Step two, connecting to the audio interface. The next stop is your audio interface. This is a crucial piece of equipment that connects your microphone to your computer. You'll use an XLR cable to connect the microphone to the audio interface. Step three, adjusting input levels. Now on your audio interface, you'll find input level controls. These determine how much signal is being sent to your recording software. It's important not to set these too high as it can lead to distortion. Aim for peaks around minus 10 to minus 6 dB. Step four, the door, digital audio workstation. From your audio interface, the signal goes into your door, your recording software. This is where the magic happens. Open up your door like Logic, Ableton Pro Tools or any other you prefer, create a new track and make sure it's set to record from your audio interface. Step five, monitoring your voice. As you start recording, you'll want to listen to your voice in real time. This is where headphones come in. Connect your headphones to the audio interface so you can hear yourself as you sing. Close back headphones are ideal to prevent sound leakage into your microphone. And as a side note, you just wanna make sure to turn off your monitors so they don't get picked up by your microphone. The importance of a clean signal path from the microphone to your recording software. Ensuring a clean signal path from the microphone to the recording software is so crucial in achieving high quality vocal recordings. A clean signal path means that the audio signal travels without interference or degradation through each component of the recording chain. 
If you hear buzzing, humming, crackling, etc., you want to get to the source of what's causing that and stop recording until you've figured that out. To maintain a pristine signal, pay careful attention to cable quality, proper connection of equipment, and setting optimal input level. By prioritizing a clean signal path, you create the foundation for capturing the true essence of your voice, allowing for greater flexibility and precision during the editing and mixing stages. It's important to emphasize not getting bogged down with the fine details here. Use what you have and work towards upgrading as your skills and demand require you to invest in more advanced gear and tools. But for the sake of covering all bases, let's delve into some of the fundamentals you need to wrap your head around to get started. Picture your room as your singing playground. Unwanted echoes? They're like having extra players on the field. Not always helpful. So let's talk about some simple tricks to make sure it's just you and your voice playing the game. Number one, know your echo enemies. First off, let's understand where these reflections come from. Hard surfaces like walls, ceilings, and floors can bounce sound around. We want to soften those bounces. Two, blankets and pillows for the win. Think cozy. Hang up some blankets, use pillows, or even ask your grandma for that super fluffy rug she's got lying around. These soft materials catch sound and make sure it doesn't bounce around too much. Three, magic traps for low sounds. Bass traps might sound fancy, but they're like secret agents for the low end. Stick them in the corners where low end reflections like to hide. They'll make your singing sound super clear. Four, play with sound bouncers. Diffusers are like sound bouncers. They scatter reflections without making your room too quiet. They come in cool shapes and you can hang them up or put them around your space. Five, place your mic in the right spot. Think of your microphone like a friend who doesn't like reflections. Keep it away from walls and reflective materials. Get a friend to help you with the mirror trick. If you can't see the mic in the mirror, you're good to go. Six, if your singing room has a carpet, awesome. Carpets love soaking up sound, so you're already on the right track. Seven, get crafty with DIY tricks. Now, if you're feeling creative, DIY is the way to go. Make your own sound catcher. Use things like old blankets, pillows, or even mattresses. Now, the main goal here is to minimize the sound of the room as much as possible, especially around the immediate places that you are recording. So, for example, you want to make sure behind you or behind the singer, there is some form of absorption there, some form of absorption around the microphone, and some form of absorption either above your head and below you. This is going to give you that tight, clean, upfront sound that we're all used to hearing. So to give you some practical steps, the main thing that you want to focus on is making sure that as much of you if you are the singer or as much of the singer is being isolated around the microphone and the singing position. And depending on your budget and your room, you're going to have to get crafty. You may have the budget to be able to invest in some acoustic treatment or to have a gobo which surrounds you or surrounds the singer and the singing environment or you might have a reflection filter, or you might want to invest in a Chaotica eyeball or some variant of that. Or you can simply use what you have, which is extremely effective. And I have done a ton of recordings which have been done in a home studio setup, just using blankets, towels, pillows, bedding, etc. to deaden the immediate environment around the singer and gotten a really nice tight clean and professional sound. So don't feel like you have to invest a ton of money or buy a lot of material and build it. You can just use what you have for now and tackling those immediate reflection points is going to be critical for getting that really clean sound. So to summarize for simplicity, you want to make sure that the area behind the singer, around the microphone, left and right of the singer and of the microphone has some absorption and below and above has absorption as well. Depending on the microphone, you'll have to adjust this to taste and to the demands of 
the room that you're in. Have fun with it and experiment until you get the desired sound that you want. Microphone selection and placement. Think of your microphone as a precise tool designed to showcase your voice while eliminating unnecessary background noise. In this section, we'll explore the simplicity and importance of finding the sweet spot where your voice will sound clean and tight. Establishing a solid foundation is key to ensuring your vocals can be produced and mixed at a top-notch level, aiming for that perfect 10 out of 10 score. Emphasizing this point is crucial because the quality of your source material ultimately determines the greatness of the final sound, and so paying meticulous attention to these concepts will significantly enhance the outcomes in all the subsequent steps. Now, there are a ton of different types of microphones, but for beginners, you'll likely encounter two main ones, condenser and dynamic. Condenser microphones are akin to a high resolution camera for your voice. They capture a wide range of frequencies and nuances, making them ideal for detailed recordings, especially softer sounds like vocals and acoustic instruments. Now these microphones are a lot more sensitive, so they're very suitable for studio environments that are controlled, where room tuning has occurred, and where there is some form of isolation. Dynamic microphones are for more robust performance. Dynamic microphones are the workhorses of the microphone world. They handle higher sound pressure levels, making them perfect for louder environments like live performances, micing guitar amps, and drums. Their robust construction makes them less prone to damage from rough handling or accidental drops. But what's also worth mentioning, which is super important, is that working in a room that is less ideal in terms of noise or lack of treatment, sometimes a dynamic microphone will be your best friend. I like to think of them as more forgiving. So if you have a dynamic microphone or you're in a room where you don't have much flexibility in terms of trying to isolate it, a dynamic microphone is really going to be your best friend because it's going to cut out a lot of the gunk that would otherwise be very prominent when using a condenser microphone. I wanted to briefly touch on pop filters. Now pop filters, pop shields or pop screens, they all have slightly different names but they're for the same thing. They're a noise protection filter for microphones and what they do is reduce popping sounds caused by the mechanical impact of fast moving air on the microphone from plosives during recorded speech and singing. So purrs and turs and chers and all of those lovely sounds can sometimes overwhelm the capsule. So we just want to add a pop filter in front of your microphone to minimize that. I personally like to use a metal one. They're a little bit more expensive, but I find that they're more transparent and don't dull the overall tone coming into the microphone. So that's all you need to worry about here. Just buy yourself a pop filter from Amazon and you're good to go. Placing your microphone. Your microphone is like a lens. It needs to be focused. Experimenting with the angle and distance to find your sweet spot where your voice comes through crisply with minimized background noise and reverberation is the art. There's a whole course that could be made just on this, but for the sake of getting us through to nice, tight, clean recordings that we can produce, here are a couple of guidelines. Guideline one is finding the sweet spot. At this point, I wanna bring up the proximity effect. The proximity effect in audio recording refers to the change in the tonal characteristics of a microphone's response when the sound source, i.e. your vocals, get closer to the microphone. As a sound source gets closer to the microphone, there's an increase in low frequency response. This results in a warmer and richer tone in the recorded sound. While the proximity effect can be a useful tool, it's essential to consider the recording environment and the desired sound. In situations where a flat frequency response is crucial, careful mic placement and distance management become more important. Excessive proximity effect if it's not managed properly, can lead to an overly boomy or muddy sound. It's crucial to strike a balance and experiment with mic placement. Imagine your mic has a personal bubble. Get too close and you might overwhelm it. Stay too far and you lose that warmth. Starting about a hand's distance away is a good rule of thumb. Now here's a cool tip. 
If you want a more spacious and open feel to your vocals, try experimenting with a bit more distance. It's all about finding the right balance between intimacy and openness. And only you can be the judge of that for what the song calls for in terms of the tone and production of your vocals. Guideline two is experimenting with angles. Tilt the mic slightly up or down until you find the angle that captures the voice just the way you intend. Now about volume. Picture this. You're in a cooking class and you've put too much salt in your soup. Now you can't take it out. It's kind of like that with recording levels. If it's too loud, it might get distorted. And if it's too soft, it can be challenging to work with. Staying in that minus 10 to minus 60 B range gives you the right ingredients for a perfect vocal dish. Just to clarify if there is any misunderstanding in terms of the minus 10 to minus 60 B, we're talking about the loudest point at which you are singing. So the peak is no louder than minus 6 dB. So when you're in your chorus and you're belting and it's the loudest part of the song, the loudest note that you're going to hit, you want that to be peaking roughly between minus 10 and minus 6. So here is a five-step checklist to optimize microphone placement and manage the proximity effect when recording vocals. And you can check through this every time you sit down or stand up to hit record. First step is mic selection. Choose the right microphone type based on your needs. Step two is to find the sweet spot. Begin with the microphone position about a hand's distance away from your mouth. Experiment with the different distances to find the sweet spot where your vocals sound clear and well balanced. Step three is to experiment with angles. Tilt the microphone slightly up or down to experiment with different angles. This can affect how your voice is captured and help you find the angle that complements your vocal style. Step four is to isolate. Using all the knowledge that we've spoken about already, we want to isolate the immediate reflections around the singer and around the microphone to get a nice, tight, clean signal. Step five is to check the gain coming from your audio interface into your door and making sure that you're hitting the minus 10 to minus 60 B range at the loudest peaks of your singing. At this point, we have covered a ton of technical tips on how to get a tight and clean recording. And now we are at the most important part. Everything we've spoken about so far will become second nature so that you can truly focus on what matters most, which is the performance the nuance and emotion of your vocals. There is no amount of post-production that can fix a rubbish performance. And what we want to do here is facilitate the best environment to be able to foster a great performance. These are magical moments that we've all grown up with listening to songs where we can identify amazing performances that really stand the test of time. And that's the goal here. So I have some tips here on how to foster a great performance during the recording phase. Tip one is to set the scene. Create a comfortable space. Imagine recording in your favorite spot at home, maybe a cozy corner or your go-to chair. This isn't gonna be ideal for the tone of the recording environment, but we want to emulate that by making sure it's comfy and that you feel at ease. The more relaxed you are, the better your vocals will flow. Tip two is hydration is key. Imagine your vocal cords are delicate flowers. They love water. Stay hydrated by sipping water before and during your recording session. It helps your voice to stay fresh, supple, and ready for the performance. You can also try warm herbal tea if that helps too. Step three is to warm up your voice. Just like warming up before a workout, you in these moments are a vocal athlete. It's like giving your voice a gentle wake up call before you dive into belting that chorus. Step four is to focus on emotional intent. We've already touched on this, but this is the real work. Both the artist singing and the engineers in the room wanna work together to capture whatever the emotions in the song are during this phase. This is what really will connect the artist, the song, and the music to the listener. Tip five is to embrace mistakes. They are your friends. It's okay to make mistakes. Your recording software has a magical feature called delete. So if you hit a sour note or stumble on a lyric, embrace it. 
you may end up wanting to use that in the end because it has captured some magical moment. Every great recording has its bloopers and there are a ton of tools to tighten a great vocal performance. So approaching recording with playfulness is super helpful and also way more fun. Tip six is to experiment with different takes. Don't be afraid to try different things. Record a few different takes with various emotions and tones. It's important to experiment through this process and even have some times where you are just playing around with that recording just to see what happens. And all of this is preparation for the big days when you're recording full songs. Tip seven is to break it down section by section. We have a whole section coming up on workflow tips, but if your song has tricky parts, break it down. Record sections separately and then piece them together. It's like solving a musical puzzle and it can make recording less overwhelming. Later on, we're gonna cover comping extensively and this is essentially where you're going to record parts section by section and then pick the best sections and piece them all together into one master take. So recording in sections and chunking things down from the get-go is a really great practice. We're all used to listening to very heavily edited vocals. So getting into this practice is really gonna allow you to create vocal takes that are just as good as your favorite artists. Tip eight is to celebrate small wins. Every step is a victory. If you nail that challenging section, celebrate it. Positive reinforcement goes a long way in building confidence, which will only help your performance. And tip nine is to create an open communication loop. Key into the artist and create a trusting, calm, and open relationship to be able to understand what the artist is needing in the moment, especially if the artist is at the beginning of their journey. Communicate with them consistently to tap into the tools that will bring out the best in their performance. Do they need reverb? Can they hear themselves how they need to? Do they want to stand up, sit down, lie on the floor? It's critical to stay in tune with the singer. This also applies if you are both the artist and engineer. Take moments while you're recording to tune into yourself and see what you need and what you can do to facilitate the best performance you can. Now it's your turn. I want a hands-on exercise so that you guys can apply this because knowledge is nothing without application. So go away, set up your recording environment, select a microphone and experiment with all of the techniques that we've spoken about so far. Play around with placing your mic in different areas, adding absorption when you're recording and seeing how that affects the recording quality and the distance between you and your microphone when you're recording, bearing in mind the proximity effect. It's important to note that there's no right or wrong here. This is a matter of developing the skills and tools and then deciding what aligns for each song and your personal style of recording vocals. So for the sake of demonstrating this visually and taking you through the process of setting up your first audio channel, let's jump into Logic and I'll break everything down that we've covered so far. So we want to click audio, mic, input one, which coincides with the input that my XLR is plugged into. And you can see that the fader, there's green going on, which is good. It means that there's signal going there. So we're good to go. We want to label our track. And now what we want to do is just start recording. So now if I speak and I look at the metering here, we can see that we've got a healthy amount of signal a little bit hot potentially, but for the sake of not getting too complex, I'm recording into compression as well. So I'm intentionally a little bit hotter and I know that those peaks are gonna be tamed as I'm recording. So later on, I will show you a demonstration of my recording chain and we'll go through all of this stuff, which is a little more complex. But for now, this is all we wanna do. We just wanna make sure that we're not too quiet, we're not too hot. There's no audible distortion, there's no buzzing or cracks, pops, anything like that. If there is, stop, check your cables. You might need to replace a cable and then you can resume your recording or just sort that out at a later date 
reschedule recording. So once all of that is sorted, then you're going to want to play around with proximity. So as you can hear, I'm coming in closer now and it's getting a little warmer. And as I go further away, you're getting more spaciousness, you're getting more of the room, it's area, and I sound farther away because I am. So that is where you would play around with your placement to the mic and also your placement within the room. So right now I'm sat at my desk. I'm gonna pick up the mic now and I'm gonna move around my room and see if you can pay attention to how the tone of my voice is sounding and equally how the space around my vocals sounds. So really key into the space around vocals and see if you can pick up if there's any subtle differences that are happening while I'm moving around my room and also playing around with my distance to the mic as well as tilting the mic up and down as I'm speaking. Now all of these subtle differences are going to have an effect on how the vocals perceived and taking the time to experiment with all of this, especially in the context of what the emotion of the song is, is really going to take your vocal recordings to a whole other level of intentionality. All right, so I'm back at my desk now, and hopefully by keying into all of those things, you're able to have a deeper understanding of everything that goes into the art of recording vocals. You've got the technical proficiency to be able to create recordings that are not only tight and clean, but also intentional. It's not just a matter of something being right or wrong. It's a matter of knowing how each tool works and its concepts to allow you to be able to harness those to create the art that you want to create. Welcome to section two. Now that you have the foundation of getting clean and tight recordings with minimal background noise and room reflections, it's time to start editing our vocals. Oftentimes we overlook the editing process and it really is so crucial in getting a tight, clean and professional sound. So in this section, we are going to be covering comping, time aligning, tuning and gain automation. Let's jump in. Section two, comping and editing. What is comping? To kick things off, let's explore the essence of comping. Comping, short for composite, is a recording technique used to assemble the best parts from multiple takes into a single seamless performance. It's like creating a musical puzzle where each piece contributes to the overall masterpiece. Comping can be traced back to the early days of analog recording in the mid 20th century. As technology evolved, the concept of comping emerged as a solution to the limitations of single take recordings. In the pre-digital era, artists faced challenges capturing a flawless performance in a single session. Compiling the best segments from multiple takes became a common practice allowing producers to meticulously assemble a seamless and polished final recording. Imagine recording a vocalist laying down several takes of the same song. Each take may have moments of brilliance, but also some imperfections. Comping allows us to cherry pick the best moments and stitch them together for a flawless end result. How does comping work? Now let's delve into the nitty gritty of how comping works. After recording multiple takes, the producer or engineer meticulously listens to each one, selecting the strongest sections. These chosen sections are then combined into a cohesive performance that showcases the best of the artist's abilities. This process involves cutting and pasting sections from different takes, adjusting timing and pitch if needed, until a seamless vocal track emerges. It's a bit like sculpting where the final piece is the most refined representation of the artist's true potential. So why go through all this trouble of comping? Comping allows us to achieve as close to perfection as possible in recording. It's not about hiding imperfections, it's about showcasing the artist's best moments. It gives us the power to craft a performance that is not limited by the constraints of a single take. 
The benefits extend beyond just fixing mistakes. Comping allows for experimentation and exploration. Artists can try different phrasing, tones and emotions, knowing that the best elements will be combined to create a singular, powerful performance. Achieving vocal excellence. To sum it up, comping is the secret source that transforms good performances into exceptional ones. It's a tool that empowers artists and producers to sculpt the perfect vocal performance, ensuring that every note and every emotional nuance contributes to the overall musical journey of the song. All right, so let's walk through how I go about comping a vocal. So what I'm going to do is take a vocal that I have already finished up the production mix master on. I'm going to pretend that I have to comp it again. So as you can see, I've got the comp here. So I'm going to start with a blank slate and then go through the comping process. Before I do that, I just want to talk through the process of how I think about doing it. So. What I do is a general comp first, so I like to move quickly. I go generally through it, listen on instinct, pick what I think is the best representation of the performance, and then I move on, take a break, come back, listen to it again, and then I listen for any local issues. So if there are any one phrases or one word or anything like that that I feel is potentially problematic, then I will try to get in further and then think about comping certain words or letters in the instance that there is something like that. Then what I do is I fade or bring down breaths with gain automation and I remove any mouth clicks, revisit any problem areas again, and then I'm good to go. So we want to think general, then more localized, breaths, clicks, revisiting problem areas, then you're good to go. So let me show you all of this in action. Now, what I'm thinking when I'm comping is not about tuning and it's not about the timing of it. Now, these are the things that I am going to have the tools to fix. Whereas the emotion and the phrasing of it and the way that it's delivered and the, the vocal tone in which the singer has portrayed, you know, certain lines and phrases in a certain way and the way that they're placing it within their, their voice is something that I can't go back and change. So I'm thinking about the emotion first and foremost and the performance of it. So for that reason, what I do is I put auto-tune while I am listening to it, so that I'm not making all of my decisions based around the imperfection of pitch or timing, because I know that I'm going to fix that. So I want to get this as close to done as possible and think about emotion and performance. So let's start with take one. So I would just go through like so, I'm just going to pretend that I haven't comped this. And I've recorded this within the production session itself, which is something that I never normally do. So this would normally be a bounced stereo track, one file at the top, and then I would record. But for this instance, we had the CPU to be able to do that, which was great. So let's have a listen and see where we're at. You could say that my life is a mess. Okay, so we've got some issues here. It's the first take. Lucy's just getting used to things, you know, playing around with proximity and that kind of thing. So we've got some drop offs. So I would just go through phrase by phrase. You could say that my life is a mess. It's, you could say that my life is a mess. It's, it's is problematic. You could say that my life is a mess. It's, you could say that my life is a mess. It's,
Love that one. You could say that my life is a mess. It's you, you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you, you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. You could say that my life is a mess. It's you could say that my life is a mess. So what I'm listening for there. The initial instinct is how clean is the the overall take in terms of how easy is it for me to listen to? What's the emotion that it's making me feel? And does it lead me to want to listen to the next phrase? For these two takes, we have a slight difference in tone. There's more breath in this one. You could say that my life is a mess. It's, you could say that my life is a mess. It's, as opposed to this one. You could say that my life is a mess. It's, which is more chesty. It's a little further back in the vocal tract. So it's up to me and the artist to decide, do we want to try to use this throughout the song or do we want to use this? And for, for this case, I'm going to go for... You could say that my life is a mess. It's you. This take. You could say that my life is a mess. It's you. And then I'm going to move on. I'm not going to keep stressing over it because I'm going to come back after my break and listen to it again and then make some necessary adjustments. Okay, so these are little warm-up takes. So I'm just going to... Contradicting what everyone else says. Contradicting what everyone else says. Contradicting what everyone else says. Contradicting... Contradicting what everyone... Contradicting what every... Contradicting what everyone else says. Contradicting what everyone else Contradicting what everyone else says Okay, love that Contradicting what everyone else says 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 Okay, we might have some issues with that S. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You could say that my life. Let's have a listen to this part again. Everyone else says. Okay. Everyone else says. Everyone. Let's listen to this take overall. Everyone else says. Everyone else says. Everyone else says. Okay, so that doesn't. The S doesn't carry on all the way through. There's a there's a break. Everyone else says. Everyone else says. I think I prefer it without the break. Everyone else says. 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 So I like that one because off the bat there's less sibilance. You can see that there's softer sibilance in the waveform in terms of how much how much gain is on that S right off the bat, which is nice to my ears. So I'm also thinking about little technical things like that, but that just comes with the territory of, of doing this a million times. So let's move on to the next section. Let's just move on to like five or six. Let me remove the BVs. You're up here living up your best life. You're up here living up your best life. You're up here. You're up here living up your best life. You're up here living up your best. You're up here living up your best life. You're up here living up your best life. But you don't know what's going on. You're up here living up your best life. So I can hear that the the pitch, the the pitch is slightly off here. But I know that when I pop this into Melodyne, this is going to be totally fine. I just need to bring it up a semitone. Living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. 
the inside of that I love. So we've got some pitch stuff going on here. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. But I'm not worried about that. I will get to that when I put that into Melodyne. I love the the breathiness of life, almost whisperiness of it, and then the little bit of inside. A little bit of fry, vocal fry on there, which I think is is really nice. It adds character to the vocals. So let's listen to where we're at. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. You could say that my life... Yeah, not bad. We're, we're in a good place. There is a few little timing things going on here that I would want to, to move around to align with the groove. And you can see that with the the comp itself. I have done that, but that is for another lesson. So we will cover that later on. So that is essentially the, the process of comping. With each door, it's going to be slightly different. Having a comp folder, which is a natural thing that happens in Logic when you record multiple takes, isn't uh, in every single door, but there will be variations to this. The other approach is that you just record different takes like so, and then you add a new audio take and say, call it comp, and then, you know, drag different sections. Say these were different sections, you would be able to do that too. This is a nice, easy get around with logic, but the, the principles are essentially the same. So what I would do is flatten this like this. For some reason it's not merging, don't worry about that. And now I'm going to go in and just listen for the breaths, listen for any unclean edits. So, you know, if there's any choppy bits, I want to make sure that I've got as clean and tight edits as possible that sound transparent and not distracting. And I will bring breaths down if they're too loud, and then I'm going to sort out mouth clicks. So let's have a listen to this in solo. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. You could say that. Okay, so we've got a chop here that we need to sort out. Says you're. Everyone else says you're up here living up your best life, but you don't. We've got something funky going on there. Else says you're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Always been too sensitive. Great. So let's have a listen once more. My life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Sounds good. And what I'm going to do is there's some mouse clicks that I can hear. So I'm going to use RX mouse D click and I use the sensitivity just to mitigate more clicks. The sensitivity is essentially how aggressive you want it to be. You can skew the frequencies to low or high, depending on what they sound like in terms of the clicks. And then you've got some click widening so then that's some mid side processing depending on the signal that you're using i only really mess around with this i normally have it between five and six and then you could say that my life is a mess it's contradicting what everyone else says so you can see there's a lot of clicks being repaired let's listen to the clicks in solo Wow, 61 clicks in half a verse. 
You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. And this S is bugging me just a little bit. It's not ideal. So let's see. Else says. Everyone else says you're up here living up to best. Sounds less weird to me. Doing what everyone else says you're up here living up to best. Got a rogue peak here. We would ordinarily deal with this in gain automation. But overall, I just want to bring this S down a touch. Don't need to worry about this. We'll go through this in detail later on. Best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Now let's listen to it in the context of the music. You could say that my life is a mess. It's let's put that tuning on. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Okay, this S is still bothering me. Let's see if there's a quicker workaround. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here. That sounds better to me. Let me just listen to that in solo. Else says. Yep, great. At this point, I'm not fretting over tiny little things like that too much because we've got a whole song to comp and a whole load of doubles and harmonies and all of that good stuff. So we just want to move quick. Remember, we're, we're doing general. Now we're covering local because I'm sorting out the, the S's and a few little bits and pieces. Breaths, there don't seem to be any that are catching my attention. We've removed mouth clicks and we're revisiting problem areas like that S. We've sorted that out. Let's have a listen, see if there's any breaths that need some taming. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. You could so the breaths so far don't seem to be too much of a problem. There may have been a big one here that's been cut out, but I don't mind that not being there. It's very rhythmic in this part of the song. So I, I like how it's sounding so far. So that is essentially the process of comping. Now we're going to move to time aligning in terms of groove aligning with the lead vocal and then time aligning all the doubles and harmonies to that as well. Time aligning. What is time aligning? Time aligning is a technique used to synchronize different vocal takes, ensuring that they play back in perfect time. In a nutshell, it's about adjusting the timing of individual vocal tracks to achieve tight cohesion. Time aligning is also about adjusting the groove of even one vocal take. So once you've comped everything, you're going to want to go through the entire timing of the performance and see if there are any parts that are perhaps lagging or have come in a touch too soon, all in the context of the music. Picture this. A vocalist records multiple takes of the same song, each with its unique nuances. Time aligning allows us to align these diverse takes with utmost precision, creating a unified and synchronized vocal performance. How does time aligning work? Now let's dive into the mechanics of time aligning. After recording multiple vocal takes, producers analyze the waveforms to identify any timing discrepancies. By carefully adjusting the timing of each vocal track, they bring all the elements into perfect alignment. It's a meticulous process that requires a keen ear and a deep understanding of these musical nuances. The goal is to eliminate any subtle timing variations between takes, creating a seamless and unified vocal performance. Why time aligning? So why invest the time and effort into doing this precise and sometimes tedious work? Time aligning enhances the overall tightness and clarity of the vocal performance. 
when different vocal takes are perfectly synchronized, it eliminates phase issues and ensures that every word, every note, hits simultaneously. The result is a more polished and professional sound. Now, there is a note here that with each genre, the degree of time aligning that you would go through will vary. In more commercial genres like EDM and pop, you're going to want to have very, very tightly time aligned vocal takes. Whereas in different genres like folk or rock or alternative and jazz, you're going to play around with the looseness of it. And that is sometimes part of the overall performance within these genres. In addition to time aligning, creating a more polished sound, time aligning allows for greater flexibility during the mixing process. It provides producers with the freedom to experiment with different vocal textures and tones, knowing that the timing will remain precise. This flexibility contributes to the creation of a more dynamic and engaging final mix. The whole aim of the game here is to allow the journey of the vocal performance within the song to completely capture the listener. What we want to do is remove any form of distraction that may take the listener out of the song. To sum it up, time aligning is the key to achieving precision and synchronization in vocal performances. It's a technique that elevates the overall quality of the recording, ensuring that every element of vocal delivery is in perfect sync, aiding the listener's journey free from distraction. Okay, so let's cover time aligning. So in the context of the lead vocal, what this is is essentially making sure that every phrase is aligned as tightly as it needs to be in the context of the music. So if there are a few parts that have come in too soon or a little late, we just wanna finesse those parts before we move that into the tuning process. So using the same section that I demonstrated for comping, let's demonstrate time aligning a little bit. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone you could say that my life is a mess. It's con yes, it's yes, it's contradicts. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. Okay, this feels like it's coming in a little bit too soon. Everyone else. On else. Everyone else. As a general rule of thumb, when things feel a little further back off the grid, it creates a perception of groove. Whereas when something feels a little rushed, oftentimes we perceive that as a mistake. So we generally want to pay more attention to things that feel rushed and smooth those out. But of course, when something is too far, back from the, the grid that can also be perceived as a mistake as well. But just a general rule of thumb in terms of kind of how we perceive that in timing. And hopefully that's a helpful tool for you to be able to start to listen for that. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. Okay, finesse this. Contradicting what everyone else says. Everyone else says you're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on the inside. Always been too sensitive. Okay, let's comp this little bit and show you the timelining as well. Always been too Always been too sensitive. Always been too sensitive. To Always been too sensitive. To my Always been too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what it is. Sticking like fear, the words I hear. Always been too sensitive. Always been too. Always been too sensitive. Always been too sensitive. To always been too sensitive. To always been too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what. It Always been too sensitive. Told my whole life. Always been too sensitive. Told Always been too sensitive. Told my whole life that. 
that's what it is Sticking like fear, the words I hear and know Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what it is Sticking like fear, the words I hear and know what it is Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what it is Sticking like fear, the words I hear and know I hear and no one ever knows that Hear and no one ever knows I hear but no one ever knows That am I sweet That am I Sticking like fear the words I hear Sticking like fear the words I hear but no Just got a good fear here Sticking like fear, the words Sticking like fear, the words I hear But no one ever knows Hear but no one ever I hear but no one ever knows That am I Okay So we've got a cheeky Always been Other comping part To demonstrate so let's time align this. There are a few bits that are slightly loose. Always been too, always been too sensitive. Always been too sensitive. And this is a good example of the the timing was slightly jarring there. And rather than me messing around for a while to try and time align it, you know, chopping things up and moving them around, I'm thinking, how can I fix that? from a recorded take. So let me revisit the comp and see if I can fix that and give myself less work by finding a, a middle ground in terms of a slightly better performance in terms of timing and maybe a touch less in terms of the, the overall emotion. But with certain words, there's always gonna be push and pull with that. And that's that's totally okay. Always been too, always been too. Always been too always been too sensitive always been too sensitive okay so that feels better to me but this is a little always been too sensitive always been too so let's try and move this a little always been too sensitive Tom Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what it is Okay, so this is an example of it's just slightly Slightly bugging me that it's lagging a little bit So let's bring this forward Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what it is. Okay, so this section feels better. This feels always been too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what it is. Sticking like fear, the words I hear, and no one ever knows. That okay, here's just gonna try and finesse that a little bit. Like fear, the words I hear and know. See if I can find a different take. Can like fear, the words I hear and know. Yes, much better. Can like fear, the words I hear and no one ever knows. Can like fear, the words I. Can like fear, the words I hear and no one ever knows. Let's have a listen to that again. Always been too sensitive Told my whole life that's what it is Sticking like fear, the words I hear And no one ever knows that am I all Okay, at this point I would take a break I would come back And I'd just listen to it again Just take my headphones off Walk about for five minutes Come back, listen to it You could say that my life is a mess It's contradicting what everyone else says You're up here living up your best
listen to this better. Okay, that feels better to me. Little sloppy for me. You don't know what's going on You don't know what's going on. You don't know what's going on You don't know what's going on Let's listen to this part again. Okay, let's let's just try this a little Soon up. Okay, what is this like? There we go, a little better. Let's just nudge this a touch. Much better. Feels a lot less distracting to me. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living up your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. So that feels a lot more aligned with the groove of the music. It sits a lot more nicely rhythmically in the pocket with it. So now I would move on. I would carry on that process for the entire lead vocal. And then I would move on to tuning. All right, so let's talk about time aligning in the context of doubles and harmonies. So I'm going to walk you through my process and a couple of observations when it comes to aligning these and a couple of tips for you and tools that you can try if your budget allows you to do so. So in terms of the workflow, it's very similar. We want to mitigate breaths. In this context, depending on the genre, generally what I do is completely remove breaths altogether. So as you can see, all of the breaths here, I've just cut out with the marquee tool. I've just gone like that and gotten rid of it. So we have got a lot of vocals going on here. I would then remove the mouth clicks, tune them, and then align them. And I'm going to show you a tool that allows me to do both of these things together once the lead vocal or whatever the vocal is that you're aligning to has been tuned. So first of all, let me just show you the process of doing this manually. This would look something like this. And it's worth mentioning that the comping process is just as important here as in the lead vocal. If there are problems, you want to just go straight back to the comp. And if there are still problems there, you're going to want to just re-record those sections. As you can see here, this was quite a while into recording, but we still got four takes of each. So I've gone ahead and comped those, but let's have a listen to the double that I'm going to pan right. We just mute these. Sweet self sabotage and hot on me. Bleed then lung so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage. So let's have a listen to the double and the lead vocal. Sweet. Self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down, save me, drowning in my brain's hatred. 
Lessons in the patience of sweet sab sabotaging me. Sweet sabotaging me. Okay, so we've got a few sections that are a little loose. So in the context of this song, I want this to be super tight. So if I were to do this manually without the tool that I'm going to show you in a second, here's how I'd go about doing it. So I just want to get things as tight as possible. And you can use the waveform to guide that too. Sweet. So I'm just looking at it and going, okay, the yes S is here. Here's where we start. So this is still a little behind. And then I will fade these when I flatten it. Sweet. Self-sabotage. Okay, so I can hear an S has gone awry here. Wow, big, big discrepancy here. So let's move that across. Make sure that this isn't affected too. Sweet. Self-sabotaging hot on me. Not too bad. Let's just have a look at the waveforms. See if there's anything we can finesse here. You can be a little more heavy-handed as these are background elements. So even if you do do moves like that, if you fade them, it will be pretty imperceptible. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me. Bleeding lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down. Okay. Dragging me down. Dragging me down. Save me. Okay, we've got a rogue S going on here. Dragging me down and save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down and save me. Drowning. Okay, that's a little dodgy there. Down and save. So let me see if I can finesse this. Down and save me. happening here down a save okay we've got two s's going on down a save me Get down a dragging me down a save me Down to save me. Down to save me. Down to save me. Okay, that's a little too obvious. Down to save me. Great. So this would sound a little weird if we soloed it. Down to save me. Down to save me. But in the context. Down and save me. Let's pan that out and have a listen. Me down and save me. It's pretty imperceptible. That's going to be tucked back anyway. Me down save me. In my so this is what I would do after the fact. I know I'm going to pan these hard left and right. So I will pan it out and have a listen and see if any of those edits are 
are jarring. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding. Lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down safely. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotaging. Okay, so there was something I noticed around here. Okay, me is too late. In fact, let's see what this does. Dragging me down, save me. Dragging Great. Me. Great. So let me just move this over a touch. Listen again. Dragging me down, save me. Dragging in my brain's head. Okay, that's bugging me. Let's align it like that. Move this over a touch. Me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Okay, I can see this needs to be moved a little bit. So listen, one, do one more pass of that. And there you have it. That is how I would go about manually doing this. And then I would run this into uh, a manual tuning plugin and tune it as well, which is the next stage of the process. Now, let me show you a different way of doing this with a tool called Vocaline. And this is a lifesaver if you work on hundreds and hundreds of vocals and work with very big vocal arrangements and do all the editing yourself. So this is Vocaline Ultra. What this does is it uses algorithms to listen to a side chained signal and then aligns the track that you have this vocal on to the signal that you're telling it to. So what I'm going to do is put chorus tuned into Vocaline. Chorus tuned. And then I'm going to pick the algorithm double, slightly loose timing and pitch. And what this does, the great thing with Vocaline Ultra is it also matches the pitch. And I will use these parameters to finesse that once I've captured the dub. So you can do this with Aura where it just, you click play and it will capture it. I don't have that on this system, so I'm just going to do it the old school way, which is make sure it's side chained, telling it what to listen to. And I'm going to click capture. I'm going to play it. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding. Long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotaging. And there you have it. So I could hear on certain parts hatred. Um, there was some looseness that was just a little bit distracting. There was another section where the S's weren't completely aligned. So let's have a listen to what Vocaline has done right off the bat. Let's listen to this, the lead and double. Sweet. Self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding. Lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotaging. Sounds super tight. I'm going to try and match the pitch a little bit more and just to touch the tightness. Sweet. Self sabotaging hot on me, bleeding. Lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. 
Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotaging. And let's listen to that with it panned hard left. And let's listen to the dub that we did manually and have a listen to both. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me. So the, the difference is with the dub right, I'd have to go into the, the tuning process. So it's slightly jarring because it's not tuned and there are a couple of pitch discrepancies that pull focus. But with the dub left, it's totally tight, totally clean. Let's listen to it again. Self-sabotaging hot on me, bleeding. Lungs so I can hardly breathe in. Dragging me down, save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me So we've got some headphone bleed that I could cut out here or put a noise gate on Brain's hatred Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me And there you have it So that is how I personally go around doing it I, I use Vocaline Ultra and it is a real lifesaver when it comes to working with a lot of doubles and harmonies. Of course, when it comes to aligning harmonies, you're not going to want to match the pitch because the pitch is supposed to be different. So you just go ahead and, and tune it manually or with auto-tune as you prefer. And then you can align the timing. And then what I would do is before doing this, as you can see, it's a, a comp. I would just flatten it before putting it into vocal line. Fade everything in and out just to make sure that there's no clicks or pops. Then I would go through the process of time aligning it like so. Sweet self sabotaging hot on me. And then have a listen. Sweet. Self-sabotaging hot on me. Sounds great. And then once this is all done, I'll make sure that it's in the center. Then I would just bounce the entire take and then label it. Dub left, timed and tuned. And then we're good to go. So that is the, the process of doing a double. And later on, I will share my whole process for tuning, and then we can go through time aligning and tuning harmonies as well. Tuning. What is vocal tuning? Vocal tuning is a meticulous process involving the adjustment of a vocalist's pitch to achieve a flawless and harmonically accurate performance. It's a crucial step in modern music production, where perfection is not just a goal, but an expectation. In our exploration, we'll uncover various tools and techniques used by producers and engineers to fine-tune vocals, ensuring they seamlessly integrate into the musical tapestry. How does vocal tuning work? The process of vocal tuning involves using specialized software to analyze and adjust the pitch of recorded vocals. Whether it's subtle corrections or comprehensive adjustments, the goal is to create a pitch-perfect performance. Producers carefully navigate the nuances of each vocal track, correcting pitch discrepancies without compromising the natural expressiveness of the artist. It's a delicate balancing act that requires both technical proficiency and a deep understanding of musicality. Manual versus auto-tuning. The distinction between manual pitch correction and auto pitch correction lies in the degree of control and precision afforded to the user. Manual pitch correction involves a hands-on, nuanced approach where a producer carefully identifies and adjusts individual notes or phrases in a recording. This method allows for a more artistic touch, preserving the natural nuances of the performer while addressing specific pitch discrepancies. On the other hand, auto pitch correction relies on software algorithms to automatically detect and correct pitch errors across the entire vocal performance. While this approach is quicker and more efficient, 
it may lack the finesse and tailored adjustments achievable through manual correction. The choice between manual and auto pitch correction often depends on the desired outcome. With manual methods being favoured for subtle refinements, and autocorrection for a more streamlined, time-saving process. A common approach is to use both in tandem, manually finessing the pitch delivery and tightening up the overall tuned vocal with autotune at a slower retune speed. If this means nothing to you, we're going to demonstrate all of this in detail soon. Why vocal tuning? Now let's address the fundamental question. Why invest time and effort in vocal tuning? Vocal tuning plays a pivotal role in achieving pitch-perfect vocals, elevating the overall production quality. It transforms a good performance into an outstanding one by ensuring that every note is precisely in tune. The result is a tight, polished and professional vocal sound. Beyond pitch correction, vocal tuning contributes to the cohesiveness of a mix. It helps vocals sit seamlessly within the instrumental arrangement, creating a harmonious and immersive listening experience. To sum it all up, vocal tuning is the unsung hero of perfect vocal performances. It's a detailed process that ensures each note resonates with precision, contributing to the overall excellence of the production. All right, so let's talk about tuning. So we're going to revisit our lead vocal and we are going to start with Melodyne. So this is Melodyne. If you're not familiar, this is the leading manual tuning plugin. This is Melodyne Editor. And let me quickly walk through everything you need to know to start tuning your vocals. So the first thing we want to do is click transfer and we just want to play the section we want to transfer. If you have Melodyne Aura, you just click spacebar and it will manually do that for you. It will save you a little bit of time and make the process a little smoother. But for now, we're just going to do it the old school way. Sweet self sabotage and hot on me. All right, so now you can see these orange blobs that have come onto this grid. Now, the first thing that I want to talk about is not focusing so much on the blobs themselves and more on these lines, which represent the pitch. And that's what we want to focus on. The shaded lines are sibilants and breaths. So if we were to chop that off, you can hear that that's an S and then that's a little breath. So we really just want to focus on these vowels and not these consonants, these shaded parts. And then we're going to look at all of our tools. So we've got the main tool, which is to select things. We have our pitch tool, which moves the pitch. And also, if you click Alt, Sweet. Sweet. and then we have our pitch modulation tool, Sweet. which if I bring all the way, Sweet. is going to completely flatten the pitch, which will bring it closer to an auto-tuned kind of sound with a, a very fast retune speed. Sweet. And then we have pitch drift, which is how the pitch is drifting between notes. So you can see that this gold yellow line moves as I move that. And you can see how that's affecting the pitch. Then we have the formant tool, which shifts the formant. Sweet. Sweet. So if I bring Sweet. that all the way down, you'll hear what that sounds like. Sweet. Bring it all the way up. So that's playing around with the throat length. And you kind of want to think about formants as the, the placement within the vocal tract 
And further down, it's going to sound more chesty. Further up, it's going to sound more nasally and chipmunky. That's kind of how I like to think of it. And then our amplitude tool, which shapes the amplitude of each note. So we're bringing the volume up and down. Then we've got our fade tool, which you can fade in and out on certain notes. I very rarely use that. Our sibilance tool, Self which brings down sibilance. Self -sabotaged and hot on me. So let's listen to Self the yes without it and then Self -sabotaged and hot on me. It's a very extreme example, but you can just Self gently Self finesse that. Self I personally only ever use this on one S or two S's that are sibilant more so than everything else. And I just want to mitigate those two problematic areas. And then we have our time tool that allows us to move the timing and then our attack speed, which messes around with the attack at the beginning. So. Let's push that back. Self, self sabotaging. So these are all extreme examples, but that's what you can do with those tools. And then you have noise separation tool, which allows you to just cut. These blobs. So this is very helpful if Melodyne's read it in and you want a little bit more flexibility around these pitch centers. And that is essentially it. So with a combination of all these tools, we're going to be able to get a really transparent tuned vocal. So let me walk you through how I would go about doing this. So first off, I want to click on the correct pitch macro and then I want to pull the pitch centers up to around 75 to 80%. I'm going to do the same with pitch drift. And I don't want it to be perfect because we want to leave a little bit of imperfection here and have it sound as transparent as possible. And now I'm just going to listen through it. Self sabotaged and hot on me. Blee. Sweet. Self sabotaged and hot on me. Blee, then, then, blee, blee, then, hung so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me, drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. Lessons in the patience. Of sweet sabotage in me. Patience of sweet sabotage in me. Okay, and now I'm just gonna move the pitch drift in. It helps to make everything flow. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me. Okay, I'm just gonna do a little bit of clean up here. Let me just bring this down. Sweet. Let me see if I delete that if we miss it. Sweet. Self sabotaged and hot on me. Blee. Then. Long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons. Okay, we've got some noise. And get rid of that. You don't need to do this in Melodyne, but sometimes if you catch things, you can. In my brain's hatred, lessons in the patience of sweet sab, the patience of sweet sabotage in me. Sabotage in me. Let's listen to this in the context of the music. Okay, 
okay, there's still a little bit of work to be done. Sweet, self-sabotaged and hot on me, bleeding lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Save is... Save me. Save Save me. Save me down to save me. Save me down to save me. Drop down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. So this is really a process of fine-tuning everything in, in as much detail as possible and it can be extremely time-consuming. It's just coming with the territory of, of what we have to do here. Sweet. 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 Self-sabotaging. self sabot and what I'm going to do now, which is always helpful, is I just put auto-tune on. I know I'm going to put auto-tune on here anyway, so I'm going to pop that on and listen to how passable the pitch is and then see if there's any issues that I need to, to sort out manually here. Sweet, self-sabotaged and hot, sweet. Self sabotaged and hot on me, bleeding lungs so I then 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 then, flee, then, lungs so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me, drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. In the patience of... Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. Now the goal here is to try and retain as much of the transparentness of it. We don't want it to sound tuned. In this setting, you know, there are scenarios that you want things to sound very tuned, but for a song like this, you want it to sound really tight, but you don't necessarily want to feel like it's been very heavily tuned. So we always want to listen back in the context of the song and see where it's sitting. Sweet. Okay, first off, we've got some timing Sweet self -sab that we need to sort out. That's distracting me. Sweet self so we want to go the opposite way. Sweet self sabotage and hot on me. Okay, I think this is going to be a matter of actually moving this stuff after the fact. Sweet, self and hot on me, bleeding. That din doesn't work for me. Sweet, self and hot on me, bleeding. Then, then. Okay. Sweet. Okay, that's better. Blee, then, hung so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me, drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. Lessons in the pain. Sweet, self sabotage and hot on me. Blee, then, hung so I can hardly blee. Blee. 
we want as perfect a representation of the pitch as we can get. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me. Bleed thin lung so I can hardly breathe. Okay, that sounds a little bit too tuned for me. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me. Lessons in the patience of Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me Okay, so let me take auto tune off. Let's have a listen where we're at. Sweet self sabotage and hot on me. All right, so we're in a good spot now with Autotune Artist, which I find a little bit more transparent to Autotune Pro. I like to use that in this part of the tuning process. We are sounding pretty good. It sounds tight. It doesn't sound too tuned to my ear. I would go away as is coming a popular theme in this whole process. It's always good to have regular breaks just so that you're coming back with a fresh, more objective perspective and you're able to remove yourself from all of the work that you've done and see if anything sounds too um, tuned. After the fact, you can just come back with a fresh perspective and be able to really hit everything with the clarity attention and care that these vocals need. So after tuning these, what I would do is just bounce this as a new audio track, as we've got here, chorus tuned, just with the Melodyne on it. And then I would put auto tune on there. You can see my retune speed is, is quite heavy, but it's still quite transparent. And at this point would be when I would come to the artist and play them the vocals, see if they're happy with how the tuning sounds. Oftentimes, there's not going to be a, a major issue with the manual tuning. It might just be a case of the retune speed. They might find it that they want it a little less tuned sounding, a little more, a little tighter. So I like to just have the flexibility during the editing process to finesse this after doing the heavy lifting. Sounded like this before. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me. Bleed then. Let's make it fair. Let me game match this. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me. Bleed then. Long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience. So it's not bad, there are some pitch discrepancies, but let's have a listen to how it sounds after it's been manually tuned and has some auto pitch correction on it as well. And there you have it. It feels so much tighter. It feels like it's really sitting within the music itself. And there's nothing about it that is pulling me out of the story of the song, if you like. And that is the whole purpose of this. It's very tedious at times and is time consuming. And that's just something that comes with this part of the process within production. This is the most time consuming part of production, vocal production, editing, tuning, all of that stuff. But this is equally the part that sets apart the 
amateurs and intermediates to the professionals that are working on vocals and having this skill set makes you so invaluable to artists. So next up, we are going to cover gain automation, which is the final stage within the editing process. So of course, this has just been done for the chorus vocal. We would go ahead and do this for the entire lead vocal. And we would also do this process for every dub, every harmony, and any backing vocals that you have, ad libs, etc. And of course, if you have vocal line like I demonstrated earlier, you can use that to make the process a little quicker with the pitch matching for dubs. And I would set aside a day or two, especially when starting out. It's probably going to take you quite a while to get this done. And you may find yourself having to go back into Melodyne and move things about and then bounce it again and then go through this process. As you progress with time, you're going to be able to do this a lot quicker. You'll instinctually be able to get things tuned to a, a pretty good level in a shorter period of time. But as with everything, it just takes time to really get it in your bones, really understand the tools and be able to use those to create vocals that sound as tight and clean as your favorite artists. So next up, we're going to talk about gain automation and that will close off the final part in the editing process. Okay, so I want to talk through how to use Autotune and cover all the parameters and what you can do with it. All right, so to demonstrate, I'm going to use Antares Autotune Pro and then I'm going to use Logic Stock Autotune as well so that you know exactly how to use all of these and you're not reliant on having to feel like you have to go and buy Autotune. So first off, what we want to do is just walk through all of this. So our input type is the type of signal you're putting in. So is it a low male, alto tenor, soprano? Are you trying to tune an instrument? That is going to affect the algorithm, the way that you're tuning and the way that the tuning sounds. Next, we need to pick our key. So we are in E flat major. Now here we have presets that you can play around with, which you don't need to worry about for now. Then we have modern and classic. Classic is going to give you the T-Pain share sound where all you have is the reaching speed, flex tune is turned off. You have humanize and natural vibrato. When I click modern, it gives you far more tools to play around with. You can see formant, you can play around with that and you can transpose. Classic doesn't allow you to do that, so it only gives you the original auto-tune sound. Now, Foreman is, as we spoke about with Melodyne, the throat length, so if you bring the Foreman down, if you bring it up, and we're just playing around with simulating the throat length. The lower it is, the more kind of chesty it sounds. The higher it is, the more nasal it sounds. So what this does is simulates a model of a real human vocal tract. And it's a really cool tool to play around with creatively like we did just now. I'm going to cover form and shifting in detail later on, but this is a really cool tool for that. Then you have transpose, so you can bring things up. Bring that up an octave. Sweet. Self -sabotaging hot on me. Bring it down an octave. Sweet. Self -sabotaging hot on me. These are really cool creative effects. Of course, you can transpose things, you know, if you wanted to move it into a different key. Then you have detune, which you don't really need to worry about. Most of the stuff you're probably going to be working in is 440 hertz. Then we have the mix knob. So you can mix in how much tuning you want. Now we have retune speed. This is probably what you're going to be playing around with the most. So how quickly you move to those target pitches that are being told to the auto tune with the key and the scale that you're in. So if you clamp down on it and it's really fast, it's going to sound like this. Sweet, self sabotaging hot on me, please, then. So I can hardly breathe in. 
And then the slower you go, the more transparent it will sound. Self sabotaged and hot on me, flee. Then, lungs so I can hardly breathe. And so I tend to go between 30 to 40 typically, and that really depends on the, the genre. But generally, that's kind of where I head. And then if I'm in a more acoustic genre or a ballad, I'm going to be somewhere around here to sweet just give it a gentle nudge sweet self sabotage and hot on me please then now flex tune allows more expression to come through so if you have slides up and down growls that kind of thing this is going to be more forgiving and allow that to come through and it will make it feel a little more transparent Generally, I have it around halfway. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me. And what that allows you to do is push the retune speed a touch. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me. Please, then, lungs so I can hardly breathe. In. Then we have natural vibrato. And what this does is if you push it up, the higher the value to the right, the more it's going to accentuate natural vibrato and the lower, the less it's going to. So if you feel like there's a, a lot of warbliness, you can play around with natural vibrato and bring that down. If you want to accentuate that, you can play that up. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me, please. Then, lung so I can hardly breathe in. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me. Please, then, long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me, drowning in my brain's hatred. So you can hear that sounds a little less transparent and you can play around with that. I generally don't play around with natural vibrato that much. I've never really needed to. And finally, we have humanize. It adds realism to sustained notes with a higher reaching speed so that you don't create that very robotic effect. I always have humanized to 100. It really helps to minimize that auto-tune sound if you want it to feel transparent. Sweet, self-sabotaged and hot on me, please. Then, long so I can hardly breathe in. So how I would go about doing this is the first thing I would do is put it to the key of the song, then I would click learn. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me, please. Then, put it at alto tenor where it was already. Sometimes it'll be soprano depending on the singer and sometimes low male. And then I would put the retune speed to around here, flex tune to around 50, humanize to 100, and then I will start messing around with things to taste. Let's listen to it in the context. Sounds really tight. I know that there's going to be a huge vocal stack, so we are not going to be drawn so much to the lead vocal. So I don't mind it sounding tuned on a few different parts. I would come back and listen to it and then maybe just back off a touch with the retune speed, maybe push the flex tune up a little bit. I'm feeling good about how that's feeling so far. So let me show you Logic Pro stock version, which has recently just been updated. It's way, way better than where we were at and has neural pitch detection, which is very similar to Autotune's input type. So let's play around with this and see if we can get a similar result. So we know we're in E flat major. Sweet. Self hot on me. So we've got a very fast retune speed, which is called response here. We can see the pitch correction happening here. 
want detune to zero. Let's play around with tolerance. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me. Flee, then, long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. Sounds a little tuned still. Sweet, self sabotaged and hot on me. Flee, then, long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. So tolerance in this plugin is a combination of both natural vibrato and flex tune. So this, the lower it is, the tighter the tuning is going to be. And the higher this is, the more it's going to allow vibrato and slides and that kind of thing to come through without tuning clamping down on it. So this will be more transparent, more humanized, this will be less. So I'm going to put it around here and see where we're at. Sweet, self-sabotaged and hot on me. Flee, then, long so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Lessons in the patience of sweet sabotage in me. That doesn't sound too bad to me. Sounds pretty good to me. We are pretty much nearly the same. With different parameters, the response is a lot higher. But let's do an AB. This is Logic Pro's pitch correction. And then let's have a listen to Autotune Pro. I don't mind the pitch correction. I personally prefer auto-tune, it sounds a little more transparent and tighter to me, but that is also a matter of personal preference. Play around with both, you can get a trial and try this and see whether you want to invest in that. For now, use what you have and pitch correction or any version of a stock door tuning software will be great. You really just wanna have command of all of the parameters and know what each thing does and then dial that in so that you can get transparent attuned vocal or as obvious and stylistic as you want to be. So I would typically do this tuning process after I have done manual pitch correction. So I would put everything into Melodyne like I showed earlier on. I would then bounce that to a new track. I would put auto tune on it then I would add my gain automation, which I will show you later on. I just want to show you a quick alternative to Melodyne. I'm going to use Logic Pro's stock manual pitch correction software, Flex Pitch. Now to use Flex Pitch, you just have to turn on the Flex Pitch button, scroll to Flex Pitch and click it. Now you can see it has a similar look to Melodyne and I'm just going to go into editing. Now we have very similar parameters here. So if we zoom in, we have strength, 
which is how perfect we want the tuning to be. We have pitch correction with scale quantize. So we can go to the key that we are in and then we can bring that up and you can see it snapped those to the grid. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. So not as tight, it doesn't sound very transparent. So we're going to want to approach this similarly to Melodyne. So we'll bring the pitch correction down and then we'll just go in word for word. Now you can see that there are six circles surrounding this rectangular blob of audio. We have the lines, again, that represent the pitch, and these are similar to the orange blobs on Melodyne. So first off, we have pitch drift, and you can see how the pitch moves up and down. So you can move that up a touch. We've got gain, how loud we want the waveform to be. So it's very similar to the amplitude tool in Melodyne. Then we've got fine pitch. So you can slide it up if you want things to be sharper or flatter. Then we have pitch drift again, going into the next section. And then we have formant shift, which is similar to Melodyne, but it's a much more streamlined approach. And then we have vibrato. So if we want to minimize vibrato, which would be with the modulation tool in Melodyne, we can do that too. And then if you double click, it snaps it to the pitch it thinks it should be at. So let's just do a quick demonstration of a section just to walk through how you can tune things with flex pitch. Sweet self Sabbath. Sweet self sabotaged and hot on me down a touch sounds pretty good to me sweet self sabotaged and hot on me sweet self sabotaged and hot on me sweet blee 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 then blee then so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Drowning in my brain's hate. So there is a little pop here. You can see whether that is from this, which may be a little problematic have to go back and sort that out. Let's oh, we don't want to do that. Turn that off. Then my brain's head. Then my brain's head. my brain's head. There we go. Let's go back to that. In my brain's hatred. My brain's hatred. And then if you wanted to, you can see the scissor tool, you just click command and then that will split the sections. My brain's hatred. Blee. Then. Hung so I can hardly breathe and Dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. And then let's put some stock pitch correction on there. Sweet. Self sabotaged and hot on me. Blee. Then. Hung so I can hardly breathe and dragging me down to save me. Drowning in my brain's hatred. Let's have a listen to that in context. Me 
that sounds pretty good to me with completely free stock plugins with Logic Pro, we can get it to sound just as good as Melodyne and Autotune just by keying into the tools and all the principles we've spoken about so far. So don't feel like you need to run and buy Melodyne. It is a high-end plugin, so it is quite a, a large investment. It will be something you may want to consider investing in the future if you are doing this professionally and editing vocals. However, I know a lot of professional producers that just use their stock tuning software and have just gotten very good at using them. So I would strongly encourage you to just learn the tools that you have and learn to use them really well, know them inside and out. I personally learn with Melodyne, so I find it a lot easier to use than Flex Pitch. And each to their own, there is no right and wrong here. It's just about getting the best possible result that you can. So play around with these tools and practice, practice, practice. I can't tell you how important it is to just keep going through this process a ton. You will get frustrated at some points, like we had the little pop and then we had to go back and revisit that and finesse things but your vocals will thank you for it and your listeners will be so taken aback with how amazing your vocals sound so going through this process is really important to getting your vocals to be competitive with the top artists in most genres which have highly edited vocals gain automation now, this really is the secret source for creating intelligible, upfront and emotive vocals. I include this in my own editing workflow, but most mix engineers will do this in their preparation phase. I personally like to do everything I can to get my vocals 80% of the way there before mixing. But experiment where you put this in your overall workflow. The key takeaway is this. Please don't skip this step. It really is one of the techniques that sets apart beginners from total pros. What is gain automation? Gain automation involves dynamically adjusting the volume levels of a vocal track to create a more consistent and balanced performance. This meticulous process aims to address variations in volume that naturally occur during a vocal recording, setting the stage for subsequent processing like compression. How does gain automation work? Before compression comes into play, gain automation steps in to refine the dynamic range of a vocal recording. Producers use automation tools to manually adjust the volume levels of different section within the vocal track. The goal is to create a consistent volume throughout the performance, mitigating sudden spikes or dips that might distract from the overall musical experience. This process requires a keen ear and understanding of the natural dynamics of vocals and making the necessary adjustments to smooth out the dynamic range for a more even and intelligible vocal. Why gain automation? Why do we engage in gain automation? Gain automation is a crucial step in achieving a consistent and balanced vocal performance before compression. By leveling out volume discrepancies, you can ensure that the subsequent compression process operates in a more stable foundation. Compression works most effectively when applied to a consistent input signal. If a vocal track has erratic volume levels, compression can unintentionally emphasize or attenuate certain elements, leading to an unnatural and less pleasing result. Gain automation acts as the preliminary sculptor preparing the vocal track for compression by creating a smooth and controlled dynamic range. To underscore the significance of gain automation, let's consider the analogy of a painter preparing their canvas. Just as a painter primes the canvas to receive the paint more evenly, gain automation primes the vocal track for compression, allowing the subsequent processing to enhance the performance without compromising its integrity. In conclusion, gain automation is the silent architect that sets the stage for a balanced and polished vocal performance. It's a process that ensures the dynamics of the recording are refined before compression, making sure that the lyrics and emotional nuances are at the forefront before we even delve into the mixing process. 
All right, finally, let's talk through gain automation. So we've covered what it is and why we do it. And I want to give you a practical demonstration of how that would look in the context of being the final stage in the editing process. Now, like I mentioned earlier, this isn't always every producer's task. It's not something that every producer does within the editing stage. A lot of mix engineers will start their mixing preparation with this, particularly for lead vocals and any other instruments that have some dynamic discrepancies. But I love to do this so that if I am sending it off to mixing or I'm doing the mixing myself, I'm just giving everything a much stronger foundation to start from. So oftentimes it's a matter of doing enhancements rather than trying to solve problems that I could have fixed myself. And that's always been the mentality with how I approach production, mixing and mastering. And as you know, if you watch any of our courses and tutorials, we are massive advocates for being able to solve problems right from the very start. So with the reverse engineer program, we start with mastering so that we learn what can be fixed within mixing and then mixing so that we can learn how we should start in the production phase. And then production also sheds light on how we want to approach songwriting. So understanding where we can start from an 80 to 90% solid foundation. And this is something I strongly encourage as a mindset shift moving into your music creation journey and adopting this as you move forward into your music making. So let's jump into automation. So first off, what I like to do is just do it with clip gain. I'm just going to go into my region inspector. I use the marquee tool as my secondary tool and I just click command so that I can chop things up. And I'm going to just listen through and see whether there are any volume discrepancies and start to move things up and down. Sweet, self and me. Okay, so this can come up a little bit. I'm gonna bring that up. Sweet, self, and self could come up a touch. too much. I can also see where I can bring things up with the waveform as well. Sweet, self and on me. A little too much. Sweet, self and on me. Then... It's a little bit too soon. I'm just going to move the timing in, touch. I don't want to bring this S up, so Let's just bring this up a touch. Sweet, self Sweet, self and on me. Bleak, then. Okay, we're losing me a little bit. So it's all about intelligibility at this point. I'm really looking to make sure that from an objective standpoint, can I hear all the lyrics? Can I hear, can I understand what's going on? And if I can't, 
I need to bring those up. Okay, we're losing patience. Now we're gonna to have to use another technique for this that I will show in a second. Another form of gain automation. Lessons in the patience, sweet okay, so we're losing quite a lot of this part. And bring this up. Okay, so I will have a listen to that again. Okay, so I'm just going to make sure to fade all of this in. We want equal power crossfade and then fade out around 20. And now I've got everything nice and neat. Just going to fade that in. Fade these in and out. So to get the fade tool click zone, you're going to want to go to settings, general, editing, and then you want to click fade tool click zones. And that's going to allow you to hover around the top corner and then add fade tool rather than having to do that, which is going to make your life so much easier when editing. So we've got everything faded, we've got crossfades, it's all nice and clean. Now we had a few sections that were dipping off at the end. So let's have a listen, identify those, and then smooth those out so that we have less of an aggressive dynamic range between those parts. So the main offender is here, patience. So what I'm going to do is put a gain plugin at the end of the chain. I'm most likely not going to do anything here as I typically bounce this out and then put it into a production session. For this instance, I am working within the production session itself. So I'm just going to put it at the end in case I just want to put any processing beforehand. And I'm going to use gain automation with this tool. To gently lift it up. Let's have a listen to the phrase. You can do that too, just a touch. We're just lifting the end of the phrases up. And typically the ends of phrases are where a lot of the emotion resides within the performance. So I like to think of this as accentuating the emotions within the performance, as well as doing you a massive favor of smoothing out the dynamic range. For this instance, we just want intelligibility. We want to hear what, what she's singing about. Okay, let's have a listen through the rest and see if there's anything else we can do. 
Now, the reason we add a gain plugin instead of doing this with the fader is that I want to free the fader up so that I can move it up and down. I don't have to worry about it snapping back up if I want to change the volume and then going, oh no, I've put automation on there. Now I, I need to put a gain plugin and bring that up. It's just a nicer, cleaner way that I find helpful so that I'm still able to mix with the faders. Just do a little bit there. Okay, let's have a listen. Can just bring that down a touch. A little too aggressive. Down a touch. I'd love to accentuate just a little bit of that breathiness at the end. Drowning in my brain's hatred could come up a touch. In my brain's hatred. Overall. In my brain's hatred. Crossfade these parts. Let's have one more listen through. As you guessed, I'm probably going to say you'd go away and have a little break, and I would absolutely do that. I would, in fact, move on to the next section. So I'd probably move on to the turn or verse two, and then go ahead and start gain automating that. And then I'd come back and listen through the whole thing. But let's have a listen through again. And there you have it, there is gain automation. Now this really is the secret source, as I mentioned, and this is gonna allow you to have clarity in your vocals without necessarily having to push the volume of them up so far that it feels like it's sitting on top of your mix. You can experiment with a combination of the clip gain and the gain tool fading things up at the end of each phrase and this will work wonders on extremely emotional parts at the end of each phrase and that will really accentuate those parts that connect with the listener which is awesome and is going to really set you apart as a pro when it comes to sending across produced vocals. Here are a couple insights and tips that hopefully you can adopt moving forward if they feel helpful for where you're at in your workflow and your experience. So let's dive into a couple of these now. So the first tip that I want to talk about is mentally preparing yourself. Editing vocals, tuning vocals, timelining, all of this stuff is really tedious and it can be quite frustrating 
it can feel a lot less creative. And for that reason, you may want to avoid it altogether. But I strongly encourage you to stick with it because it will be well worth it. Yes, you will have to revisit parts. There will be times where you feel like you've messed it all up and you have to go back or it sounded better before. And that comes with time. You will get better with time. You will be able to be more instinctual with it. And a lot of the tools will become second nature and it will make the whole process a lot easier as you just keep editing. Which brings me on to my next tip, which is edit as many vocals as you can. Just like with mixing, with production, with any skill really, you want to get in the weeds with it as soon as possible and as frequently as possible. Consistency and practicing this is going to make you so much better and it's also going to allow you to identify problems a lot more easily. You are going to be able to pick up on details, on nuances that you otherwise wouldn't, and that is going to set your vocals apart. That being said, my next tip is to take regular breaks. You can start to miss things, you can start to over-obsess, you can start to question whether what you're doing is working. At that point, you will just want to step away, get out, go for a walk, get a coffee, whatever works for you, do some burpees, get away from everything and then come back fresh, listen through it all and objectively assess where you're at and then start to make those adjustments. And like we mentioned before, we want to try and approach all of this globally. So just listen to the whole thing, then start to think about, okay, where are things working? Are there anything that is drawing my focus and attention to it? Is anything distracting? And then you can go in and more locally attack those parts. I also recommend that when you are editing for the first time or the first few times, give yourself a time limit, a few hours for the lead vocal, a few hours for doubles and harmonies, just to prevent you from rabbit holing. And this is even helpful if you are quite experienced. There is the tendency to want to overperfect and start to hear things without the context of the music and think that you're hearing pops and background noise and all of this stuff that in the context of the music may be totally fine. So at that point, I would suggest giving yourself a time limit, taking a quick break if you are over obsessing and then just listening to everything in context with the music. And if you're still not sure, just pull up a reference track. Try to pay close attention to how the vocals sound. You can even go ahead and isolate the a cappella and then listen to it and compare that to your own vocals and see how close you are to how tight it is in terms of the timing, how transparent the tuning is, how tight the tuning is, and then you can make the necessary adjustments. We always want to come back to an objective anchor in everything that we're doing so that we don't just work subjectively and end up in a never-ending cycle of guesswork and being unsure of where to go next. So my next tip is to not be afraid to be more heavy-handed with backing vocals, with ad-libs and harmonies and doubles and choirs and all of this stuff which we are going to get to in terms of how to produce these later on. You can be a lot more heavy handed. You can put a far faster reaching speed. You can do a lot more abrupt edits because in the context of everything, a lot of this stuff is not going to get picked up on. Of course, you want to try to be as detailed and accurate as possible and maintain the cleanliness of everything overall. But that being said, you don't need to worry if you need to chop something halfway through a vowel and crossfade that, it will not get noticed. If that's the thing that's going to keep the tightest timing of it and you don't have something like Vocaline, you can make those kinds of adjustments. I wouldn't recommend doing that with a lead vocal. It's probably going to be a lot more noticeable. It might create some artifacts, but we don't need to worry so much when it comes to all of the backing elements because they are just that. They're backing elements. They're supportive 
and most people's ears are not going to be drawn to that at all within the context of the song so don't be afraid to push it and see where that sits in terms of where the genre lies and the expectations within that that being said my next tip is to try to aim to get clean takes from your comping stage rather than approaching it from the standpoint of wanting to over edit everything and if you're hearing some artifacts that have been recorded in the process they've been printed in the recording which inevitably happens sometimes you might get some plosives you might get some mouth clicks or some pops from the mouth maybe midway through a vowel and even using something like mouthy click doesn't work that's up to you to decide where you want that to lie in terms of the genre there are songs in more alternative and indie genres that do have more pronounced mouth clicks and maybe some artifacts and are a little more imperfect so that lies with you to sit down with your references and really understand what is expected in terms of the way that the vocals are produced but i would strongly encourage you to try to get a really strong clean take right from the get-go you want to have everything 95 percent of the way there you will have much cleaner results with less artifacts and you're not going to be rabbit holing because you've picked a take that has problematic placement or timing with the goal of fixing it in editing i keep repeating but it is the never-ending cycle of doom when you are just going around in circles not sure why it's not working if you feel like that go back to the comp see if you can find something that just works better my next tip is to pay close attention to consonant timing with doubles and harmonies they are such a huge giveaway of timing discrepancies so s's and t's and ch's all of that stuff if there is a really obvious delay between the lead vocal and the backing vocals or backing vocals come in sooner you're going to get this symphony of t's and c's and all of that stuff kind of hitting each other and that is going to be really distracting for the listener and it's just a big giveaway of amateur vocal editing so i would encourage you to really hone in on that at the start of your editing you want to just pay close attention to where are the consonants sitting is there anything that's drawing my attention this can also happen with breaths so you may decide to bring the breaths down align the breaths or with doubles and harmonies as i do most often completely cut those out and just leave the breaths for the lead vocal and my final tip is to comp breaths from the take that you are choosing it is something easily done but you use a breath from the end of another take and then comp from the start of the phrase without the breath so you're essentially using a breath from a different take so that can sound really weird and another mistake that you can make is also comping half a breath of the take before with the other chosen take so you get this very strange choppy breath that comes in that is two breaths stitched together which can sound very strange so you just always want to pull out a little more from the beginning of the take that you are comping where there are breaths and potentially any other consonant sounds just make sure that you are using that take and that the beginning is using the breath from that original take this will sound a lot cleaner a lot more transparent and less jarring for the listener the whole aim of the game here is to make things as easy for the listener as possible to eliminate any distractions and allow them to really get lost in the world of the song and that is what all of this technical work is about so remember that while you are going through this long arduous process and know that by the end of it you are going to really be helping the listener to have a much more enjoyable experience okay so i wanted to do a little bonus video covering the more advanced concepts of editing that i use on a day-to-day -day basis 
that almost falls more into audio restoration. Now, audio restoration could have a whole course for itself. It's a quite complex topic and there are a lot of detailed tools and techniques that go into the real advanced ways in which you can restore audio. So for this, I just wanted to walk through some practical applications of sorting out some recordings that are less than ideal. I have used this as an example. I have recorded it in this room, which currently is untreated at the time that I'm recording this. And it's going through treatment right now. I'm working through that with one of our awesome mentors, Jim, who is helping me to get my room nice and tight within plus minus three to five db which will be awesome so i will have much tighter and cleaner vocal recordings as of the next few weeks when i get that done but this is a great example of us having to use what we've got we have a sync song there's a deadline on getting these songs done so we have to use what we've got and you will be in situations that are like this sometimes where you just have to use what you have in the moment and try to use the tools, techniques and concepts to work as well with what you've got and make it passable. And so we are going to cover declicking, removing noise, removing plosives, resonance suppression and different variations of all of these techniques. So I'm going to show you the different ways that you can tackle all of these. So first off, let's talk about declicking. So let's have a listen to the recording so far and let me talk through kind of what I am hearing. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior. I know I'll face the dawn. The power inside us is enough to face the rain. Okay, so there's a couple of problematic things here. The vocals are very, very powerful. We've got belting happening and there is a lot of room resonance that's being picked up by the mic as the vocal is bouncing back from the walls which are untreated back into the microphone. And then we've also got some bleed from the headphones and we've got a little pop here. So let's walk through how we would fix this. In an ideal scenario, we would record in a different room and get a much cleaner, tighter result. We would maybe turn down the headphones a touch or use a different pair, maybe a more isolated pair of headphones. Closed back is always great, which these were recorded on, but sometimes it just bleeds through anyway. So first off, let's talk about this click. So we have this click that is being that is being introduced as an artifact with auto tune. So there's a couple ways that we can work around this. The first would be to turn this off and use Melodyne. I've walked through the process of doing that. I'm not going to do that for this. I just want to show you if this was a popping clicking that was recorded within the audio itself, printed in and recorded. Here's how we'd want to go about mitigating that as best we can. Rather than mouse the click, which you've seen already, we're going to use RX the click. RX is a suite of audio restoration plugins by Isotope. I swear by these, I've used them for years and they get really great results. This is a couple of years behind the latest software. We're on RX 10 now, so we will play around and see if we wanna update at some point, but it, this gets the trick done. This is very similar to mouth -to click, but this is more for digital clicks as opposed to natural mouth clicks. So let's see how this fares with the click that's been created. The power inside us is enough to face the rain. So we can see we've got 53 clicks repaired. So let's have a listen to the clicks just outputted. Sixty-seven clicks have been repaired. Now that is a ton of clicks just for one phrase. So 
we have a much tighter and less distracting take. So let's listen to that before and after. So let's bypass it. And let's listen to this part. Go again. I am a okay, now let's listen to it with the click on. Go again. I am a I know I'll face the dawn. The power inside us is enough to face the rain. Sounds much tighter. This is quite subtle compared to some other techniques that we've used but this really is that level of detail that you want when you're having extremely clean vocals with no form of artifacts as best you can your whole goal is you know to have things as clean as possible so that when it is pushed up inevitably when you have compression on there and everything is leveled out and all the inconsistencies are brought up you want everything to sound as clean as possible. So you can really push these vocals up if you wanted to in the context of the mix. So let's move on to talking about removing noise. So there are a couple of ways to do this. I will show you a few tools that you can use to remove noise. So first off, we're gonna to go to our trusty RX-8. Voice D noise. So here we can have it in adaptive mode, which basically adapts to the signal as opposed to this mode where you manually can sort all of this out. So I like to use adaptive mode, it's a lot more transparent. Then you have your reduction. So there's no reduction. The further up you bring this, the more reduced it is. And then the threshold, like a compressor, as you can see that moving up and down, is telling the software when it should clamp down and how much it's going to clamp down on the signal itself. So I generally like to have it at zero, adaptive mode. I have it on gentle and music. Now let's have a listen to how this sounds. And I'm gonna pull the reduction up and down so you can have a listen. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire. And now I'm going to play around with the threshold. So you can have a listen to how that reduction is coming in and out. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior. I know I'll face the dawn. The power inside us is enough to face the rain. Let's have a listen to surgical. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. Bypass it. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior. So what I'm hearing is as we dial these in, the vocals are feeling more up front. It feels like they're more isolated. It's removing a little bit of the room resonance. We are still getting some of the bleed. However, it feels a little tighter. And with that tightness comes a sense of something feeling more up front. There's less room, there's less ambience. It feels more pointed and more direct. You can also play around with some of these presets. Lead vocal noise suppressor is one I use a lot. Let's have a listen to how that sounds. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. 
Let's bypass it. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. So sadly, what is happening is we are losing quite a bit of top end. As you can see, this EQ curve here, we've got quite a large dip from 10K to around 2K here. So that in itself helps to remove noise and hiss but you are going to lose a little bit of that top end. So there is a push and pull here. This is why we really want to aim to get great tight, clean recordings, free from noise, free from room resonance as much as possible with all the tools we've covered so far and techniques in our recording session. But sometimes you're going to have to use stuff like this so that you can get a tighter, cleaner sound and remedy some less than ideal recording situations. So here's one technique. Let me show you another tool that I use for this. I've been using this more recently and I find it to be a little more transparent. This is a really cool tool, C-Suite by Universal Audio. And we have a very, very simple user interface and we can either attenuate noise or room. So noise, we're thinking about hiss and any rumbles, that kind of thing. And then room, we're attenuating resonance. So we pick what we need this for. And then attenuation determines the amount by which the noise or room tone is attenuated. And then the ambience is how damp or dry you want the process signal to sound. So let's have a listen to attenuating the room. I'm hearing a lot of room being captured from those bouncing reflections back into the microphone. So let's get aggressive with it. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. Let's bypass it. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. So what's really interesting is we have completely eradicated the room resonance and we've completely eradicated the microphone bleed. However, we're losing a lot of presence. We're losing a lot of top end, a lot of high mids, which is potentially going to be problematic when it comes to mixing. So we're going to have to dial this in and have some push and pull here. So we get a little bit of that microphone bleed. However, it does feel a little tighter. There is a little bit of sacrificing going on with the top end, but what we can do later down the line, we can add some of that back during the vocal processing phase. So let's play around with the ambience and see how dry we can make this sound. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. So I'm hearing a lot of that room being suppressed in a pretty transparent way. Let's play around with the noise and see how that sounds. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior. I know I'll face the dawn. The power inside us is enough. So we're getting more of the headphones than we were when we were on the room algorithm, which is interesting. So let's play around with dialing in just the ambience. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. Now let's play with attenuation. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up. So 
So I am pretty happy with how this has turned out. In this particular scenario, I would play around with room. I would probably have a listen to this in context with how I would process it. So I would leave this on. I wouldn't print this to audio yet. And then I would put some compression, play around with the EQ on this and see if I can get this to sound how I'm envisioning and close to the reference track in terms of how the vocals sound. If this was extremely problematic, the aim of the game is to go back. Let's revisit where we were at. Let's revisit how we're recording and let's get this to sound as tight as possible. I know that I can work with these vocals from doing a lot of less than ideal vocal recordings and having access to tools like this. So I would encourage to, of course, start from a great recording. This isn't that bad. There just happens to be a lot of room resonance in this particular section, which is the loudest section. I know that I've got chorus dubs. We're going to have harms, octaves. We're going to do a lot of stuff that will help this to sit nicely in the production and feel less distracting. But I probably will use a few tools like this for this section just to get everything to sound a little tighter and cleaner. So we have removed the noise a little bit and we've also delved into a little bit of resonance suppression, which is happening with the room algorithm. So let me show you another tool that is helpful for resonance suppression. Now this is Suze by OX Sound. This is one of my favorite plugins of all time. And this is in fact a resonance suppressor. It's a dynamic resonance suppressor. So let me show you how this works in action. Rather than trying to explain it, it will be a lot easier to just demonstrate it. So at the minute, this is my band and I can move that around and let's have a listen to it in solo and listen to what it's doing. So that's us in solo, 821 hertz. There is a huge buildup of resonance there and the depth will determine how much I want to attenuate that. And we can play around with the cue if we want that to be sharper, the sensitivity if we want to attenuate that less and have it a little more subtle. And what we can also do is play around with the mix. So we don't have to necessarily attenuate that 100%. In this instance, I'm going to back off on the depth. I want it to be on soft as opposed to hard. I could also play around with the sharpness. Let's have a look at that. That's a little more surgical, which could make it feel a little more transparent. And now let me bypass it so we can have a listen to how that sounds with and without. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again. And now instead of bypassing these other nodes, let's have a listen to some other areas in the frequency spectrum. So let me pull this filter up. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior, I know I'll face the dawn, the power inside us is enough to face the rain. So what I'm doing is I'm really just trying to find the room resonances and attenuate those. And I can do this as, a, as aggressively as I feel I need to. That feels a lot cleaner to my ears. The main offenders generally are going to be around 500, maybe 300 to 2K in some instances. But I'm normally looking at the mids. Anywhere between 500 and 1.5K tends to be the main offenders. And it has been, especially in the rooms that I've recorded in. So this is a great tool for doing this in a more transparent way, but this in itself is not a denoiser. So you'll still have the headphone bleed, you'll still have any hiss. It may help if you lifted the filter up and you might have some hiss up here. You could play around with that. I am a warrior, I know. There is no hiss in this instance. We're still getting the headphone bleed. So we would have to use something like this in tandem with 
voice denoise. And finally, I just want to give you a couple of other variations of these plugins, some tools that you can play around with and maybe look into when it comes to tidying up your vocals. So for attenuating some noise, such as the headphone bleed, let's play around with the gate. So I'm going to bring the classic gate in and let's have a listen to what this is doing. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. I'm forging the fire. I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior. I know I'll face the dawn. The power inside us is enough to face the rain. I am a warrior. I know against all so you can see when it's closing this threshold is telling the gate when it wants to cut off and when it wants to open so you can see that the signal is around here so i need to finesse this to taste and get the parts that i want to be cut out and i can use this vocal algorithm this mode more and then we've got the attack time, how quickly we want that to come in, the release, how quickly or slowly we want it to release, and then the range, by how much do we want the gate to close. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again. I am a warrior, I know I'll face the dark. And then the ratio, how aggressive we want that to be, and the range. I am a warrior, I know a and then you have some presets, so we've got noisy vocal. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again. So a gate is really useful if you have noise between phrases that tends to be the most helpful use for this in this instance we have to go for a more spectral denoising approach where we're actually trying to remove it within the printed recording there are points where the headphone bleed is coming through during phrases so this isn't the tool that we want to use for the job right now however it might be a great tool as i said if you have some very loud parts in between sections. Now let me show you another plugin for this kind of cleanup. This is VEA by Isotope. And this is an AI plugin that assesses the signal of your vocals and then adds processing to it to clean it up and isolate the sound. So let's play our audio and see what it does. So this is really quite impressive. So we have only three knobs. We've got clean and the percentage removes unwanted background noise and vocal sounds, mouth clicks, breaths, excessive noises. So it removes hiss, hums, mouth clicks, that kind of thing. So let's put that all the way to 100%. And then we have shape, which is shaping the tone of the vocals. So it's at 50% right now. Let's put it at zero. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. Now let's put it to 100. I am a warrior. I know against all odds. So we're getting a real dip in the low mids. And 
at 50%, that really helps the vocal. There's a lot of a buildup there. And within those low mids, there's also the room resonance. So we're attenuating that and we're also shaping the tone of the vocal in a more pleasing way. It's feeling a little more balanced. And then we have boost, which under the hood is doing some expansion and some compression. So let's bring that down to zero. Let's put it to 100 and see how that sounds. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again, I am a warrior. So there's definitely a lot more gain, it's expanding the lower parts of the dynamics and it's also bringing everything up. So I can hear that some expansions happening, the lowest parts are being brought up and it's also leveling everything out in the traditional sense of compression. It's taming the highest peaks and it's bringing everything into a lower dynamic range. So everything feels a little more even. It sounds a little too aggressive at hundred, but where it was set sounds pretty good to my ears. Now let's bypass it and listen to how it sounds before and after. So this was it before. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up and I'll go again. And then let's put it on. I am a warrior, I know against all odds, I'm forging the fire, I'll get up Sounds a little more isolated. Of course, I had to bring it down so that it was a little more gain matched because it is making the signal louder. I am a warrior. I am a warrior. So specifically what it's doing is it's removing some of that noise and some of that room resonance, which is just making it sound a little cleaner right off the bat before we start playing around with actually processing the vocal in terms of mixing. So I hope that was helpful. Here are a few tools that you can go away and explore. All of these have some form of trial and you can just download them, play around with them, see if they're useful for your workflow. But I strongly encourage you to try to fix all of these problems at the source. This is just icing on top of the cake. These are some more advanced tools that you can use when you're stuck in a little tight corner but we always just want to revisit recording and minimize all of these problems before we even get to this stage. Now it's your turn. Given all the information and demonstrations we've shared so far, I want to provide you with a hands-on exercise. Practice comping, time aligning, tuning, and gain automation on the provided vocal stems. Welcome to section three. In this section, we're going to be covering how to produce gang vocals, stacks, choirs, ad libs, and all of that good stuff. We're also going to dive into advanced arrangement and effects. So we're gonna talk about all of the tools like pitch shifting, vocoders, modulation, stuttering, vocal chops, gating, and all of the tools and techniques that you can take away and apply to your own vocal productions. And finally, we're going to cover recording workflow. So once you've gone through this section and you understand all of these tools and how to produce all of these different techniques, then you can go away and really assess which workflows work for you and your own unique circumstances. So without further ado, let's jump in. Vocal stacks, working with layers and layering. At this point, we're assuming you've recorded and edited your lead vocal as we've outlined in the previous section. Now I want to dive into some tools and techniques you can use to create more complexity and really flesh out your vocal arrangements. You won't always need to use these for every song. Your judgment and taste combined with the direction of the song itself will dictate when you need to pull these out of your vocal production toolbox. But a comprehensive understanding of each of these concepts 
will give you unparalleled creative freedom. Creating doubles and harmonies. First things first, what exactly are doubles and harmonies? Doubles involve recording the same part twice, while harmonies introduce additional notes that complement the main melody. Both techniques can add depth, richness, and a unique character to your music. Doubles and harmonies provide a fuller, more immersive listening experience. They're commonly used in various genres to enhance vocal or instrumental performances. Now that we know what we're dealing with, let's explore how to create impactful doubles. One approach is the classic method of recording a second identical take of the lead vocal, known as a traditional double. This technique adds thickness and creates a fuller sound, often employed in rock and pop genres. Another method involves altering certain parameters in the second take, such as using a different microphone, adjusting the pitch slightly, or changing the performance style. This nuanced approach, known as modified double, introduces subtle variations that contribute to a more textured and layered vocal sound. When recording doubles, it's worth considering their placement in the stereo field and how wide you want them to be perceived by the listener. These two main techniques essentially depend on either recording one single take in unison and layering that with the lead vocal, or recording two and sometimes four or more doubles with the intention of spreading those out in the stereo field with panning. By placing one double slightly to the left and the other to the right, you create a spacious stereo image that perceivably widens the vocal. A common practice is LCR panning, where lead vocals are centered in the stereo field and doubles and harmonies are panned out hard left and hard right, meaning all the way left and all the way right but experiment with what the song and genre considerations dictate. There's no right or wrong here. Ensuring that your doubles align perfectly with the original performance is crucial for a tight and cohesive sound. As we move into the recording phase of these doubles and harmonies, we want to capture as close to perfect as possible and use comping and editing to tighten everything up as best we can to create a polished vocal delivery. All right, so let's talk about panning very briefly. So we've recorded two takes of the lead, so unison of the lead vocal, and let's have a listen to how this sounds without the doubles and then with. Mercy, you got me begging you for mercy. I'm down on my knees. Begging, please stop playing games. Okay, so there's a ton of stuff that needs to be done here. This is a completely unedited vocal, but we're in a really good spot and we just wanted to ride the wave in terms of figuring out where we want everything placed in terms of the vocal arrangement. So we just want to get as many takes as possible down. We've got a little rough comp. So now let's listen to it with our doubles. Mercy. You got me begging you for mercy I'm down on my knees Begging please stop playing games So instantly everything is a lot thicker There's a lot more power to the vocals Which leads us to come to the conclusion That adding doubles is great for supporting a lead vocal so perhaps if you're in a dense part of a song, a part where you want to uplift the listener, you want more energy, you might want to consider adding some dubs. So now let's play with the panning. Right now we're just listening to the two dubs right in the center, which creates that sense of thickness. Let's listen to these panned out, one hard left and one hard right. Mercy. You got me begging you for mercy I'm down on my knees Begging please stop playing games So that really pulls our attention out to the sides. It creates a tremendous amount of width which makes it more exciting and creates a much larger vocal sound. Now let's experiment with this 50%. 
mercy. You got me begging you for mercy. I'm down on my knees, begging, please stop playing games. So what's interesting here is there's a little bit more of an intimate sound. The focus isn't being pulled out all the way to the sides. It feels like everything is a little closer together. So that's up to you to decide what you would need in the particular context of the song. What the genre dictates, what direction you want to go in, what your taste is telling you to do. All of this stuff is a lot more subjective at this point in terms of the production process. So there is really no right and wrong. It's just a matter of you understanding how each thing relates to how you are perceiving it in terms of emotion, how it is impacting the listener, and all of that stuff is what you're going to be thinking about and experimenting with in this vocal production stage. So for the sake of demonstrating the more traditional double, this is how it would look. You would just record one take of the lead vocal in unison. So we record our lead and then we just do our dub. And then we would tuck that back a little bit Mercy, you got me begging you for mercy. I'm down on my knees, begging, please stop playing games. So this has a slightly different sound. It feels thicker, but not quite as thick as having the two doubles. You could also pan this out a touch. Mercy, you got me begging you for mercy. Do that even less. Mercy, you got me begging you for mercy. So we would have that kind of Dave Grohl Foo Fighters sound by doing this form of doubles. So the concept of doing doubles and harmonies are essentially the same. It's totally up to you if you want to record in sets like so, and then experiment with panning those out to taste, or you could just record harmonies like so and just have it up the center, or you may do, uh, for example, a third or a fifth, and then the third is panned left and the fifth is panned right, etc. So it's really up to you in terms of how you want things to sound. So experiment with recording in sets or just singularly doing unison takes and harmonies and then either keeping them down the center or experimenting with gentle panning or more aggressive panning. Now let's shift our focus to crafting harmonies. It's all about finding the right notes that complement the main melody experiment with thirds, fifths, or even more complex intervals. Layering harmonies involves careful consideration of each note's role in the chord. This technique can elevate your music to new heights, creating a captivating sonic tapestry. So why bother with doubles and harmonies? Well, they serve several purposes. They add emotional depth, create a sense of space, and enhance the overall experience for the listener. Doubles and harmonies bring out nuances in the music that might be missed with a single performance. They can also help to impact the listener emotionally, and that is the main aim of the game here. Consider using harmonies in parts where you want to evoke strong emotions in your audience. In conclusion, doubles and harmonies are powerful tools for any music producer or artist looking to create a captivating and immersive listening experience. Remember, it's not just what you add, but how you add it. So go ahead, experiment, and let these techniques aid you in creating a powerful listening journey in your music. I wanted to show you the most common application of vocal stacking, which is dubbing, adding harmonies, and really filling out a vocal section. So in most songs, most modern songs, this will be something you see a lot. So I wanted to break down how to do this after explaining dubbing and harmonies and panning. So we've got our lead vocal. At the end of this life, are you happy? 
and then we've got a double which is panned hard left and hard right so we've recorded that twice more at the end of this life are you happy bring that up a touch at the end of this life are you happy and then we have a high harmony at the end of this life are you happy are you good with the choices you made are you being yourself or just acting and then we introduce another set of harmonies here Are you being yourself or just acting? Are you being yourself or just acting? Are you being yourself or just acting? Feel you should get started again. At this point here, we're actually dubbing this harmony to thicken it out a little more. Are you being yourself or just acting? And then at this point, the harmonies actually change. So the only part that's changing is this part here. And then finally, we have two phrases that are being accentuated with more harmonies. So let's have a listen to this part. Are you being yourself or just acting? Do you wish you could start again? When you're on your last legs on your deathbed. So we've just recorded another set of harmonies just on this line. This is also a unison line. Do you wish you could start again? Do you wish so it's just a falsetto take, it's a lot softer, and it's just layering with the other unison takes. Do you wish you could start again? So we wanted to accentuate that part and this part. This part with unison, this part with a harmony that just comes in for this section. So let's listen to all of that together in the context of this whole section. At the end of this life, are you happy? Are you good with the choices you made? Are you being yourself or just acting? Do you wish you could start again? When you're on your last legs on your deathbed, when your life flashes before your eyes, do you like who you're with in that movie? Or do you belong in mine? We had a little lad live in there, so we'll just mute that. So what is important to consider here is not just having stacks and stacks and stacks throughout the whole duration. This is a chorus part, and even here we have things coming in and out. We have these doubles that are accentuating this part then we have further unison parts accentuating just this line then harmony is accentuating just this line then we drop some parts out and leave some parts in and then drop some parts out completely so there's a journey happening within the arrangement of these doubles and harmonies there is also this falsetto part which is a more complex vocal production part and we also have a vocoder in here as well which i will go in depth later showing you exactly how to use a vocoder and all of its applications so we have everything panned hard left and hard right apart from the lead vocal which is in the center and as of now there is no processing in terms of mixing we just have some light tuning some mouth D click and vocal rider, just helping to keep everything as level as possible before we go into compression and further processing. So while we are on the topic of doubles and harmonies, I wanted to give you another example of how doubles and harmonies can be used 
to flesh out a vocal arrangement. So here we have a bridge and we're introducing a new hook that hasn't been established yet. So we start that off just with the lead vocal. So we have a big stack of harmonies that come in in the second part to flesh out and strengthen that hook. So let's have a look at how we did that. We've got two mid harmonies panned left and right, 50%. Then we have two high harmonies. And then we have two low harmonies. And then that's 50%. So the higher harmonies are panned out 100%, hard left and hard right. And together it sounds like this. And then with our lead vocal. And now I wanted to show you some doubles when using low and high octaves and doubles to strengthen another part of the song. So this is the chorus slash drop. And let's have a listen to the lead vocal with and without the octave and doubles. Take me now and you don't have to stay. I can't wait no any to I crave. I'm so done with playing all these games. When will you come and save me? And now let's listen to it with a low octave, high octave and double left and right. Take me now and you don't have to stay I can't wait no way to I crave I'm so done with playing all these games When will you come and save me? So instantly there's a ton more energy and it really fills out everything in the frequency spectrum in terms of the vocals. So we've got this low octave and I will show you how to do that with pitch and formant shifting later on. High octave. Same principle, just the octave up as opposed to down. And then we just have two doubles panned hard left and hard right. Take me now and you don't have to stay. I can't wait no way to I crave. And it's important to mention that there is some stereo imaging baked into both of these, probably using chorus or sample delay. And I just printed those in earlier on and committed those. So there is some stereo imaging happening here and there's width coming from the panning with the lead vocal in the center. Take me now and you don't have to stay. It makes a massive difference in terms of the impact of the vocals. I wanted to show you an example of using doubles more dynamically. So rather than what we've been showing so far, which is we just have doubles layered with the whole vocal section, I wanted to show you an example of really utilizing these to emphasize certain words and direct the listener's attention to where you want them to focus lyrically. Okay, so we have our lead vocal here and then we have these stabs. So let's have a listen to that before and after. So we have You're up here living not your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Oh. Now let's add those doubles in. You're up here living not your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. What's interesting here is not only are we just bringing those in for that section, the tonal quality of these are very different to the lead vocal. So with doubles, you don't necessarily need to always just copy the intensity of the lead and just dub that for width and thickness. 
you can also change completely the characteristic of how you're singing it and create variation and create contrast. So here's another example of using doubles and harmonies in the same section. Now this is the first verse, so we're bringing these in right from the beginning. So let's have a listen to this whole section. You could say that my life is a mess. It's contradicting what everyone else says. You're up here living out your best life, but you don't know what's going on inside. Always been too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what it is. Sticking like fear, the words I hear, and no one ever knows that I'm. So we have a reverb swell there too. We'll ignore that for now. So we have just the doubles panned hard left and right. Sensitive, what it is. Very, very tight. And again, a different quality of how it's being sung. Let's listen to the lead vocal on that. I'm too sensitive. sensitive. Told my whole life that's what, what it is. is. Sticking like. So we're not singing the melody. So this is working as a double as it's singing the same word but the intensity and the pitch is very different. So we're using this as a way to create background vocals. And then we add harmonies to that as well and pan them 50% left and right. Been too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what it is. Sticking so we're following the same rhythm of these doubles and we're adding a harmony. Too sensitive. Told my whole life that's what it is. Sticking so we wanna draw the listener's attention to sensitive and what it is. And it's really digging in the message of the song, which is the trials and tribulations of being a creative. So we really wanted to drum in the message of the inner turmoil that the singer is talking about in this moment. So we wanted to draw attention to those lyrics in a fun and creative way that catches the listener off guard, which is sometimes a really fun thing to do and encourages them to want to listen more to the song, which is, as a producer, one of my main goals to get people to listen to the whole song and hopefully want to repeat it. The whole point of this little demonstration and example is just to encourage you to think outside the box and do things a little differently. Don't just think that you need to dub everything and add harmonies everywhere. You can be very intentional, you can be sparse in some parts, you can add a ton in other parts, but most of all, just please be intentional with why you're doing it. If you're just adding harmonies and doubles for the sake of it, that's fine, but there's another level of nuance that comes with wanting to aid the emotional tone of the music and really emphasize the parts that you feel are most important for the listener. And hey, you might just want to add doubles and harmonies because you need to thicken a section out and you want to add more impact and that's totally fine. But when we come into the realm of really wanting to dial into the why behind every move, that is when your productions will really flourish because nothing is just being taken for granted, nothing is being put there for the sake of it, everything is being very intentionally placed. Okay, so we've got an action item for you so you can really implement all of the stuff that you are learning so far. First off, create doubles for a vocal track. Choose a short vocal phrase from a song. It can be one of your favorite songs or something you've written yourself. Now record the main vocal part, the lead vocal. Apply the technique of creating doubles by recording the same part again, either one take or two takes to pan out left and right. Experiment with timing, precision, and synchronization, and then listen to how the doubles interact with the lead vocal. Once you've done that, enhance it with panning. Take the recorded doubles and experiment with panning. Apply the knowledge that you've gained so far about placing one double slightly left and the other slightly to the right to create a wider stereo image. Listen to the difference in the spatial field of the vocals. How wide do they sound? How thick do they sound depending on the panning? What's the emotion that you feel when you make those parameters change? Next, craft harmonies for the instrumental section. Identify the main melody and create harmonies by adding complementary notes to your lead vocal. Experiment with different intervals such as thirds and fifths and do the same thing again. You wanna play around with panning and to see how 
that affects the emotional feel of your vocals altogether. Next, we want to layer our harmonies. So choose a section of your music where the harmonies can be introduced and start to layer in different harmonies to create a rich and textured sound. And finally, once you've done that, you can reflect and analyze. Listen to the before and after recordings of both the lead vocal and all of the other elements that you have recorded that are supporting the vocal, the doubles and the harmonies. Reflect on how the additions of those doubles and harmonies have impacted the overall sound. And then consider the emotional depth, sense of space and the overall sonic experience that you have created before and after. Producing gang vocals. Gang vocals involve recording a group of singers simultaneously, creating a powerful and unified vocal section. This technique is widely used across genres to add energy, intensity, and a sense of camaraderie to a vocal section. Arranging gang vocals involves carefully planning harmonies, dynamics, and the number of singers should you choose to work with multiple singers. The goal is to create a cohesive, and impactful sound that enhances the overall emotional experience of the music. Let's dive into the process of arranging gang vocals. Start by selecting a group of singers with diverse vocal tones. You can do this yourself by being creative with your own vocal placement to mimic the different qualities that having multiple singers would have. We will show you a demonstration of that later. Plan the harmonies, ensuring that they complement the main melody and add depth to the overall sound. Experiment with different vocal textures. Consider layering unison chants with harmonies and strategically place accents to emphasize key moments in the song. The arrangement should support the song's theme, emotional tone, and energy. So always have that at front of mind when you are planning these gang vocals. Oftentimes, recording gang vocals requires strategic microphone placement to capture the energy and unity of the group. Consider using both close and ambient microphones to capture the individual nuances of each singer and the collective sound. Encourage singers to perform with emotion, energy, and unity. Capturing the genuine enthusiasm of the group contributes to the power of gang vocals. So why do we use gang vocals? As we've already established, there's a sense of unity and power that these create. So oftentimes if you're working with songs that call for that emotion, we can use these gang vocals to help support the journey and emotion of the song. They create a sonic signature that resonates with the listeners and enhances the emotional impact of the music. Whether it's for a sing-along chorus or a powerful anthemic moment, gang vocals bring a unique quality to a track. All right, so I wanted to show you a quick example of a gang vocal in its simplest form. So we have this section coming in before a chorus, and these only happen once in the song, and it acts as a way to creatively tie in the lyrics into the next part of the song, while also making it a surprise for the listener, so it kind of catches them off guard and piques their interest going into the chorus. So let's just have a listen to how it sounds. So, my, my, my love. so it's very, very simple. What we've done is we've just recorded the lead vocal. So my, my, my love. And then we've just recorded two doubles and pan them hard left and hard right. So my, my, my love. And then we've got processing on there that makes it sound like this. So my, my, so a ton of spatial processing, really long decay, so that that tail leads into the chorus. And I'll walk you through how to process that all together in our vocal processing section. So after showing you a more simple gang vocal arrangement, I wanted to show you something a little more complex. Well, at the very least, there are a ton more takes. So this is a club dance track and we wanted to have a ton of vocals in the last chorus. This is something that happens throughout. The song is called Rage, and we wanted to evoke a sense of rage with the vocal arrangement. So what we've got going on here, Rage! The word rage just being said, 
and then we are layering it with a ton of takes and then panning all of that out left and right left and right like so and then I will walk you through each take so we've got our quote unquote lead gang which is in the center then we've recorded rage rage so there's a slightly different intonation there but we've dubbed that so the intonation is the same on these two pairs pan them hard left and right then we have another pair rage which is the same but the artist has stepped back so you can see that the gain coming through is a little less because he's one step back away from the microphone to capture a little more room. So there's a little more variation in terms of how that sounds. Then we have another set. Rage. And now we've got more of a chesty placement with the vocals. Rage. And now we've got another singer who is adding some more dimension with slight pitch tone variations. Rage! So just changing the tone of the voice by using a different singer is adding a sense of more vocals to it. And then we've asked that new singer to step back. Rage! Rage! And really project. So we've got more room. Rage! And then we've brought him closer to the microphone and got him to sing the octave below. Rage! And all together, you get this. Rage! So it's a huge gang vocal. And it really accentuates that word. And we wanted to create something that evokes the emotion of rage. So it's like unison, a gang of vocals just shouting the word rage. Rage! So as we spoke about gang vocals creating a sense of unity and oneness, you can also use gang vocals to evoke more intense, aggressive emotions. So play around with those if your song calls for it. In essence, the importance of gang vocals lies in their ability to elevate a song, fostering a connection between the artist and the audience. It's about capturing the collective spirit and delivering a memorable musical experience. To sum it up, Producing gang vocals is an art that involves thoughtful arrangement, strategic recording, and meticulous mixing. The collaborative energy of a group of voices can turn a good song into an unforgettable anthem. Producing choirs. Producing choir-like arrangements involves creating a rich and harmonically complex vocal ensemble. Unlike gang vocals, which emphasize unity and power, Choirs aim for a nuanced and intricate blend of voices. This technique has been a staple in various musical genres, bringing a timeless and majestic quality to compositions. Arranging choirs requires a meticulous attention to voicing, dynamics, and the overall harmonic structure. The goal is to create a tapestry of voices that enhances the emotional depth and complexity of a musical piece. Let's delve into the process of arranging choirs. The arrangement should be tailored to evoke the desired emotional response and serve the overarching musical narrative. A quick note on counterpoint. Counterpoint in music involves the combination of different independent melodies that are played or sung simultaneously. It's a technique where each voice maintains its melodic integrity while harmonizing with others. This interplay of melodies enhances the overall texture, allowing the intricate harmonies and a compelling musical expression. Counterpoint is a fundamental tool in crafting harmonically engaging and emotionally resonant choral compositions. Recording choirs demands a thoughtful approach to capture the subtleties of each voice. Encourage singers to deliver nuanced performances, allowing for dynamic expression. The goal is to capture the delicate interplay of voices within the choir. While both choirs and gang vocals involve multiple voices, the distinction lies in their purpose and sonic characteristics. Choirs emphasize intricate harmonies and nuanced voicings, creating a refined and classical aesthetic. Gang vocals, on the other hand, focus on unity and power, often used in contemporary genres for anthemic choruses or energetic moments. So why use choirs? 
Choir-like arrangements bring a level of sophistication and emotional depth to music. They can convey a sense of grandeur, nostalgia, or spirituality depending on the context. In modern production, choirs add a timeless quality that resonates with listeners and elevates the overall sonic experience. To sum it up, producing choir-like arrangements is a meticulous art form requiring careful attention to voicing, dynamics, and placement. Unlike gang vocals, choirs aim for a refined and classical aesthetic, offering a timeless quality to modern productions. So let me show you an example of a choir vocal with only one voice. So this is just one moment within the song, and we just wanted to have this sense of a choir. There is some more advanced modulation happening, which I will break down later on. But for the sake of just demonstrating how this would look, let's just break down each take. So we have this take. And then we're recording a double of that take. And we've panned those out 50% left, 50% right. So there's our first set. And then we have a second set, which is these. And we've panned those hard left and hard right. And now we have a third set of harmonies. So we have a second set of vocals now, if we're looking at it like here is our first set, which is our lead. Here's our second set, which is our first harmony. Here's our third set, which is our third harmony. So we've got some pitch discrepancies here. This hasn't been edited. We would of course go through each section and edit those, tune those, make sure everything is as tight as we need them to be. But right now we're looking at this purely from a raw recording standpoint. So we've got our fourth set now. And then we actually had another set that we decided not to use. So we've just muted those. So let's have a listen to what that sounds like altogether. So it sounds like more than one person singing, and that is exactly what we wanted to do. We wanted it to be thick, wide, and richly harmonic. Here is another example of how you can use choirs in a more creative way. So as opposed to what we've shown so far, which is a more traditional choir, this is kind of a hybrid between a choir and a gang vocal. So it comes in this turn between the end of chorus one and verse two. So we have this break and then have this choir come in. So let's have a listen to how it sounds. There's no processing on it. It's all been edited. We have a ton of spatial processing and effects, but that is out of the scope of this part of the example. So let's have a listen to the choir in its raw form. So we have our main vocal here. And you can see that we had a couple of takes and then we have two high harmonies that are panned hard left and right. And then two low harmonies panned 50% left, 50% right. So they're doing a slightly different part. So we're creating some counterpoint. And then we have a little choir ad lib and we panned that gently from left to right. And altogether, it sounds like this. So we've got some movement within that choir itself that leads us into the next section. Play around with moments like this. Don't be afraid to add vocals in sections that you may ordinarily think not to do that. You might think to add a drum fill or some risers or that kind of thing. And what is really nice to have in parts that call for it is to play around with using vocals as that kind of effect or instrument. So I hope that's helpful. And let's move on to the next section. So I wanted to show another example of creating a choir. This is an example that 
we haven't discussed so far, which is actually a sung choir where we're singing lyrics as opposed to O's and R's and that kind of thing. So let's have a listen to this choir and break down how we recorded this. So this is a huge anthemic part at the end of the song. So let's break down how we did this. So we have this part. This was the starting point for this choir. And we've panned that hard left and hard right. Never, I never. Never, I never. Never, I never. Never, I never. So we're just copying that part and then it changes and then we loop that through. And now we have these two lower parts. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. And together it sounds like this. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. We've panned that hard left and right again. And now we are making things a little more interesting. So we have a cupped take. So what I'm doing now, if you can hear the tonal difference as I'm speaking, is I'm just cupping my hands around my mouth and my nose, and then I'm speaking into the mic. So that tonal difference creates variation and will mimic a slightly different voice. So let's have a listen to those takes. So there's a lot more mid-range, there's a little more nasality to it. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. And we've panned those hard left and right, and now we have our nasal takes. Never, oh never. So if you sound like that and put your fingers on your nose, you get a slightly different quality. So that's what we're doing. We are just getting Lucy to sing with her hand on her nose or even just placing her voice like that so that it has a slightly different quality. We've found that left and right 50%. And then we have done all of our main takes. We have one harmony so far, this low one. And now we're moving on to the real meat of the choir, which is adding all of these harmonies. So we have got our nasal harmony. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. And they're pan 50% left and 50% right. And now we have our far harmonies. So Lucy's taken two or three steps back from the microphone and we're gonna capture some more room. She's also singing it differently. It's more chesty and it's almost as if you've brought the formant down on a formant shifter. We're bringing the throat length down a touch to mimic having multiple singers in the room. And now we have our high harmony, which we're panning hard left and hard right. Pretty self-explanatory there. Nothing crazy going on. And then we have our second high harmony panned hard left and right. Never, oh never. So these are falsetto harmonies. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. And then that follows through the same. And finally we have our low harmonies. And these are panned 50% left and 50% right. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. So we're just singing that the whole way through. In some instances, there are a few parts here that might sound a little bit questionable in solo. But what happens is when we group all of these together with the panning that we've done, the editing we've done, we've got auto tune on all of these parts because 
The tuning was pretty bang on. We just wanted to tighten it up a little bit. This is what we get. This huge choir. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. Never, oh never. And that is with pretty much the most minimal processing. We've got a little bit of multiband compression. Never, oh never. Just taming some lows, low mids, and some of the mids. And then just a little bit of limiting. Never, oh never. Just catching those peaks. So this is an example of how being intentional with how you're placing things, knowing how to manipulate your voice and your placement within the room can really open up so many possibilities that you otherwise wouldn't be able to do without having a whole choir. So play around with all of these techniques, have fun with it. There's so much you can do with your vocal arrangement and your placement that can really make some interesting things happen in terms of how you produce your vocals. Producing ad-libs. Ad-libs, short for ad libitum, or at one's pleasure, are spontaneous and improvisational vocal embellishments. They play a crucial role in music, adding flair, emotion, and distinctive touch to a song. Ad-libs can range from subtle vocalizations to powerful expressions, providing artists with a platform for creative spontaneity. Understanding how to produce and integrate ad-libs effectively involves exploring various creative approaches to enhance the overall impact of a musical composition. Let's delve into the process of producing ad-libs. One approach is to encourage improvisation during the recording session. Provide the artist with the freedom to experiment, allowing for genuine and unrestrained expressions that capture the essence of the moment. Additionally, consider experimenting with different vocal effects such as reverb, delay, or modulation to add sonic richness and dimension to the ad-libbed phrases. These effects can transform simple vocalizations into captivating elements that complement the main vocal track. Once the ad-libs are recorded, the next step is seamless integration into the song. Start by identifying suitable sections where ad-libs can enhance the emotional impact or add emphasis. Ad-libs often work well in transitional moments, between phrases or during instrumental breaks. Experiment with layering ad-libs, adjusting their volume and panning to create a dynamic and immersive listening experience. The goal is to weave ad-libs seamlessly into the fabric of the song, enhancing its overall impact and texture. Ad-libs serve as a vehicle for artists to inject their personality and spontaneity into a song. They add a layer of authenticity, making the music more relatable to listeners. In modern production, ad-libs have become a distinctive element that elevates a song and contributes to its uniqueness. Understanding the importance of ad-libs lies in their ability to transform a song from a structured composition into a dynamic and expressive work of art. So we have another hands-on exercise for you. Now that you have experimented with adding doubles and harmonies, it's now time for you to add your own ad-libs. So allow yourself three to five takes, let them run through and loop if you wish, and play around with spontaneity and adding creative parts off the fly and see how that adds to the vocal arrangement that you have done so far. In conclusion, producing ad-libs is about embracing the spontaneity of the creative process. By encouraging improvisation, experimenting with vocal effects, and thoughtfully integrating ad-libs into a song, you can support the emotional intent of the song and create a more sophisticated and lively vocal arrangement. So let's have a listen to some ad-libs, how we've arranged them and a before and after. So we're in our editing session, we've recorded, we've got our two track and then we're going to edit all of this stuff and then move that back into the production session and move into mix and mastering. So we've got our lead vocal, our dubs, our harmonies, we've got a choir, 
But for the sake of focusing and honing in on the ad libs, let's have a listen to what we've got going. So our ad libs come in from here. Let's put our lead vocal in. Never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, better, better. No, no, never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, 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 better. I'm never going back. So we have a few different things going on here. We've got this O. And then we're copying that through. We've got, it's actually another take, but we are singing the same thing twice. Then we have this high ad lib and we're panning that slightly to the right just to move it out of the center. So it creates a nice little harmony there. And then we've got the freedom. And then we've just got a reverb swell on this ending to smear that and stitch it into the last section. So there's a nice long tail. So what I wanna do is I just want to mute the ad libs and then listen to how that affects the energy of this final part of the song. Never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, better, better. And no, no, never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, 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 better. And now let's listen to it with our ad libs. Never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, better, better. And no, no, never going back, never, never. Never going back, never, never. Cause I deserve more, I deserve better, 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 better. I'm never going back. I'm never going back. So we've got some little clicks and bops coming in. We'll sort those out while we're editing. But there's so much more energy. There's so much more that's lifting this into the final part and into the outro of the song that hopefully will achieve the goal of having the listener want to rewind the song, listen to it again to get back to this place in the song that really elevates the energy and gets people in their feels. So having ad libs and making sure that they are intentionally placed, you can see there's not a ton going on here. And we have got this part that acts as kind of a drone. And then we have this, which is in a different part of the frequency spectrum. So there's not too much clashing in terms of what's happening. And your best friend oftentimes is space. So where there's space, we can add some ad libs rather than having to carve space because all of these are in the same frequency range and they're fighting with each other. So play around with ad libs. They are a great way to add energy and spontaneity to a song. All right, here's an example of some more ad libs from another song. So we've got quite a lot going on here. We ended up muting some of these. We kind of want to fit things in like a jigsaw puzzle, like we were speaking on the other demonstration. You kind of want to slide things in where you can so that things aren't always conflicting. So let's have a listen to these ad libs. So we don't need this ad lib because it's in exactly the same place and it's in the same frequency spectrum as this. So we need to decide what we want to be the winner here. So here we've just got three little ad libs and then we go into here. Let it burn, let it burn. Oh. Burn. 
So let's have a listen to this in the context of everything else. London's burning, and we are London's burning, and we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of the desperate search, and no one can. So let's have a listen to the vocal arrangement with and without the ad libs. So we've got our lead vocal, we've got our dubs, our harmonies, we've got a choir here, and then we've got our ad libs. So let's mute our ad libs. London's burning, and we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search, and no one can hear our cries. And now let's have a listen to it with the ad libs. London's burning, and we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of the desperate search, and no one can hear our cries. Let it burn, let it burn, let it burn. So again, it's lifting the energy. It feels a little more spontaneous. It feels emotional because we've got these moments that are coming in echoing certain words. We've got these other strong ad-libs that are very emotive. And then we have this ad-lib in the outro, which almost acts as the lead vocal, which is kind of playing off of the rest of this choir. Now, of course, we're in the recording session here. The balance is off. We need to really finesse where everything is being placed in terms of volume, panning, and frequency. But from a production standpoint, what we want to do is really add some special moments that lift the energy, particularly in the climactic parts of the song. So in this demonstration, I want to break down a vocal production recording in real time and walk you through what that would look like. I'm going to use myself. I'm not the greatest singer, but we'll get some backing vocals down. We'll get some stacks. I'll walk you through recording harmonies, doubles, ad libs, and some creative applications of all of the stuff that you can do when we're thinking about vocal production particularly in the recording phase and also show you the production that I would do. So I'm just going to walk you through this demo. I've just built this out now. I've got some ideas for melodies and lyrics, but first off, I just want to build out the mood of it with some backing vocals. So let me quickly walk you through my recording chain. So I'm using my Apollo Twin. I've got it running through this Avalon preamp. There's not much going on here. I've got high gain. I'm using a dynamic microphone. So that's helping to get a bit more juice out of it. I'm actually not doing anything right now in terms of compression or EQ. I might just tuck some of the low mids around between 200 and 250. As I'm quite close to the mic, I might get rid of a touch of bass. But aside from that, I just want to get some of the coloration from this preamp. And I'm just running it through an LA-2A getting somewhere between minus three and minus five dB of gain reduction. I'm not too worried about it going further, just catching some of those peaks. And then I'm just running it through a light bit of real-time auto-tune. I know we're in the key of E major, so I've got it around medium. Especially with backing vocals, I'm not too fussed about it sounding a little tuned. In the context of everything else, it should be fine. So let's put some tuning on. It's going to sound a little wacky, but for the sake of getting these nice and tight and clean from the get-go, I find, especially with backing vocals, I like to run through some form of tuning in real time. So let's have a listen to what we've got, and then we'll start recording some stuff. So very simple, we've got some easy drama just holding down the rhythm that I want and then 
let it go back and start fleshing drums out, making them a little more unique. But for now, we just want to get something, we want to build a vibe, we want to create something worth writing to, and then see what we've got and see if it's something worth really producing out. So I'm hearing some backing vocals. So for now, I'm going to add some of those and I'll walk you through kind of what that looks like in terms of what I'm thinking and show you some techniques of producing those out. So we're going for this kind of Olivia Rodrigo-y indie pop vibe. So I'm thinking that would be my main vocal line. I'm going to record it a couple more times to really tighten it out now that I know what I'm kind of doing. So I'm running out of breath there. Let's get a couple more takes. I don't mind that little shakiness at the end. In the context, it should be fine. Let's have a listen. So I came in a little bit late there with the breath. Let's move that across. Okay, I'm going to do a couple more takes of that and then I'm going to dub that. a little better. Let's dub this now. Okay. So I'm just listening to it. I'm paying close attention to the endings of this. I want to make sure that I'm as tight in time with this as possible. So that came a little, cut off a little too soon. Let's try that again. And I'm just cutting the breaths out as I go because I know I don't want any breaths here. What's really great here is I can look at the waveform as I'm singing. So I'm just making sure that I'm trying to match the timing of this as closely as possible. So let's flatten that. Let's flatten that. Get rid of this breath. So we're really trying to get things as close to where we want them to be as possible from the get go. I'm going to be a little cheeky here and So I'm going to pan these out hard left and hard right. Let's have a listen to that. So with the panning out, I'm hearing some of those timing discrepancies. So let's tighten this up a little bit. Okay. 
It was a little better. Uh, okay, let's just move that a little bit. label these got some build up around 250 and 500 start fleshing this out a little bit more. Just playing around here, figuring some stuff out. Try that. completely did that all the way through so let me try that again because I want this to match the timing of this but I'm also just playing around with placement trying to make it a little softer more falsetto-y So the intention going in is these are backing vocals, I want these to feel softer. So I need to convey that with my vocals as well. Not bad, not great. So, still some timing stuff going on here. Save myself a little. Now, of course, if this was a, a proper recording session, we just want to get as many takes as possible and not just try to edit our way out of it. But for the sake of just showing this process, let's try to get it in the pool park. Let's dub that again. <clears throat> Okay. 
Okay. Let's see where we're at. Okay, so what I am thinking now is I might have to revisit these BVs as the, the quality here, the, the breathiness, the slight airiness and more soft delivery of these feels better in the context of this. So I might revisit this, but right now I just want to see if there is anything else that I want to add to this and then start processing it. Sounds a little Christmas songy for me. Um, maybe let's simplify that a little bit. that timing okay I'm gonna pan this 50% sometimes I like to pan the lower frequency content a little less aggressively and let the the mid-range and higher mids spread out to the sides Okay, let me pan that across. All of this labeling is really helpful as well, especially when you have a dense vocal arrangement. You want to make sure you know what everything is. So doing it as you go along is very, very helpful. balance here I will revisit this once we have everything fleshed out and then see which parts we want to really accentuate with the the volume and panning but it's always helpful to have everything as close to where you want it to be as, as possible so you can move as quickly as you need to let's dub that again Again. Let's have a listen to if those qualities match in terms of how I've placed my voice. Okay, let's do that again. completely messed that up okay let's just record this section here okay how are we looking in terms of timing let's move that across a little bit okay Make sure I get those right. So I'm just using option here and I'm hovering around the lower corner and that allows me to use flex time and I can drag things out or shorten them. So in instances like that, I would use that rather than just chopping things around just because 
we would mess up the timing in terms of you know these backing vocals i can be a little more aggressive and heavy-handed with them let's have a listen to where we're at okay i can hear some timing issues there a bit late okay revisit this sounds a little tighter How's this one doing? I'm going to make the decision to cut that off all at the same time and fade it a little. See how that sounds. Okay, let's have a listen to that again. It sounds a little tighter. I'm going to re-record these main BBs. Now that I can kind of hear what I was going for, the direction we've gone in has slightly changed how I want to record the lead. Run out of breath. Let's go again. that quality though okay let's do the dub Listen to how that sounds. Okay, we've got some stuff coming in late here. Let's flatten these out. I want to make sure that I'm chopping parts where the note is completely the same so we don't mess things up. Let's see if this feels tighter. <laughs> Okay, still work to be done. Let's listen to this in solo. Okay, let's. Okay, this is a little late. this out a little bit you could do this all with vocal line but for the sake of showing you the manual way you can really fine tune everything here so beginning and ends 
there are some great examples of coming in a little sloppy here. Let's try and match timing of this. Have things coming in quite tight to the grid. Some funkiness going on here with the chops. how that affected the end of that. feels quite nice with the melody that I've got in my brain at the moment. So I'm just listening to how I can shape the tone of this, how boosting and reducing certain frequencies is just shaping the overall tone of how the vocals sound, particularly in the context of the music and what I have in mind for how I want the backing vocals to sound. I'm definitely gonna go back to references. I'm thinking of Rule, Olivia Rodrigo, that kind of Lane, Holly Humberston and I would reference their backing vocals and see how they sound in terms of tonality as I start to flesh everything out. But just based off of instinct, I'm just getting a feel for kind of where I want things to sit. I know there's some build up happening, so I'm just tidying things up a touch. I might revisit it, think I've cut too much, but just eyeballing stuff and doing gut reactions to things as we go along. So I think I want to add a sense of space and width to this. So I'm actually going to add delay here. why it's so important to get things as tight as possible from the get-go and really pay attention to it because when you start adding other processing to it it can really accentuate the sloppiness so I've got some spatial processing some limiting. Just 
So we're just attacking those peaks. We want it to feel smooth and everything to be even so that when we're bringing things up and down, we're getting that even dynamic range in those BVs so things don't feel karaoke-ish or they're getting lost. sounds so much smoother to my ears. So that is affecting the presence of it. I might do something slightly different here. So with the lo-fi, that's really affecting the tone. So let's listen to it 100% wet. A lot less high end, a lot more mid-range. Let's listen to it with and without lo-fi. So in the context of the backing vocals being soloed, I personally prefer it with lo-fi, but it is adding a lot more low mids. So let's listen to it in the context of the music because we really need to decide what it needs in terms of the music itself. And remember that we've got other vocals coming in as well. So we don't want to clutter that range frequency rise. So right now, I am going to leave lo-fi off. I think it sounds a little cleaner. Okay, so I'm hearing this. The lack of coherence with these, with the delay is drawing my focus to them, which we definitely don't want. Let's listen to it from the beginning.
Okay, so at this point, I would take a quick break and then come back and listen to the BVs again on fresh ears, see what needs to be edited, have a listen to the processing I've done so far, and then kind of go from there. Advanced arrangement and effects. Pitch and formant shifting. Pitch and formant shifting are powerful tools that alter the fundamental characteristics of a vocal recording. Pitch shifting modifies the pitch, while formant shifting adjusts resonant frequencies, influencing timbre. Pitch shifting changes the note, and formant shifting changes the color or tonality, offering vast creative possibilities. Exploring advanced pitch shifting techniques Granular pitch shifting involves manipulating tiny vocal fragments independently. This method allows for subtle or extreme pitch alterations, creating ethereal effects commonly found in electronic and experimental music. Moving on to formant shifting. This technique can drastically alter vocal character without changing pitch. Experiment with various settings to achieve effects from gender bending transformations to unique vocal textures that stand out in the mix. Pitch and formant shifting are essential for pushing creative boundaries. These techniques can transform a standard vocal line into something extraordinary, adding a layer of innovation to your music. Understanding the why behind pitch and formant shifting unlocks the ability to express emotions, tell stories, and create sonic landscapes that captivate listeners in new and unexpected ways. In conclusion, pitch and formant shifting are gateways to sonic exploration, empowering us to redefine vocal textures and elevate our music. All right, let's dive into pitch and formant shifting. The two can go hand in hand. And what is really exciting with this is the opportunity to pair this with other tools and techniques that we're going to discuss in this whole section. So let me pull up a pitch shifter. So here we have a, a pitch shifter and you can see there's not very many knobs on here. There's not much going on. We have pitch. So we're going to pull that up four semitones I've been thinking about you. this is it before I've been thinking about you. so you can use this almost as a utility plugin where you're just changing the pitch let's say i needed it minus six semitones I've been thinking about you. I've been thinking about you. so that can sound a little strange it's bringing in some artifacts and let's have a listen to linking the formant. So that sounds very different. So we've got pitch sorted. Let's talk through formant. The formant is essentially emulating the throat length. So let's have a listen. If I loop this round and then I play around with the formant as we're listening, let's listen to how that changes. So you notice that the lower it goes, the more chesty and deep it sounds, the further up it goes, the more nasal and metallic it sounds almost. So depending on what you need, you're going to play around with the formant to suit the emotional tone of the material that you're working with. And as you can see, while I was moving that around, that is actually something that is done a lot in modern vocal production, the automation. So let me show you an example of what that would look like. So I would click touch and then what I could do is And now I've got that automation written in. So particularly in a lot of electronic genres, in dance music, this is a technique that's employed a ton. So let's talk through a couple of the other parameters here. So we've got transpose, which is this algorithm. We've also got quantize. So let's have a listen to how this sounds. So what's happening is it's quantizing each note to the nearest pitch and it's creating that auto-tune sound. So we have this algorithm. About 
So that sounds a lot less human. So if we were going for something where we wanted to create a voice that sounds a lot more synthetic, you might want to deploy that kind of mode. And finally, we've got robotic. So if you need to sound like a droid from Star Wars, or you want to get that kind of Daft Punk sound, this is something that you would play around with. So you could also automate the pitch parameters to create your own melody using this mode and using some form of an acapella to create something completely new. And finally, we've got drive, which is adding some distortion. So let's drive that and listen to it aggressive. Let's put it back to transpose mode. So that adds a lot more grit, a lot more aggression. If you needed that emotional tone, you could play around with the drive. And then finally, we have the mix knob. So this is just us mixing in like any other plugin, like a reverb, like a compressor. We can do the processing in parallel. So we could have something driven, so it's very distorted. We could bring the formant down, and then we could mix that into taste. I've been thinking about you. So you can create harmonies, you can stack octaves, you can have the lower octave, the octave above, and then you can play around with the formant to taste. And I'm sure that as you're listening to this, these are some familiar sounding vocal production techniques that you've probably heard in a ton of songs. So we have the low octave, low formant. We have the high octave, high formant. We've got the high octave, low formant. These are very, very popular in a lot of electronic genres. So the goal here is really just to understand what it is that we need. Are we doing something aggressive on the lead vocal and then actually affecting that with pitch and formant shifting and using that as a new modulated sound? Or are we blending something in to taste to maintain the integrity of the original lead vocal? And are we just adding some extra flavor to that? So that would be when you decide where you want the mix knob to be, the drive and the formant and pitch and also the mode. Now you definitely don't need to go out and buy Little Alter Boy as much as I love this plugin. So here we have Logic's stock vocal transformer. There is a pitch shifter, but to get a similar sound, you would want to use vocal transformer. So we have pitch on the left and we can go up to plus 24 and minus 24, so it's double the amount to Little Alter Boy. We have the mix here, and then we have the formant, which also goes down plus minus 24. And then we have this robotize algorithm here. So let's have a listen to this. So we're just playing around with the pitch and the foreman and then we're just mixing that in. Let's put the robotize mode on. 
think about you. I've been thinking 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 about you. And we have the same quality to the robot mode here. So you have the exact same parameters in a stock plugin. So you have all of that at your disposal in Logic and in pretty much any other door, you'll have a very similar plugin that just comes built in. So like I said, this is a very simple plugin, but the possibilities here, especially with mixing and blending to taste, with layering and with automation can make some really interesting vocal production choices. So play around with it, get to know all of these parameters inside and out. Think about how you can change parameters over time to create something interesting and start to build taste and flavor with your own tracks. And always remember to reference and hear what other producers are doing and draw inspiration from them as well. Vocoders. Vocoders, short for voice encoders, are powerful tools in the realm of vocal production. Fundamentally, vocoders combine the characteristics of a modulator, typically a human voice, and a carrier, usually a synthesizer, creating a distinctive sound that merges both elements together. This iconic effect has been a staple in various musical genres, adding a robotic or synthesized quality to vocals. To fully harness the potential of vocoders, it's essential to grasp the fundamentals and explore creative ways to integrate them into vocal production. Several popular artists have incorporated vocoders in their production, adding a unique and futuristic touch to their music. And here are a few notable examples. Daft Punk, the iconic French electronic duo is renowned for their extensive use of vocoders. Tracks like Harder, Better, Faster, Stronger showcase their mastery in blending electronic elements with vocoder-treated vocals. Imogen Heap, the English singer-songwriter and producer, has creatively utilized vocoders in her own work. Her song Hide and Seek gains significant attention for its haunting and innovative vocoder-heavy arrangement. Delving into the basics, Vocoders work by analyzing the spectral content of a modulator signal, the voice, and imposing it on a carrier signal, synthesizer. The result is a unique blended sound that captures both the tonal characteristics of the voice and the synthesized elements. Understanding parameters like the number of bands, attack and release times, and the balance between the modulator and carrier signals allows for precise control over the vocoder effect. These fundamentals form the foundation for creative exploration. Now let's explore creative ways to integrate vocoders into vocal production. Beyond the traditional robotic voice effect, vocoders can be used to add character, texture, and uniqueness to vocals. Experiment with different carrier signals, such as synthesizers, strings, or even unconventional sounds to achieve diverse and unexpected results. Consider using vocoders in dynamic ways, such as creating harmonies, enhancing background vocals, or adding a futuristic touch to lead vocals. Automating vocoder parameters over time can introduce evolving textures and contribute to the overall sonic narrative. Vocoders hold a unique place in vocal production because they offer a bridge between the organic and the synthetic they can transform a vocal performance into something otherworldly, contributing to the sonic identity of a track. In modern production, vocoders are not just effects, they are tools for vocal artistic expression. The importance of vocoders lies in their ability to push the boundaries of vocal creativity, allowing artists and producers to explore new sonic territories and craft memorable, distinctive sounds. In conclusion, vocoders open up a world of sonic possibilities in vocal production. By understanding the fundamentals and embracing creative integration, you can use vocoders to elevate your music, to add depth, character, and a touch of futurism to vocal performances. All right, so let me walk you through how to use a vocoder 
and the kind of nitty gritty effects that you can create with it. I'm going to show you my go-to and then I'll also show you a stock version of it as well. So we've got a acapella here from Splice and this is just a lead vocal and then we just have some chords that I've played on the piano and then I've just dragged those chords over to the vocoder. So let's have a listen to this. I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you So that grabbed me, I could hear a chord progression in my head and wanted to fill this out with a vocoder. So right now this isn't a song. As you've noticed, nothing is playing either. So we've got the chords on the vocoder, but the vocoder is actually not playing anything. So first of all, we need the vocoder to know what it needs to encode. So audio, we've got our lead vocal. We want to go to MIDI, accept. And this is just the stock vocoder sound right out of the box. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. So it's unlocked a whole different world. And this is the beauty of what you can do with vocoders. So let's start to talk about all of these parameters. So I'm using vocal synth. This has a lot more flexibility and advanced controls. This is essentially the main module of it. So it's just the original vocoder. Then we've got different styles, hard, vintage, smooth, and then we can Shift I want you and only you. the format. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. And then we've got scale, which is how quickly the vocoder adjusts to the vowel sounds. This is pretty subtle. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So this sounds a lot more modern sounding. If you want something to sound very synthesized and vintage, put the scale down. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. So it doesn't really sound like it's following the vocals. It's not as tight. There's a long release of the chords. Whereas when we put the scale to 100, it's a lot tighter. It feels like those chords are part of the whole vocal, like it's almost been printed together. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. And then we can play around with smooth. I want you and only you. Vintage. I want you and only you. Slightly different tonal characteristics. I want you and only you. I personally love smooth. I want you and only you. And then the level is how much of the vocoder you want blended in with the original signal. So you can see this visual representation of that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Uh -huh. And then we have all these different variations of the vocoder. So we've got BioVox, CompuVox, TalkVox, and PolyVox. So without the vocoder, you... let's just try BioVox. Let's listen to how this sounds. I want you and only you. So we've got clarity. So this is kind of the intelligibility of the vocal. So let's pull that to zero and have a listen. I want you and only you. Just sounds like a ton of harmonic noise. And then let's bring that clarity up. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So it's a lot airier, 
But what's nice is we have this breath control. So this is breathiness. So we can still retain the intelligibility and the clarity, or we can bring this in. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. I want you and only you. Super breathy, but that can add a lot of air when blended into the other modules themselves. So we've got nasality. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. That brings a little more presence. Think of it in terms of singing. Nasality can help to cut through a mix. So you might want to use that depending on how dense your mix is as well. We've got the level, which is how much we want to blend that in. And then we've got shift, which is just the form and shifting. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. And these are different presets. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So there's a lot more modulation happening there. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. So all of these have different tonal characteristics. Some of them have a lot more low end, some have a lot less low mids. So this is something you want to consider when blending everything in. And that's the beauty of this particular vocoder. There is so much possibility in terms of creating your own kind of vocoder sound. So that's BioVox. Let's listen to CompuVox. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. So there's a lot more of a synthetic sound. It sounds, it doesn't sound very human, which can be really helpful. Let's talk through these parameters. So this adds digital noise. I want you and only you. Let me save your ears. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. So it's almost like bit crushing and then bytes decreases intelligibility. So let's play around with that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. So that's really cool if you want to fill some of the space in between here, you could potentially blend this in with another module. So let's have a listen to, to that with BioVox. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So it's creating this release, this tail, and it's creating almost like a, a glitching effect. Let's turn that off. And then we've got bats, which is this swarming effect. Let's have a listen to that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing they die. Let's turn the bites down. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. I want you and only you. So the bites makes it a lot less harmonic 
and like there's a supportive vocal happening there. I want you and only you. It's very breathy, it's quite eerie. That might be something that you want to play around with in a darker, more eerie, atmospheric, scary song. And you want to bring something in that unsettles the listener a little bit. I want you and only you. And then we've got these different types, much like the vocoder. We've got smooth, hard, vintage. We have read, spell, and math. I want you and only you. Let's listen to spell. I want you and only you. Math. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So they all have slightly different tonal characteristics and then blending all of these different parameters. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. When we blend those together, we start to create that modern vocoder sound. So let's move on to TalkBox. So this is the classic TalkBox effect made popular by artists like Stevie Wonder, Daft Punk. There's some TalkBox effects in Dua Lipa's most recent album, and The Weeknd uses it. It's very popular in a lot of R&B and Motown genres, as well as disco pop. So let's have a listen to how this sounds. I want you and only you. So drive is harmonic distortion. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Makes the sound a lot fuller because we're adding harmonic distortion. We're adding frequencies to the overall signal. And then speaker is adding compression. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So that's also adjusting the tone. So listen to it. I want you and a lot warmer, a lot more low mids. I want you and only you. Way less low mid information. So in the context of all of these different modules, you might want to bring that in to add a sense of high mid energy. And you might be having the vocoder, for instance. I want you covering the low mid information. So already we're starting to slot things in in terms of where they're fitting in terms of the frequency spectrum as well. And we've got a four minute shift. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. And then we've got classic, dark and bright. So the classic sound. I want you and only you. Dark. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So we can hear how the tone is changing with these different parameters. So this is Polyvox, and this is what makes vocal synth so special. It's the module that is unique to vocal synth. So let's talk about these parameters. So we've got a formant shifter, which is the same as a lot of these modules. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. Then we've got character, which is how the vocoder reacts to the pitch and adjusts the formant as that happens with the, the signal coming in. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So that's almost creating the characteristics of formant shifting as well, but in a more subtle way. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. It's a really interesting sound. And then we have Humanize, which is the timing and pitch variation 
being adjusted while the signal comes in. So it's adding modulation to it. So let's listen to it. 100%. I want you and only you. So we can hear that there's some pitch modulation happening. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, I want you and only you. So that does thicken the sound as well. And then we've got our level knob to blend that in. We've covered the top half of the user interface. Now let's just talk about the pitch parameter here. So we can add pitch correction. So we are in A major and then we can click the register. So is it low sounding vocal, mid or high? And then blend that in. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want. So when that strength comes in, that's how aggressive we want the tuning to be. How fast? I want you and only you. We want the tuning to be. I want you and only you. And then we can blend that in, and it adds a sense of thickness. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So it's adding modulation to it by blending in a copy of this slight pitch variation to the lead vocal. So it's essentially a demonstration of what chorus and other modulation kind of does. Okay, so let's jump across to the right side here. So we have a gate and that allows us to tighten the noise between phrases. So if we have some trailing going on with the release of some of these notes, we can gate them so it sounds really tight at the beginning and end of each word. So you can get that Z kind of feel where it's very, very tight chords hitting only when the vocals coming in and out and cutting off when the vocals end. Then we have panning where we can pan out where we want the vocoder to be in the stereo spectrum. And we also have width where we can pull that more out to the sides or more into the center. Then we have the mix knob, which is all of the processing that we've done. We can just blend that in with the vocals themselves and then just output, bringing the level up and down of the vocoder effects. Okay, so let's have a look at the bottom. So we have some effects here. We've got distortion, filtering, transform, shred, chorus delay and ring modulation. And what's really cool here is you can order these around to create your own unique effects chain like so. And you can just turn each of these on and off. So distort, we've got drive, tone and warm and then the mix knob. Filter, we've got the frequency, the resonance. So you can make it poke out. Let's have a listen to that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. So we can have a really sharp cue and move that around. Got a high pass, low pass combo. I want you and only you. And then scream. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Then we've got transform. So we can transform the signal with these different parameters. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. And then we can play around with the stereo width. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. And then blend that into taste. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I... 
Then we've got shred, which is really cool. You can create some stuttering and gating. I want you in on you. And you can play around with the length. Quarter notes. Quarter notes triplet. Eighth note triplet. Eighth note, eighth note triplet, etc. And then how many shreds you want there to be. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to the lost. So you can do that. You can play around with these different algorithms here. So that's completely transforming it. It's giving it this granular sound. You could put that first and then distort it. <laughs> and then blend that into taste with the shred. <laughs> and then you could bring the width out. So that's creating a completely different effect that you would never associate with a vocoder, but we have these parameters and these effects that can allow us to do that in this particular vocoder itself. So let's move on to chorus. This is just your bog standard chorus. We've got depth, rate, and width. I want you in on you. We'll discuss chorus in depth later on. Then we've got delay. So we've got the option to sync that and then do it in terms of the subdivisions. We've got feedback, how long we want the delay to ring out for, and then width, how wide we want the delay. And then we've got a mix knob. I want you to and we can hear that that's panned out. And we could also I want you in on you. do that globally so everything is wider. And then we've got ring modulation. We can also sync this to our tempo and then play around with the subdivisions. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to lose. Or we can take that off and then play around with the LFO and the depth. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. You can also create that kind of stuttering tremolo effect I want you in on you. and blend that into taste as well. So I just wanted to cover a couple more little parameters, more advanced ones that often get lost when using this particular plugin. So we have some more advanced customization here when we click these little fader buttons. So what's really fun here is with vocoder, we can play around with the frequency bands of the overall signal. So what I love to do here is pan the higher frequencies out wide and then stagger these out less and less as we get to the lower parts of the frequency spectrum. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to lose. I want you in. We can also do the volume as well, so we can bring lows down. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So we've just got the highs now. We could do the opposite. I 
I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose so there's a lot less high end, we are accentuating the lows, and you could play around with this when you're blending in what each characteristic and what each module is accentuating within the vocoder. And we could play around with how the frequencies are panned out. And what's great is you can just reset everything with that button there, refresh it, and then start again if you don't like how it sounds. Then we can play around with adding more oscillators so we can treat this like a synth and we can blend that in with a saw, a sync saw, square, triangle, I want you in. and multiple saws. I want you in. And then you can play around with pitch. So you can see we've got this saw already, which is pitched down an octave. I want you in on you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, oh. Can play around with the modulation here. I want you and only you. Pitch modulation. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. And then we can use the shape, morphs the waveform shape. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. And then we can modulate that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. And we have those parameters for the two oscillators. And we've got the noise. So we can add noise to this. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Doesn't seem to be doing too much. It's very subtle. I want you I want and this isn't something that I play around with a lot. I love to just play around mainly with the panning of the bands and then the overall panning mix and filtering. The rest is kind of pretty good sounding right out of the box. Unless there's something specific that I wanted to do. If I wanted to, for example, add an octave above. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. And you can blend that in. The gain knob is almost like a mix knob as well. It's just how loud you want that to be in there. But yeah, that is the, the more advanced parameter for this particular vocoder. There are some really cool things. We've got vowel sounds we can play around with. We can add those oscillators in again. We've got oscillators, panning filters same thing again and then polyvox we just have a filter and a pan knob now that we know what all of this is doing let's make something fun i want you and only you i got nothing left to lose i want you and only you i got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you.
I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want. I want you and only. I want you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. I want, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want. Then left to lose. Oh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Okay, so that's sounding pretty nice to me in terms of the intention of, of how I wanted this to sound. I wanted something really lush, really smooth and wide, really enveloping the lead vocal. And I've just done a little bit of EQ, compression and a touch of reverb just to help it sit a little nicer in the context of the vocal. Wanted to get rid of some of that mid range and low mids just to let the vocal breathe and a touch of harshness around 8K. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. Even bring that up a touch. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. 
Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. So now that we have the kind of sound we want, let's go one step further and start automating parameters. So I want to play around a little bit with the formant shifting. I'm going to click touch, and then I'm just going to start playing around with a few parameters. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Okay, so we've got some formant shifting happening there, and that's panned left. So let's find CompuVox pan right. Let's play around with a little bit of bats. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. Very subtle, but we're just creating some movement. Now let's play a little with this form and shifting. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. I want, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Okay, so what I really liked here was the low end was being accentuated a little bit more. Let me play around with that a little bit more. I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Let's have a listen to how that sounds. I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Okay. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Okay, so I am making a decision now that I want to add more low end to this. I want to really add some weight to it. So I'm just going to duplicate it, bring those bass notes down an octave, and play around with this. Let me delete automation I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose oh so I'll keep waiting for waiting for you it's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure oh I need you closer I want you and only you I want you and only you so this is an example of how far you can go with really fleshing stuff out. You don't need to limit yourself to just one vocoder. In a lot of instances, you could copy the vocoder three, four times in mono, and you could voice it almost like an orchestra where each part is only playing one thing. And then all together, you could pan those out and flesh it out where you're creating some really complex arrangements harmonically. I want you and only you. I want you and only you.
I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you I want you and only you Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you So we really miss that weight when we don't have that I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you And with the base layer added in I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you That is how to use vocal synth. This is a way of approaching vocoders. Let me show you briefly how to use Logic Pro's stock vocoder. It's a little less intuitive right off the bat compared to something like vocal synth, but you can create very similar results with a little finessing. So first off, what we're going to do here is copy over our acapella, and then we're just going to mute it. Then we're going to pull up Evoc Vocoder Synth. Now, this looks a little confusing. There's quite a lot of parameters here, but really what we want to do here is focus on a few things. So we've brought in the MIDI of our bass line, Let's play it. Doesn't sound anything like a vocoder yet, it just sounds like a synth. First of all, we need to change the signal to vocoder and then pick audio, which is gonna be our muted audio. And then let's have a listen to how that sounds. Closer. So we've got our attack and our release. That's how quickly we want those notes to come in and let go. We've got these filters here so we can tell the vocoder which bands we want to be prominent and which we want to cut out. We've got formant stretch and formant shifting, very similar to vocal synth. That sounds a little airier and breathier. Resonance. Got pitch LFOs here. These are things that I don't normally mess around with too much, especially when trying to create that vocoder sound. We've got ensemble here. So we're adding some dimension and width. That's with it off. That's one. So it sounds a little wider. And then we've got stereo width. So that's in mono. So there you have it. We've got our bass note. And then we could also go ahead and do the same again and copy our chords to it. We could voice it slightly differently. We could have a ton of these and then just have each line being occupied by each vocoder and then you could play around with panning and that kind of thing. But the principles are the same. First of all, we just need to tell the vocoder what signal we want to be encoded. And just remember with the Evoc Polysynth, 
We just need to tell it to vocode the sound and then you can play around with these parameters to taste. Modulation. Modulation effects are a treasure trove in the world of audio manipulation, offering a spectrum of expressive possibilities for vocal textures. So let's dive into the types of modulation effects. First up, the flanger. This effect, achieved by combining two identical signals with a slight delay, imparts a sweeping, jet-like sound. It's perfect for creating dynamic, otherworldly textures. A flanger effect creates a distinctive swooshing jet plane sound by mixing the original audio signal with a slightly delayed copy of itself. This creates peaks and troughs in the frequency spectrum, resulting in a dynamic and moving sound. So the parameters that we have are the rate, the rate parameter controls the speed at which the delayed signal is modulated. It determines how fast the peaks and troughs move up and down in frequency. Higher rate means faster movement, while lower rate means slower movement. On some flangers, you have depth. Depth adjusts the intensity or prominence of the modulation effect. It determines how pronounced the peaks and troughs in the frequency spectrum are. Increasing depth makes the effect more noticeable, while decreasing it makes it subtler. Then you have feedback. Feedback controls how much of the process signal is fed back into the effect. Increasing feedback can enhance resonance and emphasize certain frequencies in the effect, while reducing it makes the effect cleaner and less resonant. Some flangers have delay, and delay sets the amount of time by which the delayed signal is offset from the original signal. It determines the width and depth of the flanging effect. Longer delays create a more pronounced flanging effect, while shorter delays make it less noticeable. And finally, we have the mix. So the mix parameter balances the volume of the processed flange sound with the original dry sound. Adjusting the mix allows you to control how much of the flanger effect you hear compared to the original sound. So let's dive into a flanger and how it can affect the way a vocal sounds. So what a flanger is essentially doing is taking a copy of your vocal and it's slightly delaying it. And what that creates is comb filtering and you're getting frequencies that are dipping and peaking and moving and it creates this kind of swirling effect. So let's show this in action. So I'm gonna use my favorite flanger and this is Meta Flanger by Waves, and we've got our mix, so how much we want that flanged signal to be mixed in, the delay, how far we want that delay to be, the copy. We can play around with the waveform, triangle and sine, and you have a visual representation of the modulation happening. You can sync it to the beat, the rate of modulation, and then the depth is how prominent we want the modulation to be. So let's have a play around with these parameters. I'm gonna put it 100% wet so that we can really hear this effect. Burning, and we are better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a dirge and no one can hear our cries. Let it burn. So we can hear how that delay is affecting the comb filtering and these slight pitch variations. Burning. And we are better off for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. Let it burn. So if you want to sound like a droid from Star Wars, this is the effect. If you want to sound like one of the modern stormtroopers or death troopers, you can play around with a flanger and create a similar kind of vocal transformation. And if we just put it on full reset as it stands with the classic identifiable flanger sound and then dial in the mix, let's have a listen to how that sounds. 
And we all better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries So it's a lot more subtle even with the mix 100% so if we play around with the delay higher a higher feedback we can change the waveform to a triangle which is going to be more pronounced let's have a listen to how that sounds Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the thought of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries So it's really creating that swirling effect that we associate with a flanger Now let's have a look at the stock logic flanger We've got our rate And we can sync that to our project or not Intensity feedback and mix so this is a lot more streamlined so let's play around with each of these parameters Burning. and we all better run for we can't get out getting trapped in the third of a desperate search and no one can hear our cries hey, So the quicker the rate, the more you're hearing that really quick pitch modulation. And we almost lose that whole signal completely. It's being completely transformed. Watch your ears there. Trapped in the third of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries Let it burn, burn. So our rate, our intensity, our feedback and our mix. That's all we need to focus on here. And what I want to encourage as well is as much as we want to understand the ins and outs of how this actual tool works, the most important thing here is being able to identify when I play around with these parameters, what is the associated sound? So if I want the kind of droid sound, I know exactly how to do that. I want to pull the rate back. I want the intensity to be around here. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. So immediately if you're in a session or you can hear, I want to sound kind of robotic or like a droid or something otherworldly, something metallic, you can turn that on, adjust the parameters. Burning. And you instantly have that sound. So by really getting to grips with playing around with these tools and also being very aggressive. I really encourage you to be aggressive. Put the mix to 100%. Do what we were doing just now where, you know, some of it's a little unpleasant to listen to, but you're really starting to dig into what all of these parameters equate to in terms of the sound. It's all well and good understanding the technicalities of why and how this works, but if it doesn't equate in your head to the associated sound, you might as well not have the tool because you're just going to be looking at something and going, oh, this does that, this does that. But how does this equate to the emotional tone that I can create or the feeling that I can create with these tools? So, you know, let's say we wanted to have something a lot more aggressive with a big pitch warble and then blend that into taste. Burning. And we all better run for 
fall, we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search, and no one can hear our cries. So it sounds strange, eerie, and that's something we could deploy if we wanted to create that kind of emotion to unsettle the listener. So that is the flanger. Next on the modulation journey, the phaser. By splitting the audio signal and altering the phase of one part, phasers produce a swirling, spacey effect. When applied to vocals, it adds a sense of movement and intrigue. Here's a simple breakdown of how a phaser works. Splitting the signal is the first stage, so the incoming audio signal is divided into two or more parts. Then phase shifting is the next step, so each part of the signal is sent through a series of filters called all-pass filters. These filters change the phase of certain frequencies within the signal. Mixing, the original signal and the phase shifted signals are mixed back together. This process creates peaks and troughs in the frequency spectrum, which move up and down in frequency. These peaks and troughs give the characteristic of sweeping or swirling sound associated with a phaser. So let's talk about the parameters you can adjust on a phaser. So you've got the rate, this controls the speed at which the peaks and troughs move up and down in the frequency. A higher rate means faster movement, while a lower rate means slower movement. Then we have feedback. This parameter determines how much of the process signal is fed back into the input of the effect. Increasing feedback can create more resonance and emphasize certain frequencies in the effect. And stages, some phaser units allow you to adjust the number of stages, which determines the complexity of the phase shifting process. More stages typically result in a more pronounced and intricate phasing effect. And finally, we have the mix. So we want to determine how much of that phased effect we want to blend in with the original signal. So let's have a listen to how a phaser sounds on vocals. We've got our same lead vocal. Now that we've discussed what these parameters do, let's just play around with them. So stages. Burning. And we are better on for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. Let it burn. London's For we can't get out Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries Let it burn, burn, burn. burn. And we all better run For we can't get out Getting trapped in the dirt of a so to my ears, right off the bat, it sounds a little less metallic. It's a lot warmer and it feels a little dreamier. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search and no one can hear our cries. Let it burn. So there's those really warbly parts that come in and create a lot of swirling and movement. So it has a very similar characteristic to the flanger, but it just feels a lot warmer, a lot less metallic, a lot less robot-like. And we all better run for we can't get out 
Getting trapped in the throat of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries Let it burn So if you wanted something a little dreamier This could be something that you would play around with if you so wished And adding some spatial effects in tandem with that could create a really interesting swirling movement now let's explore the chorus effect. Mimicking the sound of multiple voices, chorus introduces a rich, lush quality to vocals. It's like creating a vocal ensemble, making the voice sound larger than life. So let's talk about a chorus plugin. This is a popular audio effect that makes sounds thicker, richer, more spacious, and adds width and depth to a sound. It works by duplicating the original audio signal and then slightly delaying each duplicate and then modulating the pitch of the duplicates very slightly. So the simple breakdown of how the plugin works is signal duplication, the incoming audio signal is duplicated into multiple copies, delay, each duplicate signal is delayed by a small amount of time, typically ranging from a few milliseconds to tens of milliseconds. Then there's pitch modulation, so the pitch of each delayed signal is modulated slightly up and down at a controlled rate and depth. This creates a swirling or shimmering effect. The original signal and modulated duplicates are then mixed together with the original signal. The slight variations in pitch and timing between the signals produce the characteristic of the chorus sound. So you can have a few parameters and there is the rate. So this controls the speed at which the pitch modulation occurs. Higher rates create faster movement, lower rates result in slower movement, much like the phaser. There's the depth, similar to the depth control in other modulation effects, this adjusts the intensity or prominence of the pitch modulation. Increasing the depth makes the effect more pronounced, while decreasing it makes it more subtle. Then there's the delay time. This parameter allows you to adjust the amount of delay applied to the duplicated signals. Longer delay times can create a more spacious and immersive effect. And then we have feedback. Some chorus plugins feature a feedback control, which determines how much of the process signal is fed back into the input. Increasing feedback can enhance the richness and resonance of the effect. And then we've got the mix. So this parameter controls the balance between the processed, chorused signal and the original dry signal. Adjusting the mix allows you to blend the effect seamlessly with the original sound. So you can either make it more subtle or more prominent. And by tweaking these parameters, you can customize the chorus effect to add depth, movement and texture to your audio tracks. All right, let's have a listen to a chorus plugin with our lead vocal. So I'm gonna drive the mix up, let's play around with the rate and intensity. That's all we have here for the stock version of chorus in Logic. I'm also gonna show you another chorus that I like using as well. Burning, and we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search and no one can Burning, and we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. So it's adding to my ears a little shimmer. We talk about that shimmer a lot when we were kind of explaining the parameters of this. But there's also the width and thickness that it adds. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. It can kind of make it sound a little smeared as well. So we blend that more into everything as opposed to it being spikier and more pronounced and more forward. So this is a great tool for helping things to sit within rather than on top. So let me show you another plugin that I like. Now this is a modulation plugin. 
and we have our mix knob, our focus in terms of the frequency spectrum from 20 hertz to 10 kilohertz. And then we have the styles. So this is an analog emulated plugin. So we've got three different styles of modulation. We have detune, which is how much it's gonna be detuned. It's gonna be more subtle, it's gonna be more pronounced. And then we've got the delay, which is tight or loose. So let's have a play around with this. Put the mix to 100%. And we all better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search And no one can hear our cries Let it burn 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 So it's a lot more subtle. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. Let it burn. 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 So we create that sense of width. It sounds a little shimmery, a little creamier, and also adds a flavor of that dreaminess. Burning, burning. It sounds like there are backing vocals almost, there are doubles that are thickening the sound. And here we've got a preset that is actually a double. And let's listen to that with and without. And it emulates what we've done in the recording phase of doubles. So you could use this as a creative effect. You could use this perhaps if you haven't had the opportunity to be able to record doubles. And after the fact, you decide you want to do that. You have effects like this at your disposal to kind of emulate that. So let's listen to it before and after. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Get burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. And we can cheat here. And without recording any doubles, we can choose how tight or loose we want them to feel. Burning. And we all better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the third of a desperate search. And no one can hear our cries. And instantly it feels a lot thicker, a lot wider, and it still sounds tight. And you can really mess around with the mix and the tight and loose and the style to create something that sounds exactly like you have multiple voices. And that's partly why it's called a chorus plugin because it, it sounds like a choir, like there is a chorus of people singing together. So that is a great tool for creative effects. And also in post-production, like I said, if, if you decide that maybe you needed dubs and you're not able to record them, you can use something like this. Modulation effects are crucial because they introduce motion, depth, and character to vocal performances. Each type evokes a distinct emotion. Flanges create a sense of movement, phasers add an ethereal quality, and choruses bring warmth and dimension. They're the secret source for turning a vocal line into a captivating sonic experience. Understanding the why behind modulation lies in its ability to elevate vocals beyond the ordinary, fostering a connection between the artist and the audience through nuanced sonic expression. Now let's talk about incorporating modulation effects into vocal production. It begins by choosing the right effect for the desired emotional impact. Experiment with the depth, rate, and feedback controls to tailor the effect to fit the mood of the song. 
Consider automating modulation parameters over time to create evolving textures. This can add a shifting, swirling, and changing quality to the vocals, drawing the listener deeper into the sonic narrative. Each modulation effect carries its own emotional signature. A flanger might evoke a sense of anticipation or excitement. A phaser can create a dreamy and surreal atmosphere, and a chorus introduces warmth and comfort. Understanding these emotional nuances allows producers to paint the sound, eliciting specific feelings in the listener. In conclusion, modulation effects are the artisans of vocal production, shaping sound in ways that evoke emotion and elevate our ordinary perception of the human voice. Whether you're riding the waves of a flanger, drifting through a phaser's cosmos, or embracing the warmth of a chorus, Modulation is the key to unlocking more expressive vocal textures. These tools are so important in creating variation within the stereo spectrum, creating a sense of depth and width, and in other cases, creating a shifting and ever-changing listening experience. Stuttering. Stuttering techniques in vocal production offer a gateway to rhythmic innovation and glitchy textures. Today we'll unravel the intricacies of stuttering, exploring what makes it a captivating tool. Let's delve into the how by first understanding different types of stuttering effects. First up, the classic stutter edit. This effect involves chopping and rearranging vocal snippets in a rhythmic manner, creating a dynamic and glitchy cadence. All right, let's talk about stuttering. This is a really fun effect and opens up a whole world of creative possibilities. So we know what stuttering is. Let me show you a couple of different ways that you can stutter things. So first off, there is the good old fashioned way, which is chopping things up by hand and stuttering them. Let's go to a 30 second note subdivision. Better run for we can't Better run for we can't get out Better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the Better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the dirt of a desk So you can just go around and chop things You can cut things out and kind of create glitching effects but the stutter is essentially this Better run for we can't get out Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search and and they don't necessarily need to all be very fast. You could stutter things slowly. Search and no one can hear. And hear our... So something like this is very simple. It's very basic. Better run for we can't get out. Getting trapped in the dirt of a desperate search. And no one can hear us. And then we can search and no can hear us. So, you know, that sounds trash, but it's a great example of, you know, what we can do. I personally prefer to play around with some plugins that specialize in this. One stock plugin that comes with Logic is Beatbreaker. So we can play around with the mix of it. We can de-click, which I love and play around with the algorithm, gate and repeat. And then we can play around with this too. And I either put it on repeat or volume. So let's have a listen to this. And then we can play around with the length. Can 
So that's creating some pitch variations as well. So you can instantly put in even just a phrase and create some form of a drop where you could use the vocal as kind of a lead or an identifiable effect that is the main part of this section of a song. And then you could bounce this. Put chorus on there. You could play around with pitch shifting and you've instantly transformed a part. So that is some really fun applications where you can take a part from a song that you've produced already and then make a new song out of it. This could be something that we bounce, we use as some Atmos or as, as a lead in a drop in a completely different song. And that all originates from something you've already created. So that's where stuttering can be really fun. And it's the combination of other effects that also makes stuttering really interesting. So that's one form of stuttering. We can do it manually. The second form is by using a plugin like Beat Breaker. We can also use Shaper Box, which is a slightly more comprehensive version of that, that also has other modulation and effects that you can add to it. So if we do trim hit, which is the volume stuttering I want to create. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we can play around with the mix. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. So it's got a kind of slinky vibe, what I imagine it would sound like as it slunk down all the stairs really quickly. And stuttering, of course, isn't just used on vocals, but it can create a really, really cool effect. So we can play around with something like this. You can also, you could also draw in the stuttering if you wanted to. And you could play around with that kind of thing. And we are better run for we can't get out. And we are better run for we can't get out. And create that really strange stuttery glitchy vibe and finally i just wanted to show you another way of creating this kind of effect this is tremolo now tremolo is a combination of modulation and kind of volume shaping and this sits within modulation and stuttering so what this does is the depth is how aggressive you want that kind of stuttering to be. The smoothing is also the shape that you want it to be. And then the rate is how fast you want it to be. And then we have symmetry. And 
if we make it mono to stereo, we then have phase. So that will create the panning effect. And we are better off for we can't get out. So you can do that, or if you just want it to be strictly stuttering and you want it in mono, you can bring the phase to zero. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in, and we are better. And here we can create the bad guy effect. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in. So by modulating the depth and the rate, you create that effect. And if you wanted it to be very stuttery, you could do something like this. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in. And we are better off for we can't get out. And we can also play around with it panning, which creates another element because it's moving around in the stereo field. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in. And we are better off for we can't get out. Get in. And we are better off for we can't get out. It can be very disjointing. It can make you a little seasick with the depth and smoothing up 100%. But hey, if that's something you're going for and you want to make the listener feel like that, go ahead. There's no right and wrong here. Just experiment and have fun with it. So those are a few techniques on how you can stutter vocals. And we've got tremolo, which kind of sits within the in-between of modulation and stuttering. Next, the gating technique. By utilizing a gate with precise settings, you can achieve rhythmic staccato-like vocal bursts. This technique is often employed to add a sense of urgency or excitement to a vocal performance. So I wanted to show you another form of what is quote-unquote stuttering, but this is vocal gating. So for this example, I'm going to use a specific plugin that I use called Transgate. This is by Kilo Hearts. If you have the Slate digital pack, this comes with it. Now, gating sounds like this. Can we just take it slow, now controlled, and show me how? We've got how quickly we want these stutters to be and how many of them we want them to have. So let's do 30 second note. We've got the attack, decay, sustain, release. So we can play around with the shape of how this works. And then the mix. Can we just take it slow, now controlled, and show me how we can be anybody you told me and I believed. Let's get out of here. Make a move. And these are some different patterns. Can we just take it slow, now controlled, and show me how. And you can play around with automating the mix. Can we just take it slow, now controlled, and show me how we can be anybody you told me and I believe. So that's a very quick and dirty way of creating an effect like that. You can also play around with a plugin like Kickstart. This gives you a limited speed. It only goes up to one eighth note but you can play around with these patterns and the mixes, how aggressive you want that duck in volume to be. Can we just take it slow, now control and show me how we can be anybody you told me and I believe. Let's get out of here, make a move and disappear. We'll be free, feel the breeze. Oh. Can we just take it slow, now controlled, and show me how we can be anybody you told me and I believed. So these are just different envelope shapes and that affects how it sounds and you can play around with the subdivisions as well. So that's another plugin that you can use to create a similar effect. You can also chop things up using the marquee tool and create those gates like that, which is essentially what it is. It's just silence coming in, gating these parts. Or you can just use volume automation to create a similar effect. So play around with all of these techniques. They create a similar result depending on your budget, whether you're able to play around with plugins like this, or you just want to do things manually. 
either way is totally fine and there is no right and wrong it's just whatever the goal is that you have and how quickly you want to achieve it having something like trance gate can be really helpful if you want to get a, a stuttering effect pretty quickly or even just kind of hear what it sounds like and see if that's what you're going for you can use kickstart you can also use volume shaper with shaper box and we've discussed a little bit of how to do that in the previous video stuttering techniques inject a sense of unpredictability and excitement into vocals they break away from traditional vocal delivery creating a rhythmic glitchy canvas that captures attention in the last few years, artists have embraced stuttering to push boundaries and infuse modern productions with innovative vocal expressions. Understanding the why behind stuttering lies in its ability to transform vocals into rhythmic instruments, allowing artists to weave glitchy patterns that resonate with contemporary audiences. Now let's talk about incorporating stuttering techniques into vocal production. It involves precise editing and automation. Experiment with the timing, duration, and intensity of stuttering effects to synchronize them with the song's rhythm and enhance its overall dynamics. Consider using stuttering selectively for emphasis on specific words or phrases. This not only adds a rhythmic flair, but also directs the listener's attention to key moments in the lyrics. Let's explore how stuttering techniques have been employed by artists in recent years. In Billie Eilish's Bad Guy, subtle vocal stutters enhance the quirky and unpredictable nature of the song and her own musical style. Additionally, in Ariana Grande's No Tears Left to Cry, rhythmic vocal stutters contribute to the dynamic energy of the chorus. In conclusion, stuttering techniques are the rhythmic architects of vocal production introducing glitchy elements that redefine vocal expression. Whether it's through stutter edits or precise gating, stuttering adds an element of surprise and rhythm to vocals, making them a more dynamic force in the modern music production landscape. Creating vocal chops. Vocal chops, a versatile and expressive element in modern music, involve taking snippets of vocals and arranging them in unique patterns. Let's start with the how by understanding the process of creating vocal chops. Begin by selecting a vocal recording or a cappella that complements your track. Identify compelling phrases, notes, or even individual syllables that resonate with the mood of the song. Cut and isolate these segments. Experiment with different chops, adjusting the length and arrangement to create a dynamic and engaging vocal pattern. Once you have your vocal chops, arranging them effectively is key. Consider the rhythm and flow of your track. Play with the placement of vocal chops to create interesting patterns, syncopations, or even melodies. This allows you to turn vocal snippets into a captivating instrument within your composition. Vocal chops add a human and emotive touch to electronic and pop music. They act as both melodic and rhythmic elements allowing producers to transform vocals into versatile instruments. In recent years, artists across genres have embraced vocal chops for their ability to add creativity, depth, and catchiness to a track. Understanding the why behind vocal chops lies in their capacity to elevate a track by infusing it with unique textures, creating memorable hooks, and adding an extra layer of sophistication. Now let's explore some tips for arranging vocal chops effectively. Experiment with pitch modulation to create variation and interest. Use effects like reverb and delay to add space and atmosphere. Additionally, consider chopping vocals in a way that complements the rhythm and groove of your track. In conclusion, creating and arranging vocal chops is a skill that transforms vocals into a dynamic instrument within your music. Whether you're crafting catchy hooks or adding emotive textures, vocal chops offer endless creative possibilities. All right, so let me show you a vocal chop in the context of it creating a lead melody. And this was really popular from sort of 2015 onwards. It's something that is still used a lot in a lot of 
electronic dance music genres, but there are a lot more interesting ways that you can bring this into different genres as well. There's no limit really here to what you can do with vocal chops. It just depends on where you want it to be placed in the context of the music. So for instance, in this example, this is a lead element. You can also create something more atmospheric and tuck that into the background. You could create ear candy with it. But let's have a listen to this vocal chop. So let me take the processing off and let's just listen to the vocal chop. So let's listen to the original source material. There are two vocal samples here, both are from Splice. We've got this one shot. Hi. And then we've got this a cappella. I'll be here with you all night. And what I've done is I've simply just chopped up different parts of the a cappella and the one shot. So this is the one shot. Hi. That's the one shot. And then the rest, I've chopped up little parts of each. And then I've placed them around to create this new vocal melody. And then I've arranged the melody. So we've got. So we've got an A, B, A, C melody. So it's the same here, it changes here with this note. It goes back to the same first melody line, it goes back to the same first melody line, and then we change it on the last part to create some variation. Very, very common in melody writing. And then we've got some transposition happening in certain parts. You can see that's been transposed just to create the melody that I'm hearing in my head. Now the magic really happens with the vocal processing. So we've added some tuning just to tighten that up a touch. Notice there's quite a fast retune speed, no human eyes. I want this to sound a little less human, but a little bit of EQ. And then we're doing some pitch shifting and formant shifting and a little bit of drive as well. So let's have a listen to how that sounds. So it now sounds like a completely different thing. It's completely been transformed and you would never assume that it came from this vocal pack. We've just got a little bit of soothe just to tame some of this mid range, a touch of reverb, and then we're doing some creative processing here and we're side chaining the vocal chop to the kick so it ducks every time the kick hits. So let's have a listen to that all together. Okay, a little bit of build up there on that E, potentially tame that with multiband. Anyway, we're just moving into a little bit of mixing there after listening to this on fresh ears. So there you have it. That is one way to create a vocal chop. You just manually go in, make sure to fade and crossfade certain sections to mitigate pops and clicks. But that just goes to show you how you could take something pretty basic and create something totally new with it. 
All right, so I wanted to show you how to create atmospheric vocal chops. And this is a slightly different way of creating them. And in this instance, what we're actually doing is recording in the vocal chop as we hear it in our head. So what I'm doing here is just singing very poorly into this microphone. Na 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 so you could create a vocal chop from scratch by actually just singing in a kind of choppy manner. So let me walk you through how I've transformed this very uninspiring vocal recording into something that sounds like a vocal chop. So first off, we've got auto-tune on here and we've got really fast retune speed. Humanize is on and we're playing around with the formant. So the throat length is almost down all the way. And then we've transposed it up an octave. So let's listen to that. Instantly, it sounds completely different to this. And then we've got doubler to add some modulation and width, decapitator to add a ton of grit to it, repeater to add some delay, chroma verb with some reverb, then some EQ to attenuate some build up, roll off the highs and lows. And then we're just side chaining the vocal to the kick so it ducks every time the kick hits. So let's have a listen to that all together and then in the context of the drums and bass. And then let's hear that with the drums and bass. So we know that we've got vocals here. So we've got this kind of drop section, we've got the lead vocal, and then we've got these octaves that are really filling that out. And they're quite distorted as well. So we've got Decapitator on here, ton of drive, sound like this. Windows down. Windows down. Windows, windows down. So all together we get this. So this is an example of making this more of a background supportive element, something that is more atmospheric. So don't be afraid to play around with vocal chops, create your own vocal chops, sing in your own vocal chops. A good example of this is Lauv in one of his songs. He actually just recorded the vocal chop into his phone, then exported it and put it into Logic and then started manipulating it and making it sound more like he chopped up a vocal, although he'd already recorded in the chop as he kind of intended to do it and it was all of these effects that he added to it some distortion some heavy tuning some spatial processing to really transform it into something that sounds non-human and otherworldly which is really cool so the idea of granulating things is chopping things up into very 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 tiny pieces and then moving through those pieces at a very fast rate if that doesn't make any sense to you right now, don't worry. I will show you a demonstration so that you can 
hear what this sounds like. So let's say we wanted to granulate this vocal here. So my life I've been so my life. So I'm going to use Shaper Box to do this. And if you use the time module and play around with the length. And then you can play around with some different post-processing here. So I can add some pitch shifting here. You could play around with tuning that really heavily. And then you can add spatial effects. And we've already got some panning here, so we can pan things out. You can play around with reversing this, so reversing the signal going into this and seeing what that sounds like. And then add some spatial effects to it. And then there's a lot of breaths and little lesses here. I'd go in and chop these out. So you can create some really cool atmospheric parts in your songs. You could create something interesting in an intro using an effect like this. You can create drones and tuck them into the background. Really the possibilities are endless. And what you can also do, which is slightly out of the realm of vocal production, but something worth mentioning is you can actually use an effect on an entire song and use this kind of granular chopping up to create something really, really interesting. A lot of electronic artists like Flume use effects like this a lot in their own music. So play around with it and you can create some really interesting vocal parts. Okay, so I wanted to show you a slightly more advanced vocal chop and break down the techniques that I'm using here to create something with a little more going on. We have got the original technique that I've shared on how to manually chop up the audio waveform and create something new. So we've chopped this up from our acapella. So we have some transposing going on. We're transposing things up and down to create this new melody. And then putting auto tune on there, playing around with the formant. And what's making this more interesting is originally all of these parts that have been split up were part of this main melody. And what I've done is I've created separate audio tracks and I've processed these slightly differently. So these sound like this. Oh, yes. oh, yes. 
We've got auto tune on there. Little altar boy doing some pitch and formant shifting and then sample delay to create some width. And then we've got these parts that sound like this. And we're doing some transposing in auto tune, bringing the formant down and then delaying that to the left. So we're creating width, but we're making sure that they're all sitting in their own place in the stereo field. And then we've got these parts that have some formant shifting on them and some auto panning. So these sound like this. And then we've got some stuttering here. So altogether, the vocal chop with these extra parts that have been processed separately, we could just do the vocal chop where it's just all this together on one track being processed the same, but we want to create some variation. So it sounds like this. So we have some moments where this is living in the center and then it explodes out to the sides, which is exactly what we were going for. And then finally, I've grouped this all together and then I'm processing it here with some modulation, some distortion, and a little bit of reverb. So all together, it sounds like this with the processing. And we haven't just stopped there. I'm going to show you what the next step looked like. And this is in another session. So we are in another track alternative. This is the same vocal chop that's been printed to audio. And now what we're doing is playing around with some more variation. So we've got this part that we've copied over to a separate track and we're doing some pitch shifting. So we're pitching that down and bringing the formant to match that. And we're using sample delay to push this out to the sides. So this sounds like this. And we've also got some processing that I will talk through in a second that is blending this into the next section that is on the group bus. So I wanted to show you the other way of creating vocal chops, which is by using a sampler. So we have our stock logic sampler and I've dragged in Lucy's a cappella from this song. And then I have chosen parts that I want to play in and then process those. So we wanted to add some more chops in. This was the artist's idea to combine both vocals together as this is a duet. So these little chops sound like this. And then we've done some processing. So we've done some formant and pitch shifting and we've mixed that in. And then we've added a doubler to create some modulation and width and then soothe just to tame some of the harsh resonances. And that with this vocal chop together sounds like this. Uh, 
So what I've done to try and make this as clutterless as possible is to make sure that all these little chops are coming in where there's space. So we're not competing, we're just filling in space with another vocal. And that is one way that I try to keep things as clean as possible in terms of the frequency spectrum and not having too many elements fighting with each other. So let's just quickly talk about the group processing on here. As you remember earlier, there was group processing for this, but we're even processing this differently. So we've got some EQ just to tame some of the low mids. We've got a limiter to catch those peaks. We had a multimeter, which was just for me to make sure that the correlation meter with the phase was all good with all the modulation we'd added and the panning. And then we've got kickstart, which is ducking the kick. And here's where we are having that smear effect. So you can see this automation here. This is Endless Smile, which adds a ton of different spatial effects and filtering under the hood. So delays, reverbs, filtering, and some other goodies under the hood that creates great, easy transitional effects with just one knob. So you just move this knob around and the intensity with which the transitional effect is happening happens and you can automate that. And then you've got some presets here. So it sounds like this. And we're just snapping that here. So it's creating this kind of reverb gating effect. So it's really clean, but it's creating this swelling into the chorus. So you can play around with all these different effects, all these different tools and apply those to these techniques like vocal chops. Delay throws and reverb swells. Delay throws, a dynamic technique in vocal production, involve using delays in a creative and rhythmic manner. Let's understand the process of creating delay throws. Begin by selecting a vocal segment or phrase that you want to emphasize. Apply a delay effect with distinct settings, such as a short delay time, moderate feedback, and possibly some modulation for added character. Both reverb and delay throws can be used in a similar way. The purpose of using these oftentimes are to fill silent sections, to emphasize certain words, and to catch the listener's attention and direct them to a certain part in the song. Delay throws and reverb swirls create a sense of intrigue, of otherworldliness, and offer unique creative possibilities. We've covered delay throws and reverb swells together as the process of creating them is very similar. Let's first start with delay throws. There's now two ways that you can create delay throws and let's outline both. And this will be the same for reverb swells as well. You'll either want to have your effects as a send, so you'll have your reverb 100% wet, and the lead vocal or whichever vocal you're sending it to being sent to it to taste. And then you will go ahead and automate the send. So if you want it to be extremely pronounced, you'll send a huge amount of your vocal to that delay or to that reverb and then bring it back down. While this is a valid way to use this effect, I prefer to do another approach. The second way that you can approach delay throws is by duplicating your audio track, copying the section that you want to be delayed, and then adjusting the parameters to taste and blending in the volume of the delay throw for that section. I prefer this approach as it gives a lot more flexibility and allows for further creative manipulation. We have the same process for reverb swells as well. You can either do it via Ascend, or you can duplicate the track, put reverb on there, and then blend in to taste, only pulling in the sections from the lead vocal or the vocal you wish to have that effect on appropriately. Delay throws and reverb swells really are the mark of more nuanced, sophisticated, and professional vocal producers. They are around all genres and are oftentimes quite subtle, but are sorely missed when they aren't there. Delay throws are like sculpting 
the three-dimensional space around a vocal. They add a sense of depth, excitement, and movement. And artists and producers have embraced delay throws because they can turn a simple vocal line into a dynamic and immersive experience. It's about creating anticipation and capturing the listener's attention. Reverb swells are like painting with sound. They add a sense of grandeur, creating a sonic space that envelops the listener. And in recent years, we've seen a surge in the use of reverb swells across various genres because they provide an immersive and ethereal quality to vocals. It's about crafting a sonic atmosphere that really lingers in the ears. To perfect reverb swells, experiment with different reverb types, from hall to plate reverbs, to find the one that suits your track's vibe. Use automation to control the reverb's intensity and decay time, allowing it to swell gradually and recede seamlessly. This dynamic approach adds an extra layer of sophistication to your vocal production. In conclusion, mastering delay throws and reverb swells opens up a new dimension into vocal production. Whether you're creating rhythmic excitement with delay throws or crafting atmospheric textures with reverb swells, these techniques are about sculpting sound and evoking emotion. Okay, so let's talk through reverb and delay throws. We're revisiting the track with the vocoder. And the reason that I wanted to use this example is that we have a ton of space to fill in between these phrases. So we can get creative as to how we want to do that and add some more sophisticated nuance to this vocal production. So I'm gonna show you two ways to create reverb swells and delay throws. One is using sends and the other is duplicating the track and actually doing the delay throw on a separate track and then blending that into taste. Both are essentially the same. I personally prefer to use the latter, but let's start off with sends. So let's say that I want to add a delay throw just here on the word and on the you. you. What we would do is create our send. I'm gonna pull up my delay. I'm gonna want a slightly longer delay with a longer feedback. We want that to be 100% wet, so it's just a delay signal. And then what we're doing here is just automating the send. So I will automate it in a sec, but let's just do it manually to hear what it sounds like. You and only you. Let's do that again. You and only you. We could do an eighth note. You and only you. You and only you. feedback we can make the feedback longer so that it's longer going into the next phrase so let's automate that you and only you you and let's get rid of that you and only you and then you can play around with the tone of it as well you and only you. So I'm going to get a little more creative with it. I'm going to add a formant shifter to the pre-delayed signal. Add some drive. You and only you. You and only you. Actually, I'm going to do this. You and only you. You and only you. You and only you. And I'm gonna add reverb to it. So you don't just need to think, oh, I just have to, it's a delay throw, so I just have to have delay. You can add so many different creative effects to create something completely unique. Let's put a touch of reverb on there. You and only you. 
You and only you. You and only you. You and only you. You and only you. I don't like that reverb for this context. You and only you. 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 So we have a delay throw there. Have a listen to it. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So let's turn that off. And you could really, really finesse this if you wanted to. To lose. So that's really subtle. We can bring that up, make it even more aggressive and prominent. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for waiting. Oh, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So let's add a reverb swell just on this part using the same principle of ascend. And then I will show you how to do this another way. So let's make sure that our delay is completely off. So same principle. And I'll send. Oh, so. I want quite a long decay here. Oh, so. Play around with a slightly different reverb type. I'm going to go for a plate. Just managing some build up. I'm going to go for Valhalla Vintage Vibe. Just gives me a little more control to decay. Pow. 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 So Pow. Pow. So Pow. Pow. So Pow. So we can do the same thing here. We can just do that manually. Oh, so. Oh, Very subtle. Let's try that again. Oh, so. Oh, so. So that's quite aggressive. Could really finesse that. Let's have a listen. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Let's just finesse this a little bit. So that it doesn't smear too much into this section. Oh, so. Let's bring that decay down. Oh, 
Bring that pre delay. Oh, so I'll keep. And again, the creative possibilities are endless. I'm going to add kickstart to have more of a rhythmic pump to it. Oh, so. Oh, oh, so. Oh, so. Let me add a flanger, see how that sounds. Oh, so. 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 Oh, oh, so. And let's have a listen. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. All right, so we've added some delay throws and reverbs while so using sends. Now, let me show you how to do the same thing with a slightly different technique. So this is personally my favorite technique. I just find it a lot simpler and it visually represents it so I can kind of see exactly where everything is happening. And it's easier for me to print this, send this across to an engineer and have everything as its own separate track. Pause. So let's do a delay throw first. So this is acting as a send. I'm still going to have it 100% wet. And then this is almost the send amount. But rather than having to automate it in like so, I can just have it set where I want it and I can fade in. If I really want that movement, that crescendo, then I can automate the volume as well. So 100% wet. Keep my composure. Keep my composure. Let's add. I want a slightly tighter tuning here, and I also want to play around with the formant and pitch. So this is just another way to keep my composure. Oh, keep keep my composure. Oh, keep, keep my composure. Oh, keep. Yeah, I just prefer the formant down. Keep my composure. Oh, keep my comp. And then we can add a touch of reverb to that as well. So the principles are really the same here. Let me just fill that out. Hmm, what tools do we want to use? Go back to Valhalla Vintage Verb. Do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. What's nice here is you can get really granular as to like which part you want to be in the delay throw. So, you know, you could have the whole word, you could just have this tiny section. Composure. Oh, I need you close. Create these kind of choppy effects. Pause. Oh, I need you. For this instance, I just want that part of the word. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. And then let's create a reverb swell on this part using the same method. Let's copy that over. Maybe tune that, see how that sounds. With a really fast retune speed, 100% wet. So I want you in on you. See how that sounds. Just shape the tone of the top end there. 
Want you and only you. Want you and only you. So I want you and only you. I want to create a little bit of movement. You and only you. You and only you. So that would create a kind of gating effect. You and only you. You and only you. And you and only you. Want you and only you. Just that slight little pumping just creates a little bit of movement. We could also pan this. So the whole reverb signal is being panned. Let's take that off. Oh, I need you closer, I want you in on you. So it's just gently panning from left to right. Oh, I need you closer, I want you in on you. So let's have a listen to what we've done so far. We've got... I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you So we're really accentuating all of those parts It's up to you to decide how much you want to do if you want every single bit to be filled in here i feel it's a little overkill i think it needs something but we could do something slightly different yeah that feels better to me a little less labored so let's have a listen to this part without any of the reverb and delay throws. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. Let's drag that piano over a touch. Okay. Now, let's listen to it with what we've done so far. I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you so we're adding a lot more in terms of intrigue, excitement. It sounds like there's more going on. And all we're doing really is just accentuating the ends of these lines. Now, let me revisit this part. So I also want to show you that sometimes you'll have quite a lot of different throws. You really want to get into the detail here and make sure that things aren't just sounding safe and monotonous let's play around with a slightly different effect here i want you and only you i want you and only you i got nothing left to lose okay. let's make this one a little more subtle i want you and only you I want you and only you. Okay. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. 
No, I really want to create a sense of atmos here. He's talking about I want you and only you, and the emotional tone could be that kind of dreamlike, otherworldly feel of of that longing. And I want to create that using something like that. I want you and only you. Maybe not that. Let's play around with some stuttering. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. That's not it. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. It's not quite what I'm going for, but we're just experimenting here. Let's have a. I want you and only you. I want to. I want you and only you. I want you and only. No, I want to just side chain this reverb slash delay throw to the lead vocal so that it swells up at the end. Even though I'm going to automate it, I also want to retain the forwardness of the lead vocal. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a really fast attack and a slow release so that it hits it straight away and ducks and then as it releases it slowly swells up like so that glitchiness is not quite what i'm going for let's have have a browse through these presets and see Interesting, quite haunting. A build up in um, some of the low end there, low mids. Hmm, let's see if I can. No, I can't get rid of that in that, so we'll have to do that separately. No need you. No need you. No need you. No need you. So let's try that now. I want you and only you. So that's really subtle. I want you and only you. So that swells into it, which I think is really interesting. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. So when I'm thinking about producing these vocals, I would let some moments breathe, especially the parts where you want some weight. Silence can be really, really great. Left to lose. So I would, in fact, make the decision 
to cut everything out on loose to really accentuate that. Now this is slightly outside of the realms of vocal production, but these are decisions that you can make during this process. We're thinking, okay, how do the vocals, the lyrics, the story of the song all tie in to the overall production? I got nothing left to lose. Oh. Okay, we've got a couple of things here. Okay. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So we've got a, a send from earlier that's still bleeding into you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. Okay, so the feedback of that is too long. I could even automate I got this send to turn off so that we don't get that. Nothing left to I got nothing left to lose. Oh, I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so that's still bleeding in a little bit. In that instance, what I would actually do is do it separately, like that, and then let's copy. I want you and only you I want you and only you I want you and only you So let's blend that in a little bit I want you and only you I'm gonna get rid of Fracture, I've decided it's too distracting I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose. And then what I would do is actually bounce that in place. And then I can control how long I want that tail. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. And now we have that silence. So it just gives me a further level of control. I can also add more processing now. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you Okay, so let's have a listen once more to what we've done so far Before and after, so before I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you And now, with everything I want you and only you I got nothing left to lose Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you So there you have it. That is how to create reverb and delay throws with sends and by 
duplicating tracks, cutting things up, adding processing, bouncing, printing everything to audio and also adding further processing if you wish and blending all of that in. These really are the mark of more sophisticated vocal producers. So play around with these. Don't be afraid to do too much. You can always mute things. You can scrap it. You can see whether it's too much and dial it back. But playing around with all of these tools and these techniques can really help to add more dimension to your production. Combining techniques. Combining vocal production techniques is about more than just layering effects. It's the art of crafting a distinct sonic signature by blending delay throws for movement, vocal chops for dynamicism, reverb swells for atmosphere, and modulation for expression. This comprehensive approach transforms vocals into a canvas of sound, inviting the listener into a mesmerizing auditory experience. So let's dive into the how. Begin with a vocal recording or acapella that suits your project. Experiment with creating vocal chops to add rhythmic interest. Introduce delay throws to enhance movement and depth. Apply reverb swells to create an atmospheric backdrop. Finally, embrace modulation to add nuanced expressiveness. It's the interplay of these techniques that yields a truly unique sonic result. Combining techniques is the essence of artistic exploration in vocal production. It's about creating a sonic tapestry that is greater than the sum of its parts. Artists have adopted this approach because it allows them to redefine the boundaries of vocal expression, providing listeners with a rich, immersive auditory experience. Understanding the why behind combining techniques lies in the ability to craft a unique sonic identity, setting your production apart and leaving a lasting impact on the listener. Now it's time for a hands-on exercise. Select a vocal snippet or acapella from a song that you admire or your own recording. Apply vocal chops, experiment with delay throws, weave in reverb swells, and sprinkle in some modulation. Find the balance that resonates with your artistic vision. This exercise is your opportunity to craft your own sonic signature using the combined power of these techniques. So I wanted to tie everything together and show you a couple of examples of what that looks like in terms of vocal production using everything we've spoken about so far. So let's have a listen to this. We've just got a demo and some demo vocals. Reality's choking the vision inside of me. I'm blinded by fake shit, I'm vacant, I can't see. Forever I'm wishing that I could be truly free Free Play now, don't drown Stay in the game for the next round Restart, stay strong Keep it inside or you'll break up Break up Okay, so we've got these demo vocals and we're really starting to produce this out before we actually record the final parts. So there's quite a few little things going on here. We've got our lead vocal. We've got these dub stabs coming in that are panned 50% left, 50% right that are accentuating this one word. Then we've got this low octave that we've done pitch shifting on and some modulation to give it some width. Then we have a single double with some modulation on it in this second part that's being layered with a vocoder. And then we have this word accentuated here with a high octave double. So let's break down how we did all of this. So we've got some delay on the lead vocal in terms of spatial processing, and then everything else is pretty raw. So let's jump to this part where things start to shift. So we've got free on free. We've got this low octave. Free. Little old boy. Pitch and formant matched. The mix is 100% wet. And then we've got doubler on here to create some modulation and width. And then just a touch of EQ just to attenuate those lows. And then we've got these two doubles pan 50% left and 50% right. Free. And let's listen to that with and without. Free. 
And then of course we've got that delay that fills this space here. On the lead vocal, we've got a quarter note delay. I like to add modulation at the end of the chain. The capitator, we've got quite a lot of drive. It's 100% wet. I've got it on the Neve preamp. And then we've got some low and low mid attenuation happening with EQ. And then we've got this cool little vocal here, which is just yeah. me singing yeah. And then we've got decapitator on punish mode. So we're adding a ton of distortion. Yeah. We're band passing it. Yeah. And then we're using shaper box to very quickly pan it from left to right. So in that moment, we feel it swoosh from left to right. And that's almost like a riser. We're using it as a vocal hit and a riser and a moment of surprise for the listener. Okay, so now we're moving into the second part of this verse. We've got this dub and it's the same processing as the lead vocal. And then at the end, we're just adding micro shift. We've got the background vocal thickener preset and let's listen to that with and without that. Play now, don't drown, stay in the game from the next round. Play now, don't drown, stay in the game from the next round. And then let's listen to that with and without in this section. Play now, don't drown, stay in the game for the next round. Play now, don't drown, stay in the game for the next round. So it really thickens it, adds some width. And then we've got this vocoder. And here's what's going on here. We've got some biovox. We've got the smooth vocoder. Talkbox polyvox. A lot of what we spoke about earlier on. We've got the gate. We've got the width. We've got a little bit of chorus on here. That sounds like this. Then we've just got some compression and a little bit of reverb and some EQ just to attenuate those lows. So let's get rid of that dub and that vocoder and then let's listen to how the energy shifts without those. Free. And then let's bring those on. Free. Play now, don't drown, stay in the game for the next round. Restart, stay strong, keep it inside or you'll break up. It just adds another element of energy and it also is lifting the listener into the next part. So it feels like we're progressing rather than moving backwards or just staying static. And then finally, just before the pre, we have everything dropping out and then we're adding a new element here, which is the high octave. We're using a little alter boy, bringing the pitch up an octave and the form went down, minus 12, and a little bit of drive and it's on quantize mode. So that sounds like this. Break up. And then we've got punish mode, a ton of drive, 100% wet, adding a lot of distortion and noise. Soothe just to tame some of the harshness that's been brought in and accentuated by the saturation doubler to create more modulation and thickness. And then a little bit of EQ just to attenuate some build up and cut out those lows that we don't need. Break up. Break up. That sounds like that. And let's listen to it with and without. Keep it inside or you'll break up. Break up. And then let's listen to it. Keep it inside or you'll break up. Break up. So it adds a lot more aggression. It's again an unexpected moment and it's just really supporting that vocal part. So that is one breakdown of kind of how you can build out a verse and start to add energy, add moments of intrigue, add supportive elements. So knowing when to add those to support the lyrics that you want and the emotion that you're going for in that particular section. So we've used a combination of stuff that we've gone through. We've got a vocoder, we've got pitch shifting, we've got some creative auto-tune happening. 
We've got quite a fast retune speed, which is a stylistic thing. And we've actually automated the retune speed here as well. So we start at 20, which sounds like this. Reality's choking the vision inside of me. And then if we listen to the tuning here, it's very, very aggressive. Break up. So we're playing around with things not staying static and moving around during the duration of this section to create a sense of movement. Here is another example of tying everything all together. So I'm gonna talk through some atmospheric vocal production here in the intro, and then I'm gonna walk you through the chorus and verses just to give you some examples of what we've covered so far in terms of the tools. So let's have a quick listen to this intro. So we have these ethereal vocals that come in throughout the duration of the intro. Let's have a listen to them in solo. So we have this. So we've got pitch shifting. We've got some spatial effects. Let's have a listen to that without any processing on it. So we have printed this out with pitch shifting and spatial processing on it. So I can tell you from ear pretty much what I've done here. And that is auto-tune with a fast reaching speed, pitching it up the octave, so 12 semitones, and then bringing the formant down minus 12, then adding a ping pong delay and a touch of reverb. And this is a recording of Lucy's ad lib that we've pulled from later on in the song and manipulated to sound different to create this interesting vocal texture. And then we've just added some EQ, managing some build up, band passing it, replica to add a longer tail to it. And that sounds like this. So we just have that and then we fade it. because there's quite an abrupt chop there with replica on there. It allows that to trail on for a long time and it gives it that ethereal feel. Then we have this. That's also another ad lib that we've pulled from the last chorus. And we've brought the formant down a touch, added reverb and delay and really drenched this. This has also been printed to audio. And then we have this vocal. Same thing. You can see that this was our effects chain. We've got a little older boy, H delay and endless smile. So you can use endless smile, which I demoed earlier on as a transitional tool. You can also use that to create Atmos, a really long tail. It affects the tone. It creates this spaciousness to vocals and any other material really. So let's mute that and then listen to how this intro sounds with and without the extra vocal production here. So we missed a little vocal here. So we also have another vocal here, which is from our other singer. 
and let's just listen to it without processing. Suicidal lovers want nothing but the dark. It's just a simple vocal phrase. We brought the formant down, added some drive, and a lot of shaping of the tone. We're really taking all the high end and low end out of it and letting it live in this low mid range area. Adding endless smile to add some space. Shape a box. We've got time on there and we're just layering that in to add that half time feel. Then we've got a flanger. Kick start to add a gentle sense of movement and pumping. A de to tame some of the sibilance after the fact of the spatial processing which has accentuated that, and then soothe to tame a little bit more of that high end. So let's have a listen to that now. So there's this strange sort of octave that isn't necessarily following it, and that's what is being created by that halftime feel that's been blended in. So that's this. Let's listen to it all the way. Let's hear what that sounds like. So it sounds very strange on its own, but blended in, it creates this slight dissonance and it helps with the emotional tone of what this whole song is about and what the lyrics are that he's singing. Once more, let's listen without and with. So it just sounds like a very simple intro, but we lose so much movement. So let's have a listen to those vocals back in. So we have this whole world that opens up that's reflective and ethereal and dreamlike, which sets the stage for the emotional tone for the rest of the song. So let's have a listen to this whole verse and then break down the vocal production in this section. I could say And then we go into the chorus. So let's break down all of this vocal production goodness. So going into, we've got this turn going into the second verse. And as you can see, we have a turn going on in terms of vocal production. We've got harmonies, we've got reverb swells, we have octaves, we've got ad libs, and we've got vocal hits as well. So let's start off going into this section. We have this. So this is the same vocal that we've used in our intro and we've extended it and then faded it into this section. We have this vocal hit. So this is a vocal hit from Splice or another sample pack. We've got some formant shifting, some EQ replica, which is adding that long tail kickstart to add some pumping and then soothe 
to mitigate any harsh resonances. And then we've got this reverse vocal riser rising into verse two. So to create this, you can see there's a really, really long tail. And all you have to do, you can see here, I've chopped this out. Let's recreate something similar. I've got a crazy long decay, mix 100% wet. So that really long decay here, like that you can see. And then I reversed it and then blended it in to create this swell. That's how I created it. I would have done something similar. And then we've just got this swell and I've faded it in so that it's quite a prominent rising effect that blends into this first line of the verse. I... So let's just listen to this in solo. I could set you free. So let's mute these little vocal production parts. I'm gonna leave this part in as you could consider this part of the overall production process as opposed to vocal production. You know, you can add little vocal hits in beats and instrumentals and that kind of thing. And I exclusively wanna focus on the parts that we've created from our recording session with vocal production in mind. So let's have a listen to it with and without and listen to how it changes our perception of these vocals coming in. I could set you free. Let's mute it with the music and have a listen. I could set you free. And now let's listen to it with that vocal production. It builds so much more tension going into this section, which lifts the listener into it and signals to them that there's a new part coming. So we really miss that when it's not there. Okay, so let's talk about the other parts within this verse. We've got these swells here. I could set you free, give you the light, the universe in dynamite, spark the soul in space and time, but I can't find the fight. Gra so we have these swells that come in and we've got some form and shifting happening. H to ping pong quarter note, and that's 100% wet some high pass and low pass to shape the tone. We've got it on lo-fi. And then endless smile to create that swelling effect, that really long tail. I could set you free, give you the light. The universe in dynamite, spark the soul in space and time, but I... So we already have a lot of spatial effects coming in this section. We've got a ping pong delay, we've got reverb. These are quite spacey, wet vocals. But let's just listen to how this subtly lifts the ends of these phrases and adds a little bit of space within there. I could set you free, give you the light. The universe in dynamite, spark the soul in space and time, but I... Can't find the fight. So it really lifts the end of those sections and the different subdivision that's being accentuated here really fills these little gaps. So we've got our reverse vocal, we've got our swells, we've got our low octave here. Gravity is dragging me, drowning all my hopes and dreams cause
We've got a formant shifted vocal here. So I've got it low octave, I should call that low formant. And we've got it on quantize. We've put the drive up and we've put the formant down minus four. And then we've added sample delay to make it a little wider and make it sound like it's enveloping the lead vocal, which is in the center. Let's listen to that on its own. Drowning all my hopes and dreams. So just hopes and dreams. And let's listen to it without it. Drowning all my hopes and dreams cause Dragging me, drowning all my hopes and dreams cause so in this part, I really wanted to emphasize drowning all my hopes and dreams and also create something sonically that mimics what I think drowning all your hopes and dreams sounds like. So to me, it sounds somber. It sounds like despair. It's dark. It feels like it's dragging you down. And she's talking about drowning. So when I think of drowning, I think of something dark, muted, being pulled back and wanted to create something that sounded similar that could accentuate the emotions that are being spoken about lyrically. All right, let's talk about these ad-libs. Let's solo them. So it's just Lucy literally making it up as she goes along, just ad-libbing, feeling the song after recording this section and adding some R's and O's. And this has also been printed to audio, but I can walk through what the processing would have been. There's some heavy tuning going on. There's some formant shifting. There's a band pass filter. So we're losing a lot of the highs and low mids and we've got a ton of spatial effects. So we've got some delay, some reverb, and that's creating this really spacious sounding ad lib that almost sounds like a drone, like it could be an instrument, a synth, or some other droning instrument. Okay, so in this section, we also have this little reverb swell. And that's just filling some space here. Can't find the fire. Gravity is driving me. Drowning all. So that acts as a tonal impact for this section here, going into this weighty part of her saying that her dreams are being drowned and that she's being stuck in this sort of paralysis. So let's move on to the harmonies. So we've got these very simple harmonies here. We've got a low harmony, pan left and right. And then we have a high harmony. Get rid of those S's, so we don't need them. So this is an example of being pretty aggressive with how we have edited these. You can see I've chopped them up. I've gotten rid of the S's, breaths, ends, and we just want this very tight vowel harmonies, as I like to call them, that are just filling in this section. All in space and time, but I. All in space and time, but I. So we add some more harmonic content there and then have our low formant. Drowning all my so let's move on to the final part of this section. We've got our lead vocal, we've got our ad libs that we spoke about, the spacious ones, the atmospheric drones. And then we have this high octave that comes in on this final part to accentuate this phrase. So 
So we have this high octave, we've got our pitch, 12 semitones, our formant minus five. We've got quite a lot of drive, we've got it on quantize. So it sounds pretty robotic and that the pitch is quantized. Managing some build up with EQ, just shaping the tone slightly. Adding Valhalla Vintage Verb, 100% wet. So this is really, really wet. And then we've got Track Spacer, which is spacing this against the lead vocal. Track Spacer is a mixing tool. It allows you to sidechain the signal that you want this to duck. And what's really interesting about it is rather than it just ducking in volume, it's actually just ducking the frequencies that conflict with this. And so I have got it in mid side mode and panned it. So this is middle, this is side. So I want it to duck the middle frequencies where the lead vocal is so that it feels like it's around the lead vocal and it's not cluttering the lead vocal. And then I've just got some sample delay at the end just to push it out a little further to the sides. So let's have a listen to that. And then I've just faded that out so that it's nice and tight with this section coming in. We don't want it to be too messy and smeary and horrible. So let's have a listen to this section without all of these extra parts. Let's just say, okay, we've got our lead vocal. Let's just leave it at that. I could set you free, give you the light. The universe in dynamite Spark the soul in space and time But I can't find the fight Gravity is dragging me Drowning all my hopes and dreams Cause all my life I've been waiting for the time Eclectic anniversary secrets in the stars Give me the key to freedom I'll bury you alive Crawling through our sins There's nowhere left to hide and now let's bring all of these decisions back into the production. I could set you free, give you the light. The universe in dynamite, spark the soul in space and time, but I can't find the fight. Gravity is dragging me, drowning all my hopes and dreams Cause all my life I've been waiting for the time Eclectic anniversary secrets in the stars Give me the key to freedom, I'll bury you alive Crawling through our sins, there's nowhere left to hide So even just listening to the vocals a cappella, it sounds like we have a whole production just going on with the vocals. And that is the case, especially in this particular song. Of course, not every song is going to call for this much vocal production. It's also a matter of taste. I personally love to add these little moments in. I feel like it brings in a little bit of my own flavor as a producer, as a vocal producer. It also aids the emotional tone. I wouldn't have added any of this stuff if I thought it was redundant and didn't align with kind of what we're going for in terms of the production and what we want to ignite emotionally in the listener. So this is just an example of us tying everything together, showing you how much detail can go into the process and how fun it can be to start playing around with all of these tools to create a whole vocal atmosphere for the listener to enjoy. In conclusion, the art of combining vocal production techniques is about unleashing your creativity and forging a sonic path uniquely yours. As you embark on this journey, remember that the synergy of delay throws, vocal chops, reverb swells, and modulation holds the power to reshape the landscape of your music. Have fun with it 
and enjoy the process of discovery. Now in this point in your vocal production journey, I want to take some time to talk through some recording workflows. We have the concepts of recording and getting clean, tight takes from the get go down. We understand how to arrange vocals in a more sophisticated and professional way. We understand all the different tools and techniques that we can use for more advanced vocal production. So let's talk a little bit about some different workflows that you can experiment with. Like we have been saying from the get go, there is no right and wrong here. It's just an offering of understanding different ways that you can approach recording and arranging your vocals as you're doing it in real time and then deciding what works for your own particular case, the style that you're working in, and the demands of what you're doing. So first off, let's talk about recording all the way through. This is one of the most common and what most people assume recording looks like 90% of the time, which is just to record from the beginning to the end of the song with a focus on performing. And this is mimicking doing the live performance itself of the song. This can be great as a warm up. This can be great if you really want to get into the journey of the song and see where the peaks and valleys are. While it can also be quite challenging. And this brings me on to the next workflow, which is to record section by section. This means recording from the intro to the verse to the chorus all doing multiple takes of each. So for instance, looping the verse around or the first part of the verse or getting four, five, six comps of each version and then moving on and then coming back at the end and then starting to comp. This is a very common approach and one that I tend to use nine times out of 10 as it allows focus and the detail of nuanced performance and the ability to really dial into each phrase and make sure that we're getting the best takes of each as we go along. The third workflow is to record phrase by phrase and this can be done in multiple ways where we just focus on one line and then do that over and over and then move on to the next line and do that over and over. If it's a challenging section you can actually skip a line so you can record one phrase skip it go into the next phrase and then come back and do the same thing for the phrase that you've skipped and then break do the next bit and that allows for power especially in more intense vocal styles it allows you to have the breath capacity to do more screamed phrases or add more grit to phrases and that can help to really nail the intensity for each phrase as the artist intends. You can play around with that. And while we talk about intensity, this brings me to the next workflow, which is to record by intensity. So if you have quite soft verses, rather than recording the verse and then going into the chorus, which is high in intensity, we skip that while the voice is in the state of a lower intensity and we make sure that we've got everything down that is softer then we move on to the louder more intense parts and then record all of the intense parts and this can be helpful if there are some vocally challenging parts that the vocalist may feel will impact the tone of their voice when they're doing softer parts and they want to make sure that they retain that before they potentially put their voice in, in a different place. So the choice is totally yours. And like I said, there's no right or wrong here. So that is one other option that you can try. Another workflow is to comp as you go. So if you're recording section by section, you can comp as you go, you can have a break and then you can move into the next section. This can be great if you're a self-producing artist and you may be writing as you're doing this and it allows you to really get through everything quite quickly if you don't get stuck in the weeds of it all, which can be a pitfall for it. If you start to lose momentum because you're just focusing on comping, you can lose the energy to want to move through the rest of the song. So that's something to experiment with 
bearing in mind the pros and cons. And the final workflow is to experiment with adding BVs and ad libs section by section, rather than recording the whole lead from start to finish and then going back and then playing around with adding doubles and harmonies. You can go section by section and experiment with adding backing vocals, ad libs, harmonies, etc while you're going through it so you could for example record the lead vocal in verse one and then start adding some bvs some r's some o's some gang vocals maybe a choir if you felt like it needed it in that part uh, an ad lib in between a phrase where nothing is there and you can really flesh everything out as you go along this can be a great tool to build up the energy of the vocal production and allow the artist to feel more inspired moving into the next section. So all of these tools and workflows are great. There is no right or wrong here. Just experiment with all of those and see which one fits for you. Instinctually, you will probably gravitate towards a few of these, a few variations of these and make it your own. And over time, you will start to develop your own unique workflow. Welcome to section four, you've made it this far. In this section, we are going to be discussing vocal mixing. So we're gonna talk about compression, limiting, EQ, saturation, reverb, delay. We're also gonna talk through creating your own vocal chains, what they are and their uses. And we're also going to cover some popular processing styles. This is a really meaty part here. So buckle up and let's jump in. EQ. What is EQ? Equalization, commonly abbreviated as EQ, is a fundamental audio processing tool used to shape the frequency content of audio signals. It allows for precise adjustment of specific frequency ranges within the sound spectrum, enabling engineers to enhance or attenuate particular tonal characteristics. In essence, EQ facilitates the refinement of audio quality by manipulating the balance between bass, mid-range and treble frequencies, thereby achieving desired tonal balance and clarity within a mix. How EQ relates to vocal production. EQ plays a crucial role in vocal production by sculpting the tonal characteristics of the voice to fit within the context of a mix. Engineers use EQ to enhance the clarity, presence, and overall balance of vocals by addressing frequency imbalances, removing unwanted resonances, and accentuating desirable traits such as warmth or brightness. For example, boosting the quote-unquote presence frequencies can make a vocal more intelligible and upfront while reducing low-end rumble can help maintain clarity and prevent muddiness. Essentially, EQ allows producers to tailor the vocal sound to suit the style and mood of the song while ensuring it sits well within the mix alongside other elements. Types of EQ Here are the main types of EQ commonly used in vocal production, along with their applications. Parametric EQ Parametric EQ offers precise control over frequency bands, allowing you to adjust the center frequency bandwidth, Q, and gain. It's versatile and suitable for detailed sculpting of vocal tone, such as removing unwanted resonances, boosting clarity in specific frequency ranges, or attenuating problematic frequencies. Graphic EQ Graphic EQ consists of fixed frequency bands with individual sliders for adjustment. While less flexible than parametric EQ, graphic EQ is useful for broad tonal shaping and quick adjustments. In vocal production, graphic EQ can be used to apply broad strokes of EQ to enhance overall tonal balance or to address common frequency issues across multiple bands. Dynamic EQ Dynamic EQ combines the features of traditional EQ with dynamic processing capabilities. It applies EQ adjustments dynamically based on the amplitude of the input signal. In vocal production, dynamic EQ can be used for tasks like de-essing, reducing sibilance, taming resonant frequencies, controlling dynamics, and preventing masking in busy mixes. Linear phase EQ. Linear phase EQ minimizes phase distortion, making it suitable for mastering and surgical EQ tasks where maintaining phase coherence is essential. 
In vocal production, linear phase EQ can be used for precise adjustments without introducing phase artifacts, particularly in scenarios where preserving the integrity of the vocal recording is paramount. Shelving EQ. Shelving EQ applies a boost or cut to all frequencies above or below a specific cutoff point. It's commonly used to shape the low end or high end of vocal recordings. For example, shelving EQ can add warmth and depth to vocals by boosting the low end frequencies, or enhance airiness and presence by boosting the high end frequencies. Each type of EQ has its strengths and applications in vocal production and understanding their characteristics can help you choose the right tool for the job based on the specific needs of the vocal track and mix. Common frequencies to pay attention to. Here's a breakdown of common areas to focus on when mixing vocals, along with their associated frequency ranges and characteristics. Low end, 20 hertz to 200 hertz. Around 80 hertz provides warmth and body to the vocals, Boosting here can add depth, but be cautious to avoid muddiness. Below 100 Hz, cutting or filtering out sub-bass frequencies can reduce rumble and unwanted noise. Low mids, 200 Hz to 800 Hz. Around 200 to 400 Hz can introduce muddiness or boxiness. Reducing in this range can help clean up the vocals and make room for other instruments. Mids, 800 Hz to 2 kHz. 1 kHz. Around 1 kHz, a lot of fundamental frequencies of instruments and vocals reside here. Adjusting here can affect the clarity and intelligibility of the vocal. 1 kHz to 2 kHz, the presence range. Boosting here can bring vocals forward in the mix and enhance articulation. High mids, 2 kHz to 5 kHz. Around 2 kHz to 3 kHz is a nasal or honky frequency. Cutting here can reduce harshness. 3 kHz to 5 kHz adds brightness and sibilance to vocals. Boosting can increase clarity and detail, but can also bring out sibilance. High end, 5 kHz to 20 kHz. Around 5 kHz to 8 kHz adds air and sparkle to vocals. Boosting here can make vocals sound more open and airy. Above 10 kHz. This adds presence and crispiness. Boosting subtly can enhance detail without causing harshness. These are the general guidelines and the specific characteristics of each vocal and mix will dictate how you apply EQ. It's important to train your ears and really remember that whatever each vocalist needs is what they need. So you don't necessarily need to go to each of these frequency ranges and boost or cut them. With time and experience with vocals and a lot of ear training, you will be able to develop an instinct and start to make the necessary adjustments for each vocalist. Experimentation and critical listening are key to achieving the desired vocal sound that you want. It's important to note with consistent ear training, a dialed in listening environment and experience, you will be able to make decisions quicker and more effectively. All right, let's dive into the different frequency ranges and what the associated characteristics are when it comes to tonal balance of vocals. So to demonstrate each of these, I'm going to use this multiband compressor. Don't worry about that. Right now, we're going to talk about this tool later on. But I just want to be able to solo each of these frequency ranges and have you listen to the characteristics and talk a little bit about the applications of using this in the context of vocal mixing and production. So we spoke about some broad frequency ranges. I wanna get a little bit more in depth here and break things down a little further. So first off, we have our lows, which are zero to 90 Hertz. So let's play this vocal section and listen to how this sounds. So we're getting a little bit of the body of the vocal, but aside from that, it's quite imperceptible. It's quite hard to hear. I've boosted this over 10 
DB for us to really be able to try and listen to what's going on there. This is what we talk about when it comes to rumble, any mic hits, some plosives, that kind of thing. You can really mitigate that by rolling some of this off, if not completely now depending on the vocalist rolling it off from 90 hertz may be too much if it's a very low vocalist you might need to do that a little more but that is up to you to decide with each individual vocalist which is the whole game with producing and mixing vocals it's highly contextual to each vocalist they have different ranges that they sing in they have different tonal qualities and you have to bear that in mind with every decision that you make in terms of tone frequency and dynamics so let's move on to the second frequency range which is our low mids so low mids 100 to 300 so we've got our low mids which are 100 to 300 hertz. Let's have a listen to this frequency range. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So, so we have a lot of the body of the vocal, but we also have some boominess. So let's have a listen to a couple of these notes and I'll highlight when there's a little bit of a build up there. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Do to keep my composure and you on the oo and o, oh, there's quite a bit of build up there, especially around here. So while we get a lot of the body of the vocal, there's also some boominess that can happen in our vocal recordings that we might need to attenuate. So let's move on to the upper low mids. Now I got this term from one of our mentors at mastering.com, Devon Terrell. You will know him from his channel, Help Me Devon. He talks about this kind of ghost frequency range that most people don't talk about that is so critical when it comes to vocals and it's the upper low mids or the mid low mids, however you want to call it which is around 350 to 6 to 700. So we have our upper low mids, let's say 700 hertz, 350 to 700. Now let's listen to how this sounds. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing... So we have a lot of presence there. We have a lot of low mid presence, which can be really helpful, but we also have this honkiness. If not attenuated, can really sound quite amateurish and is a telltale sign of a less experienced vocal engineer and producer. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So pay attention to how that sound, what's the tonal quality of it? Honky, perhaps a little nasal. That is the kind of quality that we associate with this range and of course depending on the singer it may be slightly different depending on the key that they're singing in depending on the singer themselves if they are male or female that will affect the tonal quality and where these frequency ranges are slightly skewed up or down now let's move on to our mid range it's so important this really is the range that our ears are so accustomed to hearing so you're getting this part right is so important so our mid range 1k to 4k now let's have a listen to this range this is quite a large frequency range certainly the largest that we have encountered so far so let's listen to how this sounds so i'll keep waiting for waiting for you it's the only thing that i can do to keep my composure so i'll keep waiting for waiting for you it's the only thing that i can do to keep my composure so we've got a ton of the presence pretty much all of the 
presence and intelligibility of the vocal is within this range. So pay close attention to how this sits within the mix, how this sounds after you've recorded it. And one thing to bear in mind is while this is also such an important frequency range in terms of presence and intelligibility, you can also get a lot of harshness, especially between that 2K to 4K, sometimes 1K as well, 1.5K. You might need to work on some build up there, maybe some resonances that you need to attenuate to make sure that it's nice and smooth on the listener's ear. Now let's talk about the upper mids. The upper mids are between 4K-ish, 4.5K to 8 to 9K. So let's listen to how this frequency range sounds. There's a lot of breathiness there. There's a little sizzle there, but there can also be a lot of sibilance. So we need to make decisions based on this frequency range and on the material that we're working with. Do we need to boost that? If boosting that adds more air or accentuates a breathy, airy vocal or a microphone that has picked up on that, has that detail, do we want to boost that? Or is there a lot of sibilance that is being brought up? And do we need to attenuate that? Those are decisions that you'll need to make based contextually on the singer, on the microphone, on the placement, and all of the groundwork that we've done so far, bringing us to this point in our journey. And finally, let's talk about our highs. That is 10K and above. Let's listen to how this sounds. So we can talk about this as air, as brilliance, as sizzle, as top end presence, whatever you want to call it, that's kind of the associated sound. And also, again, we get a lot of sibilance, particularly with this source material. So it's up to you to decide, do we need to boost it? Do we need to attenuate it? What does the vocal need? What does it need in the context of the mix? in the genre considerations, all of those things you're going to consider while going through each of these frequency ranges. But what I encourage you to do is do something similar here. Pull up five or six different vocals, maybe download an acapella from one of your favorite tracks. Have a plugin where you can solo or even just boost and listen to each frequency range. Take note of it, take note of how it sounds, take note of how it's been mixed in the context of that singer and of that song, and really start to study all of this so that you start to associate which frequency ranges have different characteristics, where you want to go within the mix, and you know if you're in a certain mix and you think, oh, okay, um, something's nasal or I think this is there's a little too much sibilance or maybe I want to accentuate some air in this vocal and that would accentuate the emotional tone that we're going for in this particular song. All of this work is the groundwork that allows you to work quickly and instinctually and over time you will just have all of this under your belt and be able to just go wherever you need to go to express the emotion and help to pave the way for the journey that the song needs to go in free from distraction easy for the listener to follow along with so everything is nice and smooth so there's nothing that jumps out too aggressively or is unpleasant for the listener and with time and practice you will get better at this and you won't need to necessarily think about this you'll be able to just go where you need to go and get the job done eq filters and their applications what are eq filters EQ filters are tools used to adjust the frequency response of an audio signal. EQ filters allow you to boost or cut specific frequency ranges, shaping the tonal balance of a sound. How do they work? EQ filters work by selectively altering the amplitude of specific frequency ranges within an audio signal, allowing producers to shape the tonal balance, remove unwanted frequencies, or emphasize certain aspects of the sound. 
Here are different types of EQ filters and their applications. Low pass filter. A low pass filter allows frequencies below a set cutoff point to pass through while attenuating frequencies above that point. This is useful for removing unwanted high frequency content such as hiss or sibilance and for creating a warmer, more subdued sound. High pass filter. A high pass filter allows frequencies above a set cutoff point to pass through while attenuating frequencies below that point. This is useful for removing low frequency rumble, mic handling noise or room noise from vocal recordings without affecting the clarity of the higher frequencies. Bandpass filter. A bandpass filter allows a specific range of frequencies to pass through while attenuating frequencies outside that range. This is useful for isolating a particular frequency range in vocals or instruments and for creative sound design applications. Notch filter. A notch filter attenuates a narrow band of frequencies around a specific center frequency. This is useful for removing unwanted resonances, feedback, or specific problem frequencies in vocals or instruments. Bell curve. A bell curve boosts or cuts frequencies around a specific center frequency with a specific bandwidth, or Q. This is useful for surgical EQ adjustments to enhance or attenuate specific frequencies in vocals, instruments, or an overall mix. Shelving EQ. Shelving EQ boosts or cuts all frequencies above or below a set cutoff point. This is useful for broad tonal shaping such as adding warmth by boosting low frequencies or adding airiness by boosting high frequencies in vocals or instruments. Tilt EQ. Tilt EQ tilts the frequency response of the audio signal, boosting or cutting both low and high frequencies simultaneously while maintaining a balanced overall sound. This is useful for adjusting the overall tonal balance of vocals or instruments without affecting the mid-range. Each type of EQ filter has its own unique characteristics and applications, and understanding how to use them effectively can help you achieve the desired sound in your vocal productions. All right, so in this video, I want to demonstrate all of the different filter types that we've spoken about so far, so that you get a sense for how these sound and their practical applications and what they look like on an EQ. So first off, let's start with our high pass filter. So we are allowing all of the highs to pass from the specific frequency range that we dictate. So right now from 100 Hertz and above, we're allowing all the highs to pass. So let's have a listen to how this sounds on a vocal. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, -ho. so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only So I want you and only you. So what you might notice that it's very subtle when sweeping between this range. So 100 hertz and below and then when we you and only you. start going towards 150 to 200 hertz, we start to lose a little bit of the body of the vocal. So let's have a listen to that. I want you and only you. I want you and I want you and only you. On? I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So we miss some of the body of that vocal. So I would want to dial that back for sure. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. What's so interesting as well is even just filtering and allowing the highs to pass from 70 hertz what happens is this very strange phenomenon where the brightness of the vocal seems to boost when you get rid of this frequency range here and you're really just getting rid of gunk as i like to call it let's listen to what we're getting rid of I've got 
nothing really that we're going to miss. So this is a really, really powerful technique, as simple as it is. All right, let's move on to the low pass filter. So this is the opposite. So we're telling the CQ to allow all the lows to pass depending on where we are. So from from which frequency range we dictate. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. So that sounds like someone is singing in the other room. So that's a creative application we can have if we wanted to have vocals or an instrument sound like it's in another room, we would know what to do now. I want you and only you. So what it allows us to think about is placing something further away in terms of how the listener's perceiving it. So that's a really great vocal production tool and production tool in general. We want to just think about it as I want you and only further away and darker, duller, warmer. All right, let's move on to a band pass filter. So this is our band and only the frequencies within this band can pass through. So let's have a sweep through and listen to how this sounds. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Uh -huh. So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. And we can make this narrower. Like this. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. So if you want the kind of telephone effect, you can create that with a bandpass filter. And then you can just isolate that. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. I want you and only you. On. I want you and only you. Off. I want you and only you. So you can really just sculpt the tone of any vocal or any other instrument and use a bandpass filter to limit the range of frequencies to exactly where you want it to sit. Let's move on to a notch filter. So let's say there is a resonance that we want to get rid of. Let's have a listen to the vocal. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. This is going to be an extreme case. Let's get rid of the extreme sizzle going on here with a notch filter. And then we can play around with the Q to be as narrow as we want it to be or as wide as we want it to be. Generally with notch filters and with bell curves, which we'll cover in a second, the higher up in the frequency range, the more narrow you want it to be so it sounds more transparent. Whereas the lower you can be a little wider and broader. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So what we have going on here, it's very subtle. I want you and only you. But there's a big build up of this high end energy, this airy crispiness that is being attenuated here. I want you and only you. Let's solo it. I want you and only you. 
I want you and only you. We lose a little bit of presence as well, but this would all be highly contextual. Within the mix, how it sounded would dictate the choices that I'd want to make in terms of how I would sculpt the tone of this vocal. All right, let's move on to a bell. This is a bell curve, so you can boost. I want you in on the you. I want you in on the you. I want you in on the you. And you can cut. I want you in on the you. I want you in on the you. I want you in on the you. And then you can play around with the Q for really tight, narrow cues and really broad brush strokes. So you wanna think about surgical moves like this to be something very, very detailed and direct, whereas broader is gonna be something where we are working with big, broad brush strokes. So if you wanted to get rid of a general frequency range where there might be some build up, you would wanna be a little more broad and heavy handed. If you had some real problem areas that you wanted to dial in, maybe a, a high end hum, hiss or something like that, you would maybe use something like this or a notch filter, and then you can use the solo function to find that and then get rid of it. And then we have a shelf. So a shelf looks like a shelf. So you can boost and you can cut. So you have a high shelf. So from three kilohertz upwards, we're boosting that frequency range, everything from 3K and above, or we can cut everything from 3K-ish and above. I want you in on the you. I want you in on the you. This is something that I hear a lot in less experienced vocal mixes. There's just a ton of this and save your ears here. This is going to be pretty unpleasant. I want you in on the you. I got nothing left to lose. Just crazy, crazy boosting in the high mids and highs. And it can be really crispy and sizzly and unpleasant to the ears and distracting. It brings up all of this sibilance. Let's listen to it the other way. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So that would have been a little nasty on your ears. A lot of that mid-range energy, that build-up created distortion. And that's just from boosting all of this energy up. And then we have a low shelf. So it's just the opposite. So we can boost the lows. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you closer. I want you and only you. So just pay attention to how all of that sounds. And depending on the mix, depending on the production, depending on the emotional tone you want to go for, you would use all of these different filters and the placement within the frequency spectrum to shape and sculpt the tone that you want in the context of kind of what you're going for, in terms of the reference, in terms of everything we've mentioned so far. So finally, let's talk about a tilt shelf so that you can see what that looks like. This is a tilt shelf. So as you can see, I can tilt all around the frequency spectrum and it's boosting while attenuating the opposite end of the frequency spectrum. So let's have a listen to how this sounds. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, so I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. It's the only thing that I can do to keep my composure. 
Oh, I need you closer, I want you and only you. So that is a tilt shelf. In all honesty, a tilt shelf isn't something that I've really ever used in any applications of my own productions or mixes, but go ahead and experiment with it. It definitely has its applications, but I wanted to demonstrate that and highlight that to cover all grounds in terms of all the filter types so that you have all the knowledge that you need to understand EQ moving forward when mixing and producing your own vocals. So play around with all of these filters, experiment with how you hear all of the different filters and the Q and the slopes as well. You can also play around with stereo placement, but that is a lot more advanced. The most important thing here is to train your ears and this comes with a lot of time, a lot of practice and really starting to associate the different frequency ranges and their characteristics. And when you have that under your belt, you will be able to hear a lot of these nuances. You'll be able to spot resonances, spot build up and spot pleasant frequencies that you think would benefit from being boosted. And if I were to share any tip here, I would say be aggressive. And this might go against a lot of what you hear on YouTube or any other courses. But for you to really hear things, be aggressive and, you know, really push it. Push these things to hear what's happening, to really understand the tools. And over time as you start to understand and hear all of this stuff, you'll be able to really dial into things when they're really subtle as well. And finally, my other tip that really, really helped me when it came to mixing vocals specifically is rather than this kind of sweep, search and destroy method, I like to just listen with the solo function and sweep from Unity. So I'm just at zero, I'm not boosting anything because in all honesty, boosting something by 10 or 15 dB and sweeping, kind of everything sounds horrible. So you're just going to end up with kind of all of this crazy stuff that you sometimes see where, you know, people are just cutting everything and completely butchering the vocal. So what I recommend is to just start with the solo function and you don't need fab filter to do this a lot of eqs have this function there are free eqs that have this have a solo function so just have a look at that and type that in and see if you don't have one already just download one trial some see which ones feel good and this is kind of how i make my decisions you know not too narrow and then just sort of listening The only thing that I can do to keep my composure. Oh, I need you close. Want you and only you. And I would make decisions based on that as opposed to boosting things. And we will move on to these techniques that I'm using now later on. Popular EQ models in vocal production. Here are some of the most popular EQ models used in vocal production and mixing. Poltec EQP 1A. The Poltec EQP-1A is a classic tube EQ known for its smooth and musical sound. It's often used in vocal production to add warmth, presence and air to vocal recordings. The EQP-1A features unique low and high boost cut shelves, as well as a mid-range EQ section with selectable frequencies. FabFilter Pro-Q FabFilter Pro-Q is a versatile digital EQ plugin known for its intuitive interface and transparent sound. It offers precise control over frequency bands with features like dynamic EQ, linear phase mode, and per band mid-side processing. In vocal production, Pro-Q is used for detailed tonal shaping, surgical corrections, and dynamic EQ tasks. SSL E-Series Channel Strip this plugin emulates the EQ section of the classic SSL 4000 E-Series console, known for its punchy and aggressive sound. The SSL EQ is favoured in vocal production for its ability to add clarity, presence and energy to vocals. 
It features a four-band EQ with adjustable frequency ranges and switchable bell slash shelf curves. Marg Audio EQ4. The Marg EQ4 is renowned for its airband, a unique high frequency shelf that adds sparkle and presence to vocals. It also features a fixed low frequency shelf and two parametric bands for more precise tonal shaping. The Marg EQ4 is popular in vocal production for its ability to enhance clarity and airiness without sounding harsh or brittle. These are just a few examples of popular EQ models used in vocal production. Each EQ has its own sonic characteristics, features and workflow, so it's essential to experiment and find the ones that best suit your preferences and the requirements of the vocal track you're working on. There are also a ton of stock and free emulations, so don't feel you need to spend money on buying these plugins. So I wanted to demonstrate some of the popular EQ models that you will come across that are used in a lot of different genres and by a lot of people in the industry. So here are a few that I'm gonna cover. So we've got the Poltec, we've got FabFilter Pro Q, and we've got the SSL E-Channel, which is just this part. So I'm gonna just walk you through all of the parameters, how to use these EQs and the applications for vocal production and vocal mixing. So the Poltec EQ is a passive EQ and this is used widely because of the broad musical frequency filters that have been built into this analog unit. So this is an analog emulation of a classic piece of hardware. So let's walk through how to use this. We've got our on off, then we have are low frequency, so we can only pick between 20, we can only pick 20, 30, 60, and 100 hertz, and then we can boost that like that, and then we can attenuate like that. So if you wanted to remove some of that, you can do it like so, you can boost it like that, and you can also boost and attenuate, which is a really nice function here so what you're essentially doing is boosting 60 hertz and then attenuating the less desirable parts within that frequency range so let's move on to the second part of this so we have boost attenuate just like that and then we have more frequencies to choose from so high frequency 3k 4k 5k 8k 10k 12k and 16k and then we have an attenuation here as well, which is 5K, 10K, and 20K. So you can boost and attenuate. Let's say that you wanted to boost 8K and attenuate 5K. You attenuate like so. And then you have the trim here. So if you needed to turn the level down, you're getting some excessive gain from any boosts or any attenuation, and you wanted to bring that up. And then finally, we have bandwidth. So we have sharp or broad. So this is the Q. So how sharp you want the Q to be with the high frequencies or how broad you want them to be. So if you wanted a broad boost, you wanted something that is a lot more broad brush strokes. You can push it all the way here. You can go somewhere in the middle or you can go narrow. So let's have a listen to this briefly. So I'm gonna boost each of these frequency ranges. I'm gonna be really aggressive so we can try and hear what this is doing. I want you and only you. 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 So 20 hertz is really subtle. You can really start to hear it at 30, 60, and 100. 60 and 100 is a lot easier to hear. And let's attenuate and have a listen to how that sounds. I want you and only you. 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 So it's slightly more scooped. We're still getting 
that boost, but it's getting rid of some of the less desirable parts of boosting within that frequency range, which can be super helpful. Let's move on to the high frequencies. So we've got 3K. I want you and only you. Let me bring the gain down a bit. I want you and only you. 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 So we're getting some of the high mids and then we're moving into the highs. Let's attenuate. I want you and only you. 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 So we're having a similar effect. It's more scooped. We're getting rid of some of the harshness when we attenuate. So you can dial that into taste. So let's listen to 10K with the bandwidth sharp. I want you and only you. And broad. I want you and only you. A lot more subtle, a lot more pleasing, a lot more musical are the kind of terms that I would describe. It's very, very sharpened. I want you and only you. Sizzling. And there is a lot of high end in this recording. And this is a processed vocal sample. So it would sound very, very different on a raw vocal recording but what we're doing here is accentuating all of the different parts within this already processed vocal recording let's listen to 4k i want you and only you i want you and only you a lot more easy to listen to a lot cleaner whereas this sounds like we're bringing up the artificial digital brightness that we might not want I want you and only you. I want you and only you. 5K. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. 3K. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. And we're boosting this by 10 dB. Now let's just bypass that and listen to what's happening. I want you and only you. 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 So we're getting some gain as well. So let's try and match that. I want you and only you. 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 So there's some major, major tonal shifts that are happening here. But when we play around with the broad bandwidth, it's a lot more imperceptible. So that can be good if you want more subtle shifts playing around with the, the boost, but it can also be a curse because what might happen is if you're not bypassing and listening to the original signal, you can start to make some very drastic changes that in the context of the mix and the direction you're going in with the vocal production may end up being detrimental. So just bear that in mind when you're working with this EQ. It's a beautiful EQ. I really love working with this and it's something that I use a lot on my vocals. I love how easy it is to use and the limitation and really just forcing you to listen as opposed to look at and to make decisions based off of that. This knob is really amazing to, to play around with to make things sound a little more broad and subtly sweeten your vocals. All right, let's move on to Fab Filter. So we have already done some demonstrations with this. We have got our filter types that we covered earlier on, and then we've got our slopes, and then our Q. So let's have a bell. We can make it broad, narrow, broad, narrow. So it's the same thing as the bandwidth as we're making it sharp. It's sharp like this. And then as we're making it broad. So if you need a visual aid, that's kind of what's happening under the hood. So Pro-Q is great for a utility plugin where you're just, you know, bringing things, filtering things out, attenuating some frequencies, some build up. If you maybe can hear that something is, you know, around a certain frequency range, but you need to 
really get in there to to find that specific frequency and then you know bring it down etc this is a really great plugin for that of course you've got your stock plugin which looks very similar it has a little more limited functionality but this is a perfect plugin you know it does all the same things apart from some more advanced features but to just play around with the filter types boost cut you can do very narrow cuts and i was laughing with jake just now because i was talking to him about the different eq models and which ones i should cover and he was like dude i only use the stock logic eq ever and his stuff is totally pro so you do not need to have all these different eqs i personally like to play around with different models I know that Dane and Caleb like to do that too. It's all just down to each person's individual preference, their workflow, and what they need the EQs for. So, you know, we can add our shelves. We've got our high pass, got our low pass, play around with the slopes, brick wall. You probably never want to do that unless it was a really creative effect vocally in the context of, of mixing and producing vocals. What I really love Pro-Q for is the dynamic EQ. I use that a lot to tame resonances and harshness in vocals. So of course this vocal is a sample that I've pulled in for this demonstration purpose and it's all been processed and it's already really well produced and recorded. But let's just have a sweep through and I'll show you an example of how I would find potentially harsh parts of a vocal or some resonances and kind of tame those. I want you in on the uh. 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 I want you and only you. Let's bypass this and have a listen to what we've done. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So we're losing a little bit of this. I want you. So let me make it dynamic. I want you and only you. Don't worry about this, we're going to cover this in detail later. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. Very subtle moves. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I like the body of this, but I just want to make it dynamic just in case there's a build up around there. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. I want you and only. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. So we're losing some of the body of that. I would maybe turn that off. I want you and only you. But what I'm hearing is it's a lot smoother. It feels a lot less upfront in solo, but we need to listen to it in the context of the mix and then make those decisions as well. So I wouldn't typically do this in solo. I might do it if I'm just trying to find, you know, a specific frequency range or, you know, maybe a problem frequency in solo or what I often do is, you know, the music is playing, the mix is playing, and then I would just bring the vocals up so they poke out of the mix so I can hear it a little more, but I'm still hearing it in context with the music and then I tuck it back in. But here's an example of some stuff that you could do. I probably wouldn't go this far. This is some of the applications that I use Pro-Q for. So let's talk about the SSL E-Series Channel Strip. So when I am talking about the E-Series Channel Strip, I'm talking about this section here. So there are a lot of plugins that are just this section. So this is modeled from the SSL 4K bus processor. So we have a lot more going on here. We've got a compressor here. We've got trim. We've got width. We've got pan. 
we've got other parameters that we don't need to worry about here. So I'm gonna turn those off. We've just got our EQ. And we've got our in, our on off. And then we have low frequencies at the bottom. And we have a lot more flexibility here. So as opposed to the Poltec, which has fixed frequencies, we can really dial in where we wanna go here. And then we boost and attenuate like so. And you can make it a bell as opposed to a shelf. And then we've got the low mids. And we've got our Q here, narrow and broad. And then we've got our high mids, narrow and broad Q, boost and attenuate, and then choose the frequency range. The same for high frequencies. And then we can boost. This is a shelf and this is a shelf. And you can remember that with this, which kind of looks like a shelf as well. And if you want it to be a bell, you can just click bell. And then we have our low pass filter and high pass. So let's say we wanted to allow the lows to pass up to 4K, we could do so. Or we could do our high pass up to 100. And you can do that all in here, which is amazing. This gives you so much flexibility and it also has its own characteristics in terms of how the filters are shaped and the way that they have been programmed in this analog unit. So let's play around a little bit with each of these parameters. So we've got a low pass. I want you and only you. A high pass. I want you and only you. I want you and only you. Let's move this over just to give you a different section so you don't go crazy. I got nothing left to lose. 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 That's with a bell. Let's do it as a shelf. I got nothing left to lose. 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 Let's attenuate it. I got nothing left to lose. 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 I got nothing. And listen again to similarly to the the narrow and broad in the Poltec. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. So let's boost 8K. I got nothing left to lose. And then let's put it to a shelf. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. A lot more subtle, a lot easier on the ears. So make the decision what you need in that moment what the vocal needs, what it needs in the context of the mix, but that's something I want to highlight here. And then we've got our high mids. I got nothing left to lose. 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 So I'm hearing I got nothing left to lose. I could just take some of that I out. I got nothing left to lose. 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 I much prefer that personally from a taste standpoint. Getting rid of a little bit of that 800. We've got a narrow Q, just attenuating that, about just under minus two. That's something you could do. And you can sweep through like so. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left. Make it broad. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. Or narrow and etc. You know, you can go around and play around with this to taste. You can reference and listen to songs that had vocals mixed using the SSL. There'll be so many. And you can kind of listen to what's happening there, try and emulate it, try and recreate the tonal balance of it, and really play around with 
each of these parameters. What I love about this EQ, not only in the way that it boosts and attenuates the frequencies, is that it also, like the Poltec, allows you to really dial in to what you're hearing. It forces you to start to trust your ears, which I think is really important, as opposed to the trap here where you can start to see things peaking all over the place, which are natural, resonances are natural, build-up is natural in the human voice and in human recording, and then you start to just do this, which in itself can be quite aggressive and quite overkill. And, you know, sometimes you get too aggressive and you just lose all of the life of the vocal. Let's listen to how that would sound. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. I got nothing left to lose. It's just sucked all of the life and energy out of it. So you don't want to just rely on your eyes here and be mixing with your eyes. You want to really listen to what you're doing and also take breaks. Bypass is your best friend. Listen to whether what you've done is helping or hurting the mix. Never be afraid to just start again, get rid of it all and then reassess. So those are a couple of my favorite EQ models. Play around with these. The Poltec EQ has its own stock version in Logic. There we are, our Tube EQ. This is modeled on a slightly different version of the Poltec, which has more frequencies. But this is essentially the same. You can see that this top half looks very similar. We've got our attenuation, we've got our output, we've got our drive, our on off slash in out, our low boost. And this actually gives you more flexibility. So it doesn't just snap like the original Poltec does where you can only pick that. So you have a higher degree of flexibility here, which is also great. And there are SSL emulations that are not actually by Solid State Logic SSL. This version is the faithful emulation from SSL themselves. There's also a UAD version and there are Slate Digital versions and you can look up. There's some cheap or free alternatives for sure. The biggest thing I want to emphasize here is please don't feel like you need to go and spend money on any of these plugins, even Pro-Q. You know, all of these have a different degree of flexibility and they're just different paints on your palette. And with time, you get to associate what each of these sounds like and what the applications are in different contexts. And you just pull these out when needed. And when starting out, this is more than good enough. You don't need to get bogged down with thinking that buying more tools is going to make you better as a producer and engineer. The truth is the right ear training and having a dialed in room and having a firm understanding of how the tools work and any mindset shifts that are holding you back or leading you astray, identifying those and eradicating them, that is the true way that you will get better in all of the avenues of music production. So please, 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 if you take anything away from this section, let this be your message. Please just use what you have until your skill level and where you're at allows you to afford better tools. You don't need to start buying things in the hope that that is going to be your saving grace and make you better. What makes you better is doing the work, mixing vocals, producing vocals, and learning the tools. So I hope this walkthrough was helpful. Let's move on. Dynamic EQ. What is dynamic EQ? Dynamic EQ is a type of equalization that combines the principles of traditional EQ with dynamic processing techniques, such as compression and expansion. Unlike static EQ, which applies fixed adjustments to all frequencies, dynamic EQ responds to changes in the audio signal's volume and selectively applies EQ adjustments only when certain thresholds are exceeded. Here's how it works. First off, you have your threshold. Like a compressor, dynamic EQ has a threshold setting. When the audio signal crosses this threshold, the dynamic EQ starts to apply EQ adjustments. Frequency bands. Dynamic EQ typically operates across multiple frequency bands, allowing you to target specific areas of the audio spectrum. Gain reduction. 
when the audio exceeds the threshold, dynamic EQ reduces or boosts the gain of selected frequencies, depending on the configured settings. This reduction or boost is applied dynamically based on the amplitude or volume of the audio signal. Dynamic EQ is useful for scenarios where traditional EQ may not be sufficient. For example, it can help control harshness in vocals or tame resonant frequencies in instruments without affecting the overall tonal balance when the problem frequencies are not present. It's a versatile tool for precision shaping of audio signals, especially in dynamic and complex mix environments. Dynamic EQ is highly relevant to vocal production because it offers a nuanced approach to addressing specific issues that may arise during vocal mixing. Here are a few ways that dynamic EQ can be applied. DSing. Dynamic EQ can be used to target and reduce sibilant frequencies in vocal recordings. Instead of applying static de-essing across the entire vocal track, dynamic EQ only activates when sibilance occurs, providing a more natural and transparent solution. Taming resonances. Vocal recordings may have resonant frequencies that cause certain notes or syllables to sound harsh or boomy. Dynamic EQ can dynamically attenuate these resonances, ensuring a smoother and more even vocal performance without affecting unaffected frequencies. Controlling dynamics. Sometimes vocal performances have inconsistent dynamics, with certain phrases or syllables standing out too much. Dynamic EQ can help tame these fluctuations by applying EQ adjustments only when the volume exceeds a certain threshold, helping to maintain a more consistent vocal level throughout the track. Masking prevention. In a dense mix, vocals can get masked by other instruments or frequencies, affecting clarity. Dynamic EQ can help by automatically adjusting the vocal frequencies in real time to ensure they remain audible and prominent, even in busy arrangements. Overall, Dynamic EQ provides a flexible and precise tool for addressing specific issues in vocal recordings while maintaining the naturalness and transparency of the original performance. It's an invaluable asset in the Vocal Producers Toolkit for achieving polished and professional vocal mixes. So let's walk through Dynamic EQ. I want to walk you through what this looks like in the real application of how you can use this on vocals. So Dynamic EQ is exactly what it sounds like. As we've mentioned, you are taking certain frequencies or frequency ranges, and then you are having them reacting to the frequencies dynamically. So to do this in Pro Q, you click Make Dynamic, and then you see this, as opposed to this, which just looks like a normal bell. So let's enable the dynamics. Let's go down to the low mids. Only thing that I can do to keep my composure. So I'll keep waiting. So this is an example where I would use dynamic EQ. There is this build up here around 220, which is not throughout the whole duration of this vocal take it just comes in at certain moments when the singer hits certain vowels and there's build up in that frequency range so i would just want to put a dynamic eq around there just to attenuate it when it goes over a certain threshold so in order for me to dial that in i will mess around with the q to see how broad or narrow i want it to be and then I bring the gain down. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. And then you can see this here, the dynamic range. And then as I bring this down, this is going to attenuate this more aggressively and less aggressively and bring the range down. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh, 
So I'll keep waiting for, waiting for you. So you can see when those notes are being hit in that frequency range, it's starting to bring that dynamic range down and make sure that it doesn't go over that threshold. I want you in. So when we use dynamic EQ, this is when we want to have more control over frequencies and frequency ranges and resonances that only happen once every so often or once during the performance of the vocals. And we want to make sure that when those build up at those parts, we attenuate them. And the reason we use dynamic EQ is it can be a lot more transparent. So rather than just carving that frequency and frequency range out of the vocal completely, which would sound like this. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Let's have a listen to it with the dynamics in place. I want you and only you. I got nothing left to lose. Oh. We retain a little bit more of the body of that vocal and just make sure that it doesn't sound too boomy in the parts where it is too boomy. So it sounds a lot more natural, it sounds a little more transparent, and it's also retaining the natural goodies that we have in that vocal recording. So when you have that intention, that is when you would want to go ahead and pull up a dynamic EQ. EQ key takeaways. When using EQ on vocals, there are several important takeaways to focus on. Number one is to listen critically. Always listen to the vocals in the context of the mix and make adjustments based on what sounds best rather than relying solely on visual representations or presets. Start with subtractive EQ. Begin by identifying and cutting any problematic frequencies or unwanted resonances before boosting. This helps to clean up the vocal sound and create space for other elements in the mix. Avoid excessive boosting. While it's tempting to boost frequencies to make vocals stand out, excessive EQ can lead to unnatural or harsh sounding results. Aim for subtle adjustments and use multiple EQ bands if necessary to achieve the desired tonal balance. Consider dynamic EQ. In addition to traditional static EQ, dynamic EQ can be useful for addressing dynamic or transient issues in vocal recordings, such as sibilance or resonant peaks. Use high pass filtering. Apply a high pass filter to roll off low frequencies below the vocal's fundamental range to remove rumble and unnecessary low end energy, helping to clean up the mix and improve clarity. Experiment and trust your ears. Every vocal recording is unique, so don't be afraid to experiment with different EQ settings and techniques to find the best sound for your particular track. Ultimately, trust your ears and make adjustments based on what sounds best in the context of the mix, the anchoring of your references, and your taste. Always ask why. Before making any move, know the reason behind it. It's important to know why you're using EQ, and if you even need to. If you're not sure, Take a step back, pull up a reference, and let yourself be anchored in objectivity. There's a lot more to cover when mastering EQ, and we have a comprehensive course just covering everything you need to know. So if you feel like you still need further guidance, you can go ahead and check that out later. So after covering everything that we've gone through so far in terms of EQ, the types of EQ, model, frequency ranges, all of that good stuff, I want to walk you through EQing a section of a vocal just to demonstrate everything that we've gone through so far. So you can follow along and see the methodology, the techniques, the thought processes behind what I'm doing and the tools that I'm using as well. So first off, let's have a listen to what we've got. On the but I can't help falling Feel we're on the verge of a free Falling on the precipice Staying staring at the edge Without a care we're on the brink Got a taste it's so so sweet Sipping in your ecstasy Okay so first of all I'm hearing some sibilance and especially on sipping so we're going to want to DS which we will go over later, but we can use some dynamic EQ 
to mitigate that, to attenuate some of that. The vocal is a little tucked back, but I know that I can bring presence by boosting certain frequency ranges, the upper mid range, the highs to add a bit more air and brilliance to it. And there's also some build up in the low mids that I want to attenuate as well. And I just want to bring this to a more polished, bright and present sounding vocal. I want to make sure that the intelligibility is there as well. And of course, the dynamic processing will help with that compression, gain automation, etc. But for this demonstration, I just want to focus on EQ. So let's pull up Pro-Q and let's get to work. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Get fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of a free falling on. Yes. Staying, staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the break. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Okay, let's Okay, run 6k We might have to attenuate that 9k as well On the edge won't the world stop turning Think it fast but I Okay, just just a little bit. On the eight turning, thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, falling on the precipice. Stay staring at. So I've just clicked the auto gain feature on here and I'm just making sure that Pro-Q is gain matching so that I'm not making decisions based on things sounding louder or quieter because I've cut a lot of frequencies and frequency ranges and boosted some as well. So I wanna make sure that the, the work I'm doing is shaping the tone and I'm not fooling myself by thinking things are louder or quieter. Stop turning, thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Now, I'm using Dynamic EQ here to tame some of that sibilance. In all honesty, this isn't how I would go about it. I would actually just pull up a de and use that. But this is a great example of how you can use it as well. I find it, it can be a little bit pernickety and fiddly, which isn't great in terms of my workflow. I like to work quickly and, you know, use the objectivity that I have on fresh ears as opposed to moving around and going in circles and adding more and more stuff that I don't need to. So this is sounding pretty good. Let's A, B before. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge without a care. We're on the Okay, 
I just want to get a little more air again. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Yes. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Stop turning, thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Okay, I like this 650 here. It's bringing a little bit more presence and weight to the vocal, and a little bit of air, which I like. I'm still getting the sibilance. Let me DS it and see whether this helps. Stop turning, thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge, without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Yes. Lovely. So it got that s sipping, which was the worst one. And what this actually allows me to do, this is quite aggressive DSing. And we'll cover this later, go over all the parameters. I'll do a whole demo just on DSing. But this is essentially a dynamic EQ. So you're telling it the frequency range, you're pulling the threshold down, the range by how many decibels do you want it to be pulled down? And then you're just dialing that into taste. What this has allowed me to do is I can actually push some of that air more now, which is kind of what I wanted to go for, especially the references that we're using. This is an alt pop song. So we're looking at artists like Holly Humberston, who have pretty bright, airy vocals. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring. Okay, let's just double check that this Marg EQ is gain matched. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. That seems pretty good to me. Maybe just a tad. So, this is some basic EQing on here now. Let's a, B it and see where we're at. Before. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Okay, and now let's add the EQ moves and the DSA that we've put in. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Okay, so we've still got some of that sibilance and what I would probably go ahead and do is bring some of that down. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help for On the edge, won't the world stop 
Could go ahead and clip gain it as well. Okay, that's too aggressive. Let's get in here. Okay. Okay. Just clip gain that down. So these are whichever way you prefer. Okay, it's feeling a little better. Okay, so that feels better. I've made some adjustments. I've brought the S's down manually as well as cranked the DS or a touch more. What I'm finding is as much as I like the 10K boost, the air, it's also bringing out sibilance. So if I bring it up to 20K and I crank that up a little more, we get a lot of that brilliance and brightness and the feeling that this is an expensive vocal without sacrificing a ton of sibilance poking out at us, which is great. I don't have to try and fix that problem and just choose, okay, I'm just choosing to boost 10K and then I'm going to try and add Soothe and maybe another de and all of that stuff. If I can remove that problem and make another decision that still retains what I'm going for and allows me to retain the natural performance, I will try and do that as best I can. So once more for luck, let's have a listen before and after. And after. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it. Free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sip it in your ecstasy. Yes. Okay, so it sounds a lot more present there's some parts of the vocal that i enjoy that are being accentuated some of that two and a half k some of that top end we're getting rid of some build up a little bit of build up at 700 some of the low mid accentuating around 3k Attenuating some of that sibilance, adding a little bit of that 650, and then a ton of air. So we've used two EQ plugins and one dynamic tonal plugin. 
to get this result. And we've not done anything crazy. We've done a few little moves. And if you notice how I've approached this, I've looked at problem areas and then enhancements. So what are the problems? The problems were some build up here. And what were the enhancements? I wanted to just enhance a little bit of this area, a little bit of that area, and a little bit of this area. And that's it. I don't feel like I need to do anything else. I'm going to move on at this stage to the next part of my processing. And then I would come back, listen to a reference, listen to a few references, take a break, come back again, and then listen. Where are we in the ballpark? Are we there? Are there any tweaks we need to make? How is it feeling tonally? How does the artist feel about it? Do they like how it sounds? And then move on. Compression. What is compression? Compression is an audio processing technique used to reduce the dynamic range of an audio signal by attenuating the amplitude of louder sounds while leaving the softer sounds relatively unaffected. In simple terms, compression evens out the volume levels of an audio signal by reducing the difference between the loudest and quietest parts. This is achieved using a compressor device or plugin, which automatically reduces the gain, volume, or the audio signal when it exceeds a certain threshold level. Compression is commonly used in music production, broadcasting, and sound reinforcement to control dynamics, improve intelligibility, and increase perceived loudness. How does it relate to vocal production? Compression plays a crucial role in vocal production for several reasons. One, leveling dynamics. Vocals can have a wide dynamic range, with some parts being very loud and others very quiet. Compression helps to even out these differences by reducing the volume of the loudest parts, making the overall performance more consistent and easier to mix. 2. Improving intelligibility. Compression can bring quieter vocal details such as whispers or softer phrases up in volume, making them easier to hear without increasing the overall level of the vocal. This improves the clarity and intelligibility of the vocal performance, especially in busy mixes. 3. Controlling peaks. Vocals often have sudden spikes in volume, such as when a singer hits a high note or emphasizes a word. Compression helps to tame these peaks, preventing them from clipping or distorting and ensuring a smooth controlled vocal performance. 4. Enhancing presence. By reducing the dynamic range of the vocal signal, compression can make the vocal sound more upfront and present in the mix. This allows the vocal to cut through other instruments and stand out without being overpowering. 5. Increased perceived loudness. Compression can make vocals sound louder and more prominent in the mix without actually increasing their peak volume. By reducing the dynamic range, compression allows engineers to push the overall level of the vocals closer to the maximum without causing distortion or discomfort for the listener. Overall, compression is a powerful tool in music production that helps to shape the dynamics, clarity, presence and overall impact of the vocal performance within the context of the mix. Most common compression types used on vocals. The most common types of compression used on vocals are 1. Optical compression. Optical compressors use a light-dependent resistor, LDR, to control gain reduction, resulting in a smooth and natural compression response. They're known for their musicality and gentle compression characteristics. Optical compressors are often used on vocals for transparent leveling and subtle dynamic control, particularly in situations where a more natural and musical compression sound is desired. VCA compression, voltage controlled amplifier. VCA compressors use voltage controlled amplifiers to regulate gain reduction, providing fast and precise control over dynamics. They're known for their transparent and versatile compression characteristics with the ability to deliver both gentle and aggressive compression. VCA compressors are widely used on vocals for general dynamic control, leveling and shaping the overall tone of the vocal performance. They are subtle for a wide range of vocal styles and genres. FET compression, field effect transistor. 
FET compressors use field effect transistors to regulate gain reduction, providing a fast attack time and a slightly coloured compression sound. They're known for their punchy and aggressive compression characteristics, with a distinctive mid-range emphasis. FET compressors are popular on vocals for adding energy, presence and punch to the vocal performance. They're often used in rock, pop and hip-hop music, where a more aggressive compression sound is desired. Tube compression. Tube compressors use vacuum tubes to regulate gain reduction. They provide a warm and rich compression sound with subtle harmonic distortion. They're known for their smooth and musical compression characteristics. Tube compressors are used on vocals for adding warmth, color, and character to the vocal performance. They're often favored in genres like jazz, blues, and soul, where a vintage and organic compression sound is desired. Each type of compression has its own sonic characteristics and applications, and the choice of compressor depends on the desired sound, style, and context of the vocal performance. All right, so let's walk through some popular compressor types. We're gonna cover Opto, VCA, FET, and Tube, and I'm gonna show you some of the plugin variations of these and how they work. So first off, let's check out the Opto, Optical Compressor the most famous being the LA-2A. So let's pull that up. So here we have the LA-2A. It's a very simple plugin. There's only a few parameters. The attack and release are built into this under the hood. So all you have here is the gain and feeding that into the plugin itself and then the peak reduction, which acts as the threshold. You have limit or compress, depending on what you want to do with it and then you just have output gain and then the on off. So very simple to use, but let's have a listen to how this sounds on vocals. So we're getting about three to minus five dB of gain reduction. So let's have a listen to how this sounds on and off. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it free. Falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the break. Got it tasted so, so sweet. And then let's put it on. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it free. Falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the break. Got it tasted so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. So this feels a lot more upfront because everything's leveled out in a very gentle and transparent way. But what's also really nice about what's happening with this LA-2A is it's also affecting the tone. So to my ear, it's adding a little more presence with some mid and high mid tonal characteristics that come with this compressor type. So once more, let's have a, a quick listen. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So everything feels a lot more leveled out, but it doesn't sound super compressed, which is 
really, really nice with this particular plugin. This is kind of what we talk about when we say quote unquote musical, the compression sounds musical. All right, let's move on to our VCA. So we've got our DBX160 emulation. We've got our threshold. We've got our ratio, our output, power on off, and then our mix knob, and then some metering. So let's just start dialing this in. Okay, so there's a very different tonal characteristic that comes with this, and it sounds a little more aggressive, a little more upfront compared to the LA-2A. And let's kind of try and dial this in to minus three, minus five, so that we're getting the same amount of gain reduction. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it. There's a really nice mid kind of low mid accentuation that's coming with this running through the circuitry that I really like as well. So let's A, B this against RLA 2A. Let's try and dial that in a touch more. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So I really like the tone that comes with this, but I'm hearing a lot more saturation. I'm hearing a little bit of pumping, and the attack and release is under the hood with this as well. So I would probably mess around with the ratio make it a little less aggressive on the edge, won't the world stop turning thinking fast but i can't help falling feel we're on the verge of it free falling on the precipice once again let's listen to the la2a So this is a little more transparent to my ears as well. But if you wanted to go for this sound where you have this accentuated mid-range, you've got a little more saturation and coloration and a little more of an aggressive sound, this is great. And what you can also do is mix that in. We're gonna talk about parallel processing later, but you could blend this in with the original signal so that it's a little less aggressive. All right, next we have our FET compression and we're gonna pull up our 1176. So this has a little more going on. We have our input and output. So this is essentially our threshold. How much gain do we wanna input into the compressor? And then we have to match the output gain so we're not just getting more volume and compression. We also wanna make sure we're at the same level, we're gain matching, so we're not being tricked by our ears thinking it's better because it's louder. And then we have our attack and our release. So we've got our fast attack this way, and then our slow attack and release that way. And then we have our ratio, four to one, eight to one, 12 to one, 20 to one, and then some metering here. So let's start dialing this in. So we're gonna start with fast attack, fast release. medium attack let's go all the way slow let's 
thanks to a fast dish attack and fast release. So we've got some more mid and low mid information coming with the tone of this compressor. There's a lot more grit as well. It sounds a little punchier. So I'm letting in a little more of the transient information here. So if I wanted it to be a little more punchy, I'm going to start to bring the attack slower. As it goes slower, more transient information is coming through. As it goes faster, it's hitting all those transient peaks, all that transient information a lot faster. So you're going to have a smoother sound. So think fast attack, smoother slow attack, punchier. And then with release, a fast release is gonna let go of all that information really quickly, which can sometimes cause pumping, but it can be a little more transparent. Whereas if you've got a slower release, it's gonna really hold on to all of that. So let's have a fast attack and a slow release. Listen to how that sounds. So it's a lot thicker, it's a lot smoother. Let's do the opposite. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So this is a lot more upfront, it's a lot punchier, it feels a little more transparent as well. You can hear a little less of that compression, especially on the attack. So let's AB this with our VCA and our Opto. So first off, we've got our 1176, we've got our FET compressor. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Just make sure we're gain matched. On the edge, won't the world stop Okay, let's bring it down. Okay, so let's listen to our DBX versus the 1176. So this is a little more transparent. There's a little less of that mid-range energy and it's a, it's a little less aggressive. This has got a more spitty quality. Let's have a listen to that again, just this section. Listen to fast and falling and stop turning and then we'll AB that with the 1176. Now, if we wanted a little more of that spitty quality, we could be a little more aggressive with it. Get 
getting a little more of that transient information on fear we're falling. So we can create something similar, but this is going to give you that energy pretty much right off the bat. And of course, as you dial in the ratio, that's going to become even more aggressive and more upfront and more bitey. And we're only on a three to one. And to try and get something similar, we had to go on an eight or a 12 to one and dial in the attack and release. So there we have it. Let's go back to where we were. Okay, so let's AB the 1176 with our LA2A. LA2A. So this is a little more aggressive. I can hear some of the compression on the release compared to this, which is a lot less perceptible. It's a lot more transparent. And what you can do here, which is very, very common, and we'll talk about some of this later, is use compressors in series. So we could use the attack and release parameters here to catch the peaks like that. So fear we're falling, on the, edge, on the edge, we're kind of using this as a limiter, we're peak limiting, and then we can use the LA2A to smooth the rest of it out. So we can work around that as well. Of course, we want to bring the gain up as well a little bit just to match it. We're losing some gain with that gain reduction. And finally, let's talk about tube compressors. So I'm going to use the FG Mu for this. This is by Slate Digital. This is a kind of hybrid of a few different tube compressors, uh, the Fairchild and a couple others. So let's have a listen to how this sounds. We've got our input, we've got our threshold, we've got our makeup gain, we've got our attack and release, we've got our high pass filter. So if we want to get rid of some of the lows here so that that's not triggering the compressor, a lot of low end has more energy and that will get hit by the compressor before the rest of the information if you needed to do that let's say for example that you wanted to compress a drum group and you don't want to compress the kick you'd kind of dial that in so that you're missing the low lows of that kick and then we just have a mix knob so we can dial that in we have some stereo mid-side processing we'll leave that for another day so let's start dialing this in Stop turning, 
So we're getting a little bit of mid-range. We're accentuating some of that top end. It's adding a little bit of that air to it, which is nice. Let's listen to how this sounds compared to the 1176. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Just trying to gain match that a little better. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So we can hear a lot more compression here. There's a different tonal characteristic as well. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? There's a little more high end and high mid information here. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? There's a little more mid range information with the 1176. So it's affecting the tone as well. This sounds a little more compressed to my ears. I can hear it a little more compared to that. And it's just a, a touch more aggressive. It's just a slightly different sound. And that is kind of similar to the DBX 160. Let's have a listen to these two together. A lot more mid and low mid information. We're getting less of the, the high end, whereas this, on the edge, won't the world stop turning? especially on the S's, that kind of really bright brilliance, we're accentuating that with this compressor, which has a lot more presence to the vocals. So there you have it. There are a few of the different compressor types and their associated characteristics and a couple of different plugins to show you how these all fit into the different compressor types. So just quickly for Logic users, you have all of these really nicely put together with the stock Logic compressor, which is so awesome. So we've got a digital and then we've got our VCA, we've got our FET, we've got our vintage VCA, our classic VCA, our vintage FET, and our vintage Opto. So we've got a kind of LA-2A here. We've got our DBX-160 kind of vibe. We've got our 1176. And these are all just built in here. So you do not need to go and buy all of these plugins. You've got everything here ready for you. Most important parameters. When using compression on vocals, it's essential to understand the following parameters. 1. Threshold. The threshold determines the level at which compression begins to take effect. Any signal that exceeds the threshold will be subject to compression. Setting the threshold appropriately is crucial for controlling how much compression is applied to the vocals. Lowering the threshold will result in more compression, or raising it will reduce the amount of compression applied. 2. Ratio. The ratio determines the amount of gain reduction applied to the signal once it exceeds the threshold. For example, a ratio of 4 to 1 means that for every 4 decibels the signal exceeds the threshold, only 1 decibel will pass through the compressor. Adjusting the ratio allows you to control the intensity of compression. Higher ratios result in more aggressive compression, while lower ratios provide gentler compression. 3. Attack the attack time determines how quickly the compressor responds to signals that exceed the threshold. A fast attack time means the compressor reacts quickly to loud sounds, while a slower attack time allows transient peaks to pass through before compression kicks in. 
Setting the attack time appropriately is crucial for shaping the transient response and preserving the natural dynamics of the vocal. Fast attack times contain peaks and provide more consistent level control, while slower attack times can retain the punch and detail of the initial transients. Release. The release time determines how quickly the compressor returns to normal gain after the input signal falls below the threshold. A shorter release time means the compressor recovers more quickly, while a longer release time allows for a smoother and more transparent compression effect. Adjusting the release time helps to shape the envelope of the compressed signal and control the overall dynamic response. Shorter release times are more suitable for maintaining tight control and preventing pumping artifacts, while longer release times can enhance sustain and add warmth to vocals. 5. Makeup Gain The makeup gain control allows you to compensate for any volume reduction caused by compression. It boosts the level of the compressed signal to match the original input level or desired output level. Adjusting the gain makeup ensures that the overall level of the compressed vocal remains consistent with the rest of the mix. It allows you to achieve the desired balance between compression and overall volume without sacrificing clarity or dynamics. Understanding and properly adjusting these parameters allows you to effectively control the dynamics, tone and overall impact of the compressed vocals in your mix. Okay, so we have touched on this already, but I wanted to go in a little more depth with the parameters of compression. So let's talk about everything on here. So we've got threshold, which is at which point do you want the compression to kick in? You've got your ratio, which I think of as how powerful the compression is. If you're getting in your head about the numbers, I just like to think of it as if you're in a room with one person and you're against one person, you have to fight them, you know, you've got more of a chance of holding your own and maybe even against two people. When you go to three, four, five, eight, twelve, twenty, thirty, there's pretty much no chance you're going to win unless you're a ninja. But this is kind of how I like to think of it. And that's how I kind of learned compression in terms of ratio. Makeup game, making up the gain that's being lost with the gain reduction that's happening. Pro tip, just make sure auto gain is off as it tends to add more gain than is necessary. And then we've got attack release. You can auto release if you want. We've got fast attack, slow attack, fast release, slow release. We've got our input gain, our output gain, and knee, which is the transition between the compressed and non-compressed signal. So you can have a hard knee or a soft knee, and it's just telling the compressor how to react. And you can see that. So we've got a hard knee, soft knee, it's a lot more angular, a lot softer, and you can play around with how you want that to be. Oftentimes, I don't play around too much with knee, and there are a lot of compressors that don't have this option. So let's just start compressing our vocal. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So nothing's happening now, so I need to dial the threshold in, and you can see this little graphic here that is showing how the threshold is working under the hood. And then if we dial that knee in, you can see it's a lot less soft. So let's start compressing. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on. So you can see we're getting about 5 dB of gain reduction. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free. 10 dB. This is a very fast attack. Then staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. I gotta taste it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Let's, Let's mute those backing vocals for now. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help. So this is a really aggressive compression setting. Let's listen to the knee. 
On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're wrong. So with a hard knee, it's a little choppier when the compression kicks in and it's creating that compressed artifact that we might not really want if we want something sounding transparent. Whereas a softer knee, it flows a little more evenly between the compressed and uncompressed signal. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free falling on the precipice. And then as the ratio gets higher and higher, we can hear that compression clamping in a lot more. It's a lot stronger, it's a lot more forceful. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge without a care, we're on the brink. I gotta taste it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy, let's. So we've got this smooth feeling that we spoke about earlier with a fast attack and a slow release. We can do a slow attack and a fast release, get something a little more punchy. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free, falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge Without a care, we're on the brink I gotta taste it so, so sweet Sipping in your ecstasy So we can see and hear those releasing parts are very prominent There's, there's a little bit of pumping happening Those breaths are really prominent Let's A-B this On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So there's a lot more of a rhythmic articulation being accentuated here. So when people talk about using compression to accentuate rhythm, this is essentially what's happening. We're using the release to dial in the groove and the rhythm and we're accentuating that and then the attack is slower so we can allow that transient punch to come forward on the edge won't the world stop turning think of and then the other way around is to clamp down on it straight away and just hold on to it and smooth everything out on the edge won't the world stop turning Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. A B. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So we're losing a lot of that transient energy. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Pay attention to the consonants. Pay attention to the start of every single word in this phrase. Before. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Think of... It sounds dynamically a little more subdued. And that might be something that you're going for in the context of a certain mix. You want something to sound smoother, less spiky, less forward, less up front in terms of the transient energy and the consonants, or you might want to go the other way. Now, this is, of course, a very extreme example. I would very rarely do a 12 to 1 ratio unless I was doing some parallel compression and blending that into taste, which we will leave for a later tutorial. But this is essentially the parameters that you will get. And like we spoke about with the different models, there are some that don't have these parameters at all. So we've only got peak reduction, which is our threshold, and then gain, which is like our makeup gain, or our 1176, where we don't have a threshold, we just have input and output, and that's feeding the compressor, and then we're doing our makeup gain, making sure that the gain that's coming in is level matched, and then we're doing our attack and release. I've got our ratios here. So each compressor is slightly different, but understanding the fundamentals of all of these parameters, what they do and how they sound, 
will allow you to pick up a compressor like this and be able to reverse engineer this and be like, okay, cool. We've got our threshold. This must be our ratio. This must be our makeup gain. And that's all we've got. We've got no attack and release. We've got our mix knob and then we've just got our metering. Having that foundation is going to allow you to pretty much navigate any compressor. I wanted to take a second while we're here and talking about how different compressors look to just pull up the Distressor emulation FG Stress by Slate Digital. This is modeled on the Empirical Labs Distressor. We've got our input and our output like the 1176 and then we've got our attack and release. Fast attack at zero. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge. Fast attack, slow attack. On the edge, won't the world slow release? Turning. Fast release. But I can't help fall. Then we've got our ratio at the bottom. We've got some filter types. And then we've got some distortion types, which are really helpful too. We can play around with our ratio here. And then we've got our mix knob. So all of these compressors may look different, but you will very easily be able to navigate them once you have those foundational concepts in place. And once you understand how everything sounds and what it's doing, you'll be able to navigate everything far more easily. So go away, play around with these compression types, play around with these parameters more importantly, and most importantly of all, use your ears and be aggressive so that you can really hear what's happening and then dial it back. Common compression models. Some of the most common models of compression used on vocals include the following. LA-2A. The LA-2A is an optical compressor known for its smooth musical compression and warm tone. It's often used on vocals for its gentle leveling and transparent sound. 1176. The 1176 is a FET compressor known for its fast attack time, aggressive compression and punchy sound. Is popular on vocals for adding energy, presence, and character. DBX160. The DBX160 is a VCA compressor known for its versatility, transparent compression, and precise control. It's commonly used on vocals for general dynamic control and shaping. Empirical Labs Distressor. The Distressor is a versatile compressor known for its wide range of compression modes, including FET, opto and vintage. It's popular on vocals for its ability to add warmth, color and character. LA-3A. The LA-3A is an optical compressor similar to the LA-2A but with a faster attack time and more aggressive compression. It's favored on vocals for its smooth transparent compression and vintage vibe. SSL G-Series Bus Compressor. The SSL G-Series Bus Compressor is a VCA compressor known for its punchy, aggressive compression and solid state sound. It's commonly used on vocals for adding energy, presence and excitement and also gluing vocal buses together. Fairchild 670 is a tube compressor known for its rich warmth compression and vintage character. It's prized on vocals for its ability to add warmth, depth and colour. These are just a few examples of popular compression models used on vocals. Each compressor has its own unique sonic characteristics and applications, and the choice of compressor depends on the desired sound, style, and the context of the vocal performance. Compression for tone. Different compressor types affect the tone of vocals in distinct ways due to their unique circuitry, response characteristics, and sonic signatures. Let's walk through these compression types and talk about their associated characteristics and effect on tone. Optical compressors. Optical compressors like the LA-2A are a light dependent resistor. Optical compressors tend to impart a subtle coloration to vocals, adding warmth and smoothness. They're great for maintaining the natural dynamics and tonal balance of vocals while providing gentle level control. FET compressors. FET compressors can impart a punchy, upfront character to vocals, emphasizing transience and adding energy. They're great for adding presence and excitement to vocals, making them stand out in the mix. VCA compressors. 
VCA compressors tend to have a transparent and neutral tone, maintaining the natural character of the vocals while providing precise dynamic control. They're great for general dynamic shaping and leveling without adding coloration. Tube compressors. Tube compressors impart a distinct warmth, harmonics, and saturation to vocals, adding depth and character. They're great for adding vintage vibe and musicality to vocals. The choice of compressor type depends on the desired tone, style, and context of the vocal performance, with each type offering unique sonic characteristics and tonal shaping capabilities. In vocal production, the choice of compression type plays a significant role in shaping the tone, character, and overall sound of the vocals. And here's how different compressor types relate specifically to vocal production. Optical compressors are well suited for vocals in genres where a vintage or classic sound is desired, such as soul, R&B, or jazz. Useful for controlling dynamic range without introducing noticeable compression artifacts or coloration. Effect compressors are suitable for vocals in genres where a more aggressive upfront sound is desired, such as rock, pop, or hip hop, and great for enhancing the attack and transient response of vocals. VCA compressors are versatile and well suited for a wide range of vocal styles, and they offer a clean and precise compression. Tube compressors are ideal for vocals in genres where a rich, harmonic, saturated sound is desired, such as blues, rock, or folk. So these are just a couple of ideas on the genre applications and how this kind of relates to the practical application of deciding where you would want to pick a compressor for a certain style, a certain vocalist, and a certain direction that you're going in terms of production and vocal style. Multiband compression. What is multiband compression? Multiband compression is an advanced audio processing technique that divides the audio signal into multiple frequency bands and applies compression independently to each band. Unlike traditional single band compression, which treats the entire frequency spectrum as one entity, multiband compression allows for precise control over different frequency ranges within the audio signal. How does multiband compression work? Splitting the signal. The audio signal is split into multiple frequency bands using crossover filters. Each frequency band covers a specific range of frequencies such as bass, mid-range, and treble. Compression. A compressor is applied to each frequency band independently. This means that compression settings such as threshold, ratio, attack, and release can be adjusted separately for each band. Processing. Compression is applied dynamically to each frequency band based on the level of the signal within the band. This allows for targeted compression of specific frequency ranges, such as controlling low-end rumble, taming harsh mid-range frequencies, or smoothing out sibilance in the high end. Recombining the signal. After compression is applied to each frequency band, the processed bands are recombined to create the final compressed audio signal. Multiband compression offers several benefits in audio production, including the following. Greater control. Multiband compression allows for precise control over different frequency ranges within the audio signal, enabling engineers and producers to address specific tonal issues or enhance desired characteristics without affecting other frequency bands. Reduced pumping and artifacts. By compressing each frequency band independently, Multiband compression can reduce pumping and artifacts that may occur with broadband compression, particularly when dealing with complex audio material. Versatility. Multiband compression can be used for a wide range of audio processing tasks, including mastering, mixing, and sound design. It's especially useful for controlling dynamics in multi-track recordings or addressing frequency-specific issues in vocals, instruments, or mixes. Overall, multiband compression is a powerful tool for audio engineers and producers, offering enhanced control and flexibility in shaping the dynamics and tonal balance of audio signals across different frequency ranges. In vocal production, multiband compression offers several valuable applications, including the following. De-essing. Multiband compression can be used to specifically target and control sibilance in vocal recordings by compressing only the high frequency bands where sibilant sounds occur, typically around 5 kHz to 10 kHz. Multiband compression can effectively reduce harsh S's and SH sounds without affecting the rest of the vocal. 
Taming resonances. Vocal recordings may exhibit resonant frequencies that cause certain notes or syllables to sound harsh or boomy. Multiband compression allows engineers to isolate and compress specific frequency bands where resonances occur, helping to tame them and smooth out the overall vocal performance. Balancing tone. Multiband compression enables engineers and producers to independently adjust the dynamics of different frequency ranges within the vocal signal. This can be useful for balancing the tonal characteristics of the vocal, such as boosting the presence in the mid-range, while controlling excessive low-end rumble or harsh high frequencies. Controlling dynamics. Multiband compression offers precise control over the dynamics of vocals across different frequency ranges. Engineers can use it to tame peaks, even at volume inconsistencies, and maintain a consistent level of vocal performance without affecting the overall tonal balance. Enhancing clarity. By selectively compressing specific frequency bands, multiband compression can help enhance the clarity and intelligibility of vocals. It allows engineers to bring out subtle vocal details, such as whispers or softer phrases, while controlling louder sections to ensure they remain clear and articulate. Overall, multiband compression is a versatile tool in vocal production offering producers and engineers the flexibility to address specific tonal and dynamic issues, enhance vocal clarity and presence, and achieve a balanced and professional vocal sound. So let's cover multiband compression. I want to demonstrate how this works and when we would use it. We've spoken about it and you have already seen this in a few demonstrations, but let's dive in a little deeper. So we are essentially selecting frequency bands and independently compressing these. So let's say that we wanted to compress just the low mids. We've got our threshold, which is the same as normal compression, the point at which compression starts to kick in. The range, which is by how many decibels do we want this to be compressed. It's normally set at minus six. So you can dial that in to taste. The attack, how fast the compression kicks in. The release, how fast it releases and then the output. We've also got ratio that you can dial in as well. This is a four to one. We've got knee, hard and soft, and we've got look ahead. And we can compress or expand. So let me demonstrate this right now. So you can see nothing is actually happening right now, but just listening to it in solo. And as I dial in, now you can see that the compression is kicking in. I got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Let's break out, break. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So I want to do some compression here too. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. I want to retain a little bit of that low mid energy, just a touch more. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So we're independently manipulating each one of these frequency ranges and then we're dialing in the compression to taste and for what this particular vocal signal needs in this moment. So I like the smoothness of this mid-range being compressed a little more than this low end and of course contextually we'd make decisions as well. So, so sweet, in your ecstasy. 
So let's listen to it with and without. So this is it without. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of a free falling on the precipice. And with. So it sounds a little brighter, a little more present, and it also sits nicely into the music itself because what we're doing is we're finding these build-ups and these resonances within this frequency range, and we're making sure that if they peak out a little too much, they're being attenuated, and that is creating the perception of a smoother tonal characteristic on the vocal, which helps it to sit within the music because nothing's poking out too much which is the whole goal of dynamic and tonal work on vocals and on any instrument is to help everything fit together and feel like it's within rather than on top of or behind so that is essentially the whole idea of multiband compression you can use it to ds which is essentially what a de is. It's just working predominantly in the range that sibilance is occupying. And then you dial in the threshold, the range, attack release in some instances, and you just attenuate those S's. And this just gives you a lot more flexibility. But a multiband compressor has a lot more parameters and it covers the whole frequency spectrum as opposed to just one range. So there you have it, that is multiband compression. It is a great tool for more transparent sounding vocals. It's also great for creating that smooth tonal characteristic that is identifiable in a lot of popular songs. de what is a de -esser? A de is an audio processor used in music production and audio engineering to reduce or remove excessive sibilance from vocal recordings. Sibilance refers to the harsh s and sh sounds produced when pronouncing certain consonants like s, z, sh, and ch. These sounds can be distracting or unpleasant to the listener if they are overly pronounced or exaggerated in vocal recordings. How it works. A de works by detecting the frequencies associated with sibilant sounds and then applying dynamic equalization or compression to reduce their intensity. Here's how it typically works. Detection. The de analyzes the incoming audio signal to identify frequencies that exhibit sibilant characteristics. These frequencies usually fall within the range of 4kHz to 10kHz. Although this can vary depending on the individual's voice and recording conditions. Processing. Once the sibilant frequencies are detected, the de applies processing to attenuate or compress these frequencies selectively. This can involve using a dynamic equalizer to reduce the level of sibilant frequencies when they exceed a certain threshold, or applying dynamic compression to smooth out their amplitude variations. Adjustment. Most de plugins provide control for adjusting parameters such as the frequency range threshold and processing intensity. These controls allow the user to fine-tune the DS's response to match the characteristics of the vocal recording and achieve a natural sounding result. Integration. The DSR is typically inserted into the vocal signal chain as a plug-in within your door or as an outboard hardware unit in a recording studio. It can be applied to individual vocal tracks during mixing or used in real time during vocal recording to prevent excessive sibilance from being captured in the first place. 
Overall, a DSR is an invaluable tool for achieving clean and polished vocal recordings by controlling sibilance and ensuring that the vocals remain clear and intelligible without distracting harshness or excessive emphasis on sibilant sound. DSR parameters. DSR parameters allow users to adjust the behavior of the DSR plugin to effectively target and reduce sibilance in vocals. Here are some of the common DSR parameters and their meanings. Frequency range. This parameter specifies the range of frequencies that the DSR will target for processing. Sibilant sounds typically occur in the higher frequency range, often between 4 kHz and 10 kHz. The frequency range control allows users to focus the DSR's processing on specific frequency bands where sibilance is most prominent. Threshold. The threshold determines the level at which the DSR begins to attenuate or compress sibilant frequencies. When the input signal exceeds the threshold level in the specified frequency range, the DSR activates and applies processing to reduce the sibilance. Adjusting the threshold control allows users to set the sensitivity of the DSR and fine tune its response to match the level of sibilance in the vocal recording. Detection mode. Some DSR plugins offer different detection modes or algorithms for identifying sibilant frequencies. Common detection modes include peak detection, RMS detection, and spectral analysis. Peak detection responds to transient peaks in the signal, while RMS detection analyzes the overall level of the signal over time. Spectral analysis examines the frequency content of the signal to identify sibilant frequencies more accurately. Choosing the appropriate detection mode can help improve the accuracy and effectiveness of the DSR in reducing sibilance in the most transparent way possible. Processing type. DSR plugins may offer different processing types or modes for reducing sibilance. Common processing types include dynamic equalization, compression, and frequency dependent gain reduction. Dynamic equalization attenuates sibilant frequencies using a parametric EQ curve that responds dynamically to change in the input signal. Compression applies gain reduction to sibilant frequencies when they exceed the threshold level. Frequency dependent gain reduction applies varying amounts of gain reduction to different frequency bands, allowing for more precise control over sibilance reduction. Attack and release time. These parameters, much like a compressor, control the speed at which the DSR responds to changes in the input signal. The attack time determines how quickly the DSR engages when sibilant frequencies exceed the threshold level, while the release time determines how quickly the DSR disengages once the input signal falls below the threshold. Adjusting the attack and release times can affect the transient response and overall transparency of the DSR's processing. Ratio. In DSA plugins that use compression for sibilance reduction, the ratio parameter determines the amount of gain reduction applied to sibilant frequencies above the threshold level. A higher ratio setting results in more aggressive compression, while a lower ratio setting allows for more subtle processing. Adjusting the ratio control can help achieve the desired balance between sibilance reduction and naturalness in the vocal sound. By understanding and adjusting these DSA parameters, you can effectively control and reduce sibilance in vocal recordings, ensuring that the vocals sound clear, natural, and intelligible without distracting harshness or excessive emphasis on sibilant sounds. Let's cover the parameters of a DSR. So much like a compressor, we have a threshold, the range with which you start to attenuate the sibilance, then max reduction is by how many decibels do you want it to be reduced? The lower, the less you're gonna get reduction. The higher the number, the more aggressive the reduction is gonna be. Then you have the frequency range. What area do you want to be targeting? Then you have range split versus wide. So wide means that the entire frequency range is going to be attenuated altogether, so the lows, mids, and highs, whereas split range means that the focus is gonna be on the sibilant range. So that's going to be reduced independently of the entire frequency range. So that can be a lot more transparent. And then you have this filter types, so we've got a shelf 
and a bell and then filter solo so you can audition the sibilance. So let's have a listen to these parameters in action. So we'll just start dialing things in. So dialing in that max reduction a little too much, bringing the threshold down too much is starting to dull the overall frequency range and it's making it sound a lot less present. So we want to retain that and just mitigate those frequencies that are a little too harsh and too sibilant. So let's play around with these filters. That makes it a little duller. Let's listen to the difference. This is with the shelf. It's getting rid of more of the sibilance, but it's also dulling the tone of the vocal a little too much. That's bringing down everything independently. It's completely compressing the whole signal, which we don't want at all. So at this point would be where I would dial in a little more air potentially. So we're adding a little more of that presence back after the fact because we're losing a bit of what we love about this vocal with too much of this de-essing. So let me walk you through uh, another de-esser, the one that I use most often. You saw me use this earlier on. I just wanted to walk you through the parameters just so you have a better understanding of this particular plugin. So all the same stuff. We've got our threshold, we've got our range. We've got our audition function, which is the equivalent of our filter solo. And our frequency range is here. So we slide that around. And then we have some more advanced parameters, some side chain, single vocal all round, wide band, split band. So let's have a listen to that. Stand, stand. So there's some really aggressive de happening here, but it's a little more transparent. Well, quite a lot more transparent in my opinion compared to this tool here. Our range is 60B. Let's play around with split versus wide band, see if the split band makes it a little more transparent. Stand, stand. So with this particular plugin, the algorithm of single vocal works transparently with wideband, which is slightly different to the other de -esser. So typically with a lot of other de you would go for split band, but in this particular instance, right out the box, single vocal and wideband work a lot more transparently with Pro DS. Let's put it to all round and we'll probably get a similar effect. So you can see everything now is being reduced. Whereas before, 
you're getting this lovely representation of the sibilance. You can see it's just the sibilance that's being targeted. So if we go to all round split band, we'll get a similar result. So you can see that it is leaving some of that signal alone, but it's getting a lot more of that signal that we don't want. It's targeting the sibilance, but it's also getting rid of a lot of that energy and presence that we want to retain. So single vocal wideband is definitely the way to go with this particular tool. So we can hear the sibilance being targeted here with this little solo button and we can also audition. Definitely sipping, you see a huge amount of energy there. So this is DSing in a nutshell. It's a pretty simple concept to get your head around and with a little bit of tweaking and some experience, you'll be able to dial these in very quickly and get a nice transparent sound. All right, using everything that we have spoken about so far in terms of compression and de-essing and multiband compression, I wanna just walk you through mixing this section of this lead vocal. So let's get started and just dive right in. So earlier on, we made this decision to DS when we were in the EQ phase. So I'm not going to change too much here. I'm just gonna have a listen to where we were at and then make some decisions from there. Let's turn that off. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the break. Gotta taste it so, so sweet. Sip it in your ecstasy. Okay, I might revisit that in a bit. Remember, we did a little bit of this DSing here as well. Okay, I could hear that there was something funky happening here. So I'm going to try and let the DSer do the heavy lifting here. Much better. Okay, let's move on to compression now. I typically like to DS here and then do my enhancement after on the edge won't the world stop turning okay on the edge won't the world stop turning thinking fast but i can't help falling feel we're on the verge of it free falling on the precipice stand staring at the edge without a care we're on the break gotta taste it so so Okay, so we've got fast attack, fast release ish. It is fast, not super, super fast. Four to one ratio, getting about minus five to minus seven dB of gain reduction at the loudest part. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring. Okay, and now I want to do On the edge won't the world stop turning Thinking fast but I can't help falling Feel we're on the verge of it free Falling on the precipice Stand staring at the edge Without a care we're on the break Gotta taste it so so sweet Sip it in your ecstasy Okay I can hear some of that sibilance, it's still bugging me, and I'm going to use Soothe for this. We have gone over Soothe earlier on in this section, so you know how to use this. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring. Sweet, in your ecstasy. 
I probably could have made a, a better decision earlier on to play around with the sibilance a little more. Bearing in mind this is a scratch track, so we've recorded this in and then we'll re-record this, probably with a different microphone and uh, go through a slightly different vocal chain and do the editing and the gain automation that we spoke about earlier on. This is just right off the bat some real rough comps just to get us going. So there would be some pushback on my end of making sure that I clip gain this and that I had the best editing that I could have. So this just goes to show you that it's so important to get things right in the recording phase and not relying so heavily on mixing to fix stuff. Anyway, we can move on. Let's see where we're at. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge without a Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Okay, let's see where we're at here. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Okay, I just want to bring this up because this is getting lost. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free fall. Okay, let's just fade that. Much better though. Verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So sometimes when you're using compression and then you realize I'm still losing words, that's when you would have to go back and start clip gaining stuff and preparing the audio for compression as opposed to thinking compression is just gonna be your saving grace. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feet, won't the world stop turning? So there's no avoiding this, you know, it's really the attention to detail. And in this instance, I've just got to do it. And this is why editing is so important because when you start adding compression, all of the stuff that you think didn't matter starts to come up and that's a telltale sign of vocals that haven't had the attention that they deserve. Bring that down a little more. The sweet sipping in your ecstasy. Yes. Right. Nice. Much better. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it. Free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Okay, so let's do a little before and after again of the 
dynamic processing we've done so far. So this is before. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of a free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. Sip it in your ecstasy. Yes. And after. Okay, so what you're seeing is as I'm dialing in the dynamic processing, I am also revisiting the earlier choices, some EQ decisions that I made, some de-essing, and I'm making sure that everything is working really nicely and cohesively. And I'm revisiting those steps to make sure that the vocals are going exactly in the right direction that I want to go in and also mitigating different tonal profiles that are happening with using these analog modeled compressors and other analog modeled units. When I was using these, I was starting to hear that that high end and high mid energy was being accentuated a little more. And I didn't necessarily need those highs to be pushed as much. And also with the multiband compression, it made me want to revisit the tonal profile of what's going on here. And I wanted to add a little more 2.5K and a little bit more of that 650 just to fill things out and also make sure that things aren't feeling flubby and too low mid heavy. So the two go hand in hand. It's not exclusively EQ and then compression. The two are just as important as each other and go together. And as you become more experienced, you will have this kind of gut reaction to things where you don't necessarily need to be so formulaic in going, okay, I need to EQ first and then I need to add compression and then saturation or I need to limit first and then go into compression. You kind of just start to hear problems as they arise, mitigate them, and then listen to how you can enhance things and then think from the mindset of problems, fix those first, and then how can I enhance? And then it's just those two things and you just instinctually start to work through those. What is saturation? Saturation is an audio processing effect that introduces harmonic distortion to audio signals, mimicking the characteristics of analog tape, tubes or other analog hardware. 
It adds harmonics to the original audio signal, altering its timbre and texture, and often resulting in a warmer, fuller, and more pleasing sound. How does it work? Saturation works by introducing harmonic distortion to a desired audio signal, altering the waveform and its tonal characteristics. Here's how it typically works. Soft clipping. Saturation often involves a form of soft clipping where the peaks of the audio signal are gently rounded off rather than abruptly clipped. When the signal exceeds a certain level, the waveform is smoothly compressed, resulting in a more rounded shape rather than a flat, clipped top. This soft clipping creates harmonics, which are additional frequencies that are multiples of the original signal's frequencies. Harmonic generation. As the audio signal passes through a saturator, non-linearities in the processing circuitry cause the generation of harmonics. And these harmonics add complexity to the sound by introducing frequencies that were not present in the original signal. The amount and type of harmonic distortion depends on various factors including the saturation algorithm, the input level, and the settings of the saturator. Dynamic response. Different saturators have varying dynamic responses, meaning they may react differently to changes in input level. Some saturators respond dynamically to the input signal, adjusting the amount of distortion based on its amplitude. This dynamic response can add further musicality and complexity to the saturation effect. Frequency dependence. Some saturators are designed to emphasize certain frequency ranges more than others. For example, tape saturation plugins often accentuate low frequencies, while tube saturation plugins may emphasize mid-range frequencies. This frequency dependence can contribute to the characteristic tone and coloration of the saturation effect. Mix control. Many saturation plugins include a mix control knob, allowing users to blend the saturated signal with the dry, unprocessed signal. This provides flexibility in how much saturation is applied to the audio signal, from subtle harmonic enhancement to more pronounced distortion effects. How does it relate to vocal production? In vocal production, saturation can play a significant role in shaping the tone, texture, and overall character of the vocals, warmth, and depth. Saturation can add warmth and depth to vocal recordings by introducing harmonics and subtle distortion. This can help to enrich the sound of the vocals, making them sound more full-bodied and organic, particularly in genres like soul, jazz, or folk, where a warm and vintage sound is desired. Tonal enhancement. Saturation can enhance the tonal characteristics of vocals, adding richness and coloration to the sound. By emphasizing certain harmonics and frequencies, saturation can help vocals cut through the mix and stand out while maintaining a natural and pleasing tonal balance. Character and texture. Saturation can impart a distinctive character and texture to vocals, giving them a sense of character and personality. Whether it's the subtle warmth of tape saturation, the gritty edge of tube saturation, or the smooth saturation of analog hardware, different saturation types can add unique sonic qualities to vocals, making them more interesting and engaging to listen to. Glue and cohesion. Saturation can act as a sonic glue blending individual vocal tracks with the rest of the mix and creating a cohesive sound. By adding harmonics and subtle compression, saturation can help vocals sit better in the mix and contribute to a more unified and cohesive overall sound. Emulation and vintage equipment. Saturation plugins often include emulations of vintage analog equipment, such as tape machines, tube preamps, or analog consoles. These emulations can provide authentic vintage sounds and textures, allowing producers to create the sonic characteristics of classic recordings and add a nostalgic vibe to modern vocal productions. Overall, saturation is a versatile tool in vocal production, offering a wide range of creative possibilities for shaping the tone, texture, and character of vocal recordings. Whether used subtly to add warmth and depth or more aggressively to create unique sonic effects, saturation can enhance the overall quality and impact of vocal performances in music production.
Let me demonstrate saturation, but before I talk about its applications with vocal mixing and vocal production, I want to just demonstrate the idea of adding harmonics. Sometimes it can be difficult to think of that concept, so having a nice visual representation can be really helpful. So for this I'm just going to use a simple sine wave. We've got our fundamental here, and this is just the sign as it is. Now I want to add some saturation and show you visually how we start to add harmonics to it. So before we have this. And let's put our EQ after. Look at all these harmonics. And there's also a representation here of that too. So let's turn it off. We've just got our fundamental sign. And now we've got our harmonics. So that is a visual representation of what that actually looks like and what that sounds like. So you can hear that there is a clear difference in the tonal characteristics. It sounds fuller, it sounds more aggressive. Again, there's a lot more bite to it, there's a lot more presence, there's a lot of more upper mid harmonics. So let's walk through saturation with these vocals in mind. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel me on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So there is an example of some extreme saturation. Things are distorting. We're getting this crunch, and this is something that we could use in certain genres, in songs that have more aggression, and we can also use saturation to dirty sounds up and add a lot more of this broken and distorted sound. But in the context of filling out the frequency range of this vocal, let's just kind of dial this in. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge Without a care we're on the brink I gotta taste it so so sweet Sipping in your ecstasy Let's So it sounds a little fuller, a little more alive Let's try and A-B that again And now this is a little more subtle So don't worry if you can't hear this straight away On the edge won't the world stop turning on the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So things feel a little more forward, a little more present, a little fuller. So I'm just using Fab Filter Satin for this. There's a ton of different saturation settings on here. Transformers, effects. I'm using Warm Tape, which is just what comes out of the box with this. Let's try old tape. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So what's really nice here is it's actually... On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help... It's soaking up a lot of that sibilance, which is really nice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So, if I wanted something that sounded a little more vintage, was a little less bright, I could play around with adding old tape. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the. That's giving it a lot more of this kind of analog vibe where you can actually hear the distortion okay rather the saturation so this is creating a little more character and this analog vibe where you can actually hear the saturation happening it's a little more prominent on the edge won't the world stop turning 
Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Let's try a couple other clean tape. How does this sound? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge Without a care we're on the brink I gotta taste it so so sweet Sipping in your ecstasy Let's On the edge won't the world stop turning Thinking fast but I can't help falling Feel we're on the verge of it Free falling on the precipice Stand staring at the edge Without a care we're on the brink I gotta taste it so So it's really subtle but we're getting a little bit more of these harmonics here that are just making the sound feel uh, a little fuller but it's not as drastic On the edge won't the world stop turning Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it. Look at this. Falling on the precipice. Stand staring at. All this comes back when we take the old tape with the drive up 50%. So it is soaking up the sibilance and the high end, like I mentioned, and that's a visual representation and evidence that that's actually what's happening, which is really interesting. Let's play with some heavy saturation. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel me on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. I gotta taste it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. Let's. So we're creating some bars. There's a lot more of a pronounced distortion around the mid range. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the. And that's it in parallel. So I'm just dialing in the mix. So the the wet of the distortion isn't a hundred percent. We've got the original signal now. There's no no saturation, and then I can dial that in. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it. Free. It's a little bit more character. There's more mid-range energy. It sounds a little more alive. So you could always play around with making something a little more crazily saturated and then blend that in as well. Let's have a listen to a few different saturation plugins. So this is a free plugin by Bedroom Producers Blog. We've got tube and tape saturation, and let's have a listen to how that sounds. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the brink. I gotta taste it so, so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy, let's. Now let's try tape. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So the tape, there's a lot more mid-range that's being saturated, and the tube. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? There's a lot more buzz and high end and sizzle that's being saturated. So the two types have different tonal characteristics and each will have its own applications. And now let's just look at some tape saturation. So I'm gonna use Abbey Road Vinyl for this. We've got a lot of parameters here. We've got input, output, drive, which is really what's gonna be adding this saturation. Let's turn the noise off, on off. And then we just have these different vinyl emulations and then we've got some other parameters here we don't need to worry too much about right now let's turn these off okay so let's just input some signal match that and then add some drive on the edge won't the world stop turning 
thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge Without a care we're on the brink I got a taste it's so so sweet Sipping in your ecstasy Let's On the edge won't the world stop turning So these have different tonal characteristics Listen to the difference between lacquer and print On the edge won't the world stop turning on the edge, won't the world stop turning? It's a lot more low mid and mid range heavy in terms of how it's being saturated and where those harmonics are coming forward. And then the lacquer is slightly different. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? It's a lot more high mid and highs that are being saturated. And then the turntable. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge. A little more air, a little less. On the edge, won't. And then the cartridges. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So we've got some slightly different tonal characteristics with the arm, and you can also mess around with the tone arm. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So more high in that way. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? A little more mid-range that way. This is very subtle stuff. But the main thing I want you to pay attention to is the drive here. And now I want to kind of dial that in a little more subtly and A, B it. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge, without a care, we're on the brink. I got a taste, it's so, so sweet. So it sounds more present, and what's really interesting here is we're not actually getting any more gain. So let's have a look at this. Volume. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? 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 On the edge, won't the world stop? Let's just. On the edge, won't the world. Let's actually turn that down a little bit to make it as bang on as possible. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? 13.7. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? 13.6. But let's have a listen to how much more forward and present this sounds. Before? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? It feels a lot more forward, it feels a lot fuller, it feels more present, and it feels like it's in your face. And what's amazing about this is we're not getting any louder. However, the way we're perceiving it because of the tonal profile and the harmonics that this is adding, we're perceiving this as being louder and fuller. And this is the secret source and beauty of saturation. So you can use saturation when you want to make your vocal sound more full, more upfront, more present, while also keeping the level the same, but increasing the perceived loudness and forwardness of your vocals. So they're going to sit within the mix really nicely, but they're also going to feel nice and upfront. So it's totally up to you what you want to explore. You've got tape emulation. There's also plugins like Decapitator. We've got some different preamp emulation styles some tonal characteristics here, mix knob, punish mode, which adds a ton more grit to it. You can play around with Saturn, which has some more advanced parameters where we can actually do multiband saturation. So much like a multiband compressor, you can just saturate certain frequency ranges. This is really helpful if you want to add presence within a certain frequency range with your vocals or with another instrument. Good example is something like an 808 or a bass that you want to cut through the mix, you can just saturate that mid-range area that is going to help it cut through the speakers around here and drive that up. 
But that's beyond the scope of this course. Saturation and distortion deserves a whole course on its own, which will, I'm sure, be coming up soon. And of course, you can just go for your free plugin, like the Bedroom Producers blog one that I shared. There are a ton of great saturation plugins that are free and that come with stock doors as well. So don't feel like you need to go out and buy these, but by all means, get a trial for these, play around with them, see how you feel, see whether they fit into your workflow and they suit the style, genre, direction that you're going in, in terms of your production and mixing. And that's it for saturation. Limiting. What is limiting? Limiting is an audio processing technique used to prevent the amplitude of an audio signal from exceeding a certain threshold level, often referred to as the ceiling. It works by reducing the gain of the signal when it reaches or exceeds the threshold, effectively limiting its peak amplitude and preventing clipping or distortion. How does it work? Here is a walkthrough of how limiting works. Threshold. A threshold level is set, typically expressed in decibels, above which the limiting action takes effect. Any part of the audio signal that exceeds this threshold will be subjected to gain reduction. Gain reduction. When the amplitude of the audio signal crosses the threshold, the limiter automatically reduces the signal's gain to prevent it from exceeding the threshold level. The amount of gain reduction applied is determined by the limiter's settings, such as the ratio and release time. Attack time. The attack time of the limiter determines how quickly it responds to signals that exceed the threshold. A fast attack time allows the limiter to react quickly to sudden peaks, while a slower attack time may allow transient peaks to pass through before gain reduction is applied. Release time. The release time of the limiter determines how quickly it returns to normal gain after the signal falls below the threshold. A shorter release time results in faster recovery to normal gain, while a longer release time may allow the gain to remain reduced for a longer duration. The ceiling level specifies the maximum amplitude to which the signal is limited. Any peaks in the audio signal that would exceed this level are effectively limited to the ceiling, preventing clipping and distortion. How does it relate to vocal production? Limiting is a crucial tool in vocal production, particularly in scenarios where vocal recordings need to be controlled to ensure consistency, clarity, and to prevent clipping or distortion. Dynamic control. Limiting helps control the dynamic range of a vocal recording by preventing sudden peaks or spikes in volume. This ensures that the vocal performance remains consistent in volume and intensity, making it easier to mix and ensure that the vocals are audible and present in the final mix. Prevention of clipping. Vocal recordings can sometimes have peaks that exceed the maximum allowable level, leading to clipping or distortion. Limiting prevents these peaks from exceeding a specified threshold level, ensuring that the vocal signals remain within a safe range and avoid any unwanted distortion that could degrade the quality of the recording. Now, a quick caveat here, we are assuming that all of the work and information that we've set you up for so far will never bring you to a place where you would need to use a limiter to prevent clipping. But in some instances, particularly in mastering, where you are trying to get an overall mix to a certain level of loudness, there is distortion that will occur when you push it over a certain level. So limiting allows you to do that in a more transparent way. But in the context of vocals, you'd want to push back to your recording level and make sure that you're hitting that peak between minus 10 and minus 60 B as we spoke about in section one. Increased loudness. Limiting allows vocal recordings to be pushed closer to their maximum level without clipping, thereby increasing the perceived loudness of the vocals. And this is particularly useful in situations where vocals need to stand out in the mix or compete with other elements in a dense arrangement. Consistency in performance. Limiting helps ensure that vocal performances maintain a consistent level of volume and intensity. This is important for maintaining listener engagement and ensuring that the message or performance is delivered effectively without any sudden changes in volume or dynamics. Overall, limiting plays a crucial role in vocal production by providing dynamic control, preventing clipping, increasing loudness, and ensuring consistency in vocal performances. It's an essential tool for achieving professional quality vocal recordings in various audio production contexts.
All right, let's talk through limiting. This should be pretty straightforward as we have already gone through compression in detail. And I like to think as limiting as a more simple form of compression in the sense that you can be a lot more limited, pun intended, with the parameters that you can dial in. And you often have fixed parameters like this limiter here. So all we have here is our threshold and our gain. I like to link this. And what the whole goal of limiting in context with vocals is to limit the peaks, which I showed you earlier on with the 1176 peak limiting, where you've got a fast attack and a fast release and quite a, an aggressive ratio. And you're just limiting those peaks coming through by a couple of decibels to set the stage for a smoother dynamic range before going into compression. Of course, we try to mitigate this as much as possible with clip gain automation in our editing phase and in preparation for vocal production and mixing, but we can also use a limiter to do this and sometimes you have to do that anyway. And this is a great example of a real scenario in which I've had to use a limiter. Let's have a listen to this particular section here. So on this ba here, we've got a peak that is hitting a little too hard. So I wanna use a limiter before going into any compression. So let's have a look at this phrase here and we'll see that the only thing that's being limited is that particular section, which has a peak that needs to be tamed. So we can use limiting to mitigate any peaks, any rogue peaks that are unhelpful, distracting, are spiking a little too aggressively. So I wanted to show you another limiter which has a lot more going on. We've got attack release and kind of walk you through doing the same thing as the loud max limiter. So we'd push the gain in until we get the desired gain reduction on that section. So it's not happening yet. Let's just loop this section. Great. Make that transparent. Great. Slightly faster attack time. And then we're just going to put the output to... So we've got a little peak here as well. So we're just limiting that peak there, which is making everything a little smoother dynamically. And this is really transparent. We can even play around with the attack settings a little more. I prefer them where they were. It's a little more transparent to my ears. So let's listen to that with and without. It's very subtle, but what I'm hearing is 
the tendency to have too much of a dynamic range within the vocal performance can sometimes sound a little karaoke-ish. It sounds like things are weaving underneath and sticking out too much. And we're just mitigating that a little bit, particularly in this style, this genre, where we want things to retain their dynamic range or at least feel that they have retained their dynamic range, but also feel easy to listen to and smooth for the listener. So that is limiting in a nutshell. It doesn't really get more complex than that when it comes to the reason we use it with vocals. Of course, with mastering, there's a little more that you can go into. And we have a whole mastering course that covers all of that in detail. So you can check that out later on. Parallel processing. What is parallel processing? Parallel processing, also known as parallel compression or New York compression, is a technique used in audio engineering and mixing to blend a heavily processed signal with the original dry signal. This technique involves duplicating the original audio signal applying heavy compression or other processing in the duplicated signal and then blending the processed signal back with the original dry signal. Here's how parallel processing works. First, you duplicate the signal. The original audio signal is duplicated, creating two identical copies of the audio track. Second, you apply processing. Heavy compression or other processing techniques such as equalization, saturation or distortion are applied to one of the duplicated signals. The processing is usually more extreme than what you would apply directly to the original signal. And step three, we blend the signals. The processed signal is then blended back with the original dry signal using a fader or mixer. The blend control allows the engineer to adjust the balance between the processed and dry signals, determining the amount of processing applied to the overall sound. The key benefit of parallel processing is that it allows for the enhancement of the original signal without completely altering its dynamic range or sonic characteristics. By blending the heavily processed signal with the dry signal, engineers can achieve a more dynamic and punchy sound while still retaining the natural dynamics and nuances of the original performance. Parallel processing is commonly used in various aspects of audio and vocal production, including the following. Compression. Parallel compression is a popular technique used to add weight, presence, and impact to individuals' tracks or the overall mix. By blending a heavily compressed signal with the original dry signal, engineers and producers can achieve greater control over the dynamics of the mix while preserving the natural transients and nuances of the original performance. Equalization. Parallel equalization involves applying EQ to one of the duplicated signals to shape its tonal characteristics, such as boosting or cutting specific frequencies. By blending the EQ'd signal with the dry signal, engineers can achieve tonal balance and enhancement without compromising the integrity of the original sound. Saturation and distortion. Parallel saturation and distortion techniques involve adding harmonic richness and coloration to the audio signal by applying saturation or distortion effects to one of the duplicated signals. This can help to add warmth, depth, and character to individual tracks or the overall mix, enhancing the sonic texture and vibe of the music. Overall, parallel processing is a powerful technique used by audio engineers and producers to enhance the dynamics, tonal balance and overall impact of audio recordings and mixes. By blending heavily processed signals with the original dry signals, engineers can achieve greater control and creativity in shaping the sound and achieving the desired sonic aesthetic. So we've touched on parallel compression a little bit in some of the compression demonstrations, but I wanted to do a little demo to show you that in a little more detail. So there are two ways that we can dial in parallel compression. You can do that via a send, where you put a compressor on a bus, and then you can dial in on the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So I've just dialed this in 
We're getting about minus 10 dB of gain reduction. We've got a really aggressive ratio. We can make the knee harder. Maybe around here. I'm going to do a slow attack and fast release to accentuate the groove. And then let's try and blend that in. So I've got the send all the way to zero. And then I want to blend that in with the volume. You can do it like this. It's just my personal preference of how I like to do it. So para comp. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free. Let's get rid of our sign. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free. Falling on the precipice. So it feels a lot fuller. We're getting a little bit of room with the release and how aggressive the ratio is which is something that I need to decide if I like. Personally, I think not. We are also getting some coloration from this distortion on here. So I've put it on hard, I can put it on soft and make it a little less aggressive and maybe just pull that back a little bit. Can play around with some different compression models. Stop turning, thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free, falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge, without a care, we're on the break. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet, sipping in your ecstasy. Yes. On the edge, won't the world stop turning, thinking fast, but I can't help. And we're not getting any gain and it sounds louder so we're getting the beautiful effects of a little bit of saturation and this aggressive setting being blended in is adding to this perceived loudness and fullness without us actually getting louder which is exactly what we want we want to always aim for perceived loudness and maintaining as much headroom as possible so that we have everything in a nice balanced state so that when it comes to mastering we have as much headroom to work with so we can make the necessary enhancements so we're always working with the end in mind which is the whole premise of our reverse engineer program where we start with mastering then mixing then production so we're always working forwards with the end in mind and knowing where we're going to get so let's just A-B this a couple of times. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? I mean, it's night and day. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free, falling on the precipice. I dig that. So there's a couple extra things you could do here. You're not just limited to compression you can shape some of the tone on the edge won't the world stop turning thinking fast but i can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free falling on the precipice stand staring at the edge without a care we're on the break got a taste it's so so sweet sipping in your ecstasy so I, if I wanted to add a little more of that 1K, I can do that and do that really aggressively and pair that with the compression and we get some more mid-range forwardness and also the coloration of this and also the dynamic control that we've got going on here where we're accentuating the groove of this rhythmic verse. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel Let's go one step further. I want to bring something else in here. Maybe some OTT. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help fall and feel we're on the verge of it free, falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge. Without a care, we're on the break. Got a taste, it's so, so sweet. 
How about? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge, without a care, we're on the break. Got a taste, it's so so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. So I want to accentuate some of that low and mid energy, and I'm not really that fussed about the highs. We've kind of worked on that with the EQ moves that we've done. So let's turn this on and off. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Okay, now with the parallel processing. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Off. On. So we've got slightly different tonal characteristics. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? On the edge, won't the world stop turning? I'm not that keen on OTT in this instance, but as an example, just to kind of show you what you could do, let's maybe add Saturn. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel And of course, I can dial this into taste as well. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? So this is just the parallel. And help falling, feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. So we can push that even further. On the edge, won't the world stop turning? Thinking fast, but I can't help falling. Feel we're on the verge of it, free falling on the precipice. Stand staring at the edge, without a care, we're on the break. Got a taste, it's so so sweet. Sipping in your ecstasy. So that is an example of what you can do with parallel processing. And the sky really is the limit. You can do anything with parallel processing. You can shape the tone. You can add grit. You can add character. You can add modulation. You can add pitch shifting. You can add spatial effects and just blend those in to taste. And that is how you can create more interesting, sophisticated vocal effects and vocal chains and in this instance, this is how you can subtly add more sweetness, more presence, more energy, and really start to accentuate your vocal in the mix. As we wrap up this lesson, I have an action item for you. Using everything that we've spoken about so far in this lesson, EQ, compression, limiting, saturation and parallel processing go away and start mixing vocals with these tools if you can pick three different vocal tracks from three different songs and go through the process of adding eq compression limiting saturation and parallel processing on each and experiment you can be aggressive you can be subtle the whole point is for you to really just understand these tools and how they affect the vocal signal spatial processing reverb and delay what is reverb reverb short for reverberation is a natural phenomenon that occurs when sound waves reflect off surfaces in an environment creating a complex pattern of multiple rapidly decaying echoes in audio production, reverb refers to the artificial replication or simulation of this phenomenon using electronic or digital means. It's used to add depth, dimension, and a sense of space to audio recordings. How does it work? 
Here's how reverb works in audio production. Reflections. In a real acoustic space, sound waves emitted from a source such as a vocalist or instrument bounce off surfaces like walls, floors, and ceilings. These reflections blend together, creating a dense network of echoes that give the perception of space and ambience. Early reflections. The initial reflections of sound waves arrive at the listener's ears within a very short time after the direct sound. These early reflections provide spatial cues about the size and shape of the environment. Reverberation. As sound waves continue to reflect off surfaces, they gradually lose energy due to absorption and diffusion, resulting in a decay of reverberation over time. This decay is characterized by a rapid initial decay followed by a more gradual fade out, creating a sense of a tail or wash that lingers after the direct sound has ceased. In audio production, reverb is generated using specialized hardware units or digital signal processing, DSP, algorithms known as reverb plugins. These plugins simulate the characteristics of different acoustic environments, such as concert halls, recording studios, churches, or chambers. They allow producers and engineers to adjust parameters such as room size, decay time, early reflections, and diffusion to tailor the reverb effect to suit the desired aesthetic and context of the audio material. How is it used? Reverb is used in various ways in audio production, including the following. Creating realism. Reverb adds a sense of realism to recorded audio by simulating the acoustic characteristics of different environments. It can make vocals and instruments sound as though they were recorded in a specific space, enhancing the listener's perception of depth and immersion. Enhancing depth and space. Reverb adds depth and dimension to audio recordings, creating a sense of space and distance between sound sources and the listener. It can help to separate individual elements in a mix, making them sound more three-dimensional and immersive. Adding ambience and mood. Reverb can be used creatively to evoke specific moods or atmospheres in music or film soundtracks. Different types of reverbs, such as lush hall reverbs, intimate room reverbs, or eerie plate reverbs, can help to set the tone and enhance the emotional impact of a piece of music. Overall, reverb is a versatile and essential tool in audio production. Different types of reverb. In audio production, there are several types of reverb that are commonly used, each with its own characteristics and sonic qualities. When applying reverb to vocals, it's essential to choose a reverb type that complements the vocal performance and enhances its presence and depth in the mix. Here are some common reverb types and their characteristics with an emphasis on vocals. Hall reverb. Hall reverbs simulate the reverberant sound of large concert halls or auditoriums. They typically have a spacious and immersive sound with a natural decay that creates a sense of depth and grandeur. Hall reverb can add a sense of drama and scale to vocal performances, making them sound larger than life and enhancing their presence in the mix. It's particularly well suited for ballads, classical music, or vocal performances that require a sense of space and airiness. Room reverb. Room reverbs simulate the acoustic characteristics of smaller, enclosed spaces such as recording studios, bedrooms, or live rooms. They tend to have a shorter decay time and a more intimate, focused sound compared to hall reverbs. Room reverb can add warmth and intimacy to vocal performances, making them sound more natural and immediate. It's suitable for genres like folk, acoustic, or jazz, where a close, intimate vocal sound is desired. Plate reverb. Plate reverbs simulate the sound of audio reflections bouncing off a large metal plate. They have a distinctive sound characterized by a smooth decay and lush, shimmering quality. Plate reverb can add a sense of richness and gloss to vocal performances, making them sound smooth and polished. It's often used in pop, rock, and R&B music to create a glossy, radio-friendly vocal sound. Chamber reverb. Chamber reverbs simulate the reverberant sound of small, acoustically treated rooms or chambers. They have a shorter decay time than hall reverbs, but offer a more focused and defined sense of space. 
Chamber reverbs can add clarity and definition to vocal performances, making them sound clear and articulate in the mix. It's suitable for genres like classical, choral, or vocal jazz, where precise articulation and clarity are important. Spring reverb. Spring reverbs emulate the sound of audio vibrations traveling through a metal spring or coil. They have a distinctive metallic sound with a characteristic boing or twang. Spring reverb can add a vintage, retro vibe to vocal performances, evoking the sound of classic recordings from the 1960s and 1970s. It's often used in lo-fi, surf rock, or vintage style productions to add character and charm to vocals. Let's explore how each reverb type fits into different musical genres. It's important to note that there are no hard and fast rules here, but this is a general guideline to get you started. Hall reverb. Genres, classical, orchestral, ballads, gospel. Hall reverbs provide a sense of grandeur and spaciousness, making them ideal for genres that benefit from a large, immersive sound. In classical music, they add depth and richness to orchestral recordings, while in ballads or gospel music, they create a sense of emotional resonance and drama. Room reverb. Genres. Jazz, acoustic, folk, singer-songwriter. Room reverbs offer warmth and intimacy, making them perfect for genres that emphasize a more natural and intimate sound. In jazz, they recreate the ambience of a small club or studio, enhancing the authenticity of the performance. In acoustic or folk music, they add a sense of closeness and intimacy, making the listener feel as though they're in the same room as the performer. Plate reverb. Genres. Pop, rock, R&B, country. Plate reverbs provide a glossy, polished sound that's well suited to genres that prioritize commercial appeal and radio friendliness. In pop and rock music, they add sheen and depth to vocal performances, making them sound larger than life and professional. In R&B and country music, they contribute to a smooth and polished vocal sound that's characteristic of these genres. Chamber reverb. Genres. Classical, orchestral, vocal jazz. Chamber reverbs offer clarity and definition, making them ideal for genres that require precise articulation and spatial separation of vocal performances. In classical and choral music, they enhance the clarity and articulation of vocal textures, allowing each voice to be heard distinctly within the mix. In vocal jazz, they create a sense of intimacy and presence, allowing the nuances of the performance to shine through. Spring reverb. Genres. Surf rock vintage rock, lo-fi, garage rock. Spring reverbs evoke a sense of vintage, retro vibe that's perfect for genres with a nostalgic or raw aesthetic. In surf rock and vintage rock music, they add character and charm to vocal performances, evoking the sound of classic recordings from the 1960s and 70s. In lo-fi and garage rock, they contribute to a gritty and authentic sound that's characteristic of these genres. All right, so let's walk through the different reverb types and have a listen to how each one sounds. For this demonstration, I'm just going to use a few different reverbs, mainly Verb Suite Classics, just because there are all of the different reverb types aside from Spring, which we will use a different plugin for that. So first off, we've got Hall. So let's find a Hall. Amsterdam Hall. Let's listen to how Amsterdam Hall sounds like. We're going to have it 100% wet and then we can dial that in as well. I want you to just hear the reverb in its rawest form and then we can start to blend in the dry as well. Oh. And let's dial that in. Oh. For anything, gonna let it do and abandon it. So it's really rich, there's a long tail, the decay can be dialed in, but right off the bat, we've got quite a long decay, and we're getting this really lush, regal, warm, blossoming reverb. Oh, I'm not looking for anything, gonna let it do and it. Surrender at the door, 
let go of all control. Let's have a listen to a couple of the different reverb halls. Oh, I'm not looking for anything, gonna let it do soon abandon it. So of course each one has different tonal characteristics, slightly shorter and longer decays, of course you can dial that in as well, but I just want to highlight how these sound, what the characteristics are of these, and really try to help you internalize it so that when you think of hall, room, plate, chamber, spring, the associated characteristics come to mind. Gold Hall, let's just listen to how that sounds. Oh, I'm not looking for anything Gonna let it do soon abandon it Surrender at the door Let go of all control Forget my name, leave it on the floor oh. Okay, so let's now look at a room reverb. Now, we're using the same unit here as I want to just keep things simple, let's just click back room. And let's listen to the differences between hall and room. First of all, let's just listen to the room itself, get a sense for its characteristics. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do soon abandon it. Surrender at the door. So this has a far shorter decay. That's the first thing that jumps out at me. And there's less of this lush feel. It feels a lot tighter, partly because of the decay. And also it feels like it's around the vocal more in terms of the stereo spectrum. So let's have a listen to the hall, 100% wet. Oh, So it feels a little more smeared in terms of the stereo spectrum. Of course, this is this particular hall, so we have to bear that in mind as well. But we have not only a far longer decay and a lusher, more regal feel, it feels a lot less tight and far more expansive. So let's listen to our room again. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. So we're getting this kind of slapback feel where it feels like the vocals are slapping off of uh, close by wall back into the microphone and we're creating a sense of width there with this room it feels far more tight as opposed to the hall so let's just dial that in a little bit oh i'm not looking for anything gonna let it do soon abandon it so it sounds like someone is singing in a room so it has this space that feels a lot more real to our ears. It feels like we're just placing the singer in an environment that we can identify in a space as opposed to it being completely dry. Whereas a hall feels a lot more dramatized. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Go Room? Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do soon and also what we can hear as well is with the rhythmic delivery of this particular vocal to my ears the hall kind of gets in the way of what's happening with these vocals oh i'm not looking for anything it's really rhythmic it's quite fast there's a lot of phrases put together as opposed to something that is elongated, it's more legato, there's more space between the phrases. That's when this hall, I think, would really come to life in the context of this particular vocal. I would go ahead with something a little shorter, like a room. So let's move on to a plate. So we've got our hall. I'll leave our room for now and we can have a little A-B between the room and plate. Bright plate. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do it. Now, of course, it says bright plate. The 
immediate thing that stands out to me is the tonal characteristics of this plate against the hall. The hall has a lot more low mid information. It's a lot warmer, whereas this plate has a lot more high mid and high information. It feels a little more transparent and it will add some brightness to the vocal. So let's have a listen to it. Let's dial that in and let's listen to how that sounds. Oh, I'm not looking for anything going. So immediately there's a shimmer that's in place. Oh, I'm not looking for anything go Let's listen to our room. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Tight slap back feel, plate. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it loose and abandon it. That has a lot of this shimmer and a far longer tail. Of course, the decay is longer as well, which adds to that. It feels a lot more dramatized like a hall, but in a slightly different way. Let's have a listen to a couple more plates. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it loose and abandon it. Let's flip back to a hall. Oh, I'm Looking for anything go plate. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do and abandon it. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. It feels a lot more right off the bat, like the hall is a lot more part of the dry signal. Let's try and get this perfect. 21.7, 21. Point seven. So we've got the same, everything is completely the same. We're just listening to the reverb type and model. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Go. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Go. So there's a lot more prominence with the hall, with the dry signal and the wet signal feeling like they live together as opposed to the plate, which sounds to my ears that the lead is still prominent. It still feels like it's living forward in the mix, but we have this shimmer around it and this long tail that is still away from it. So it just feels a lot cleaner and a lot more transparent as opposed to the hall. And both have their applications. If you want something that feels a lot more exaggerated, maybe a hall is the best way to go. And if you want something that sounds a little more expensive, can add shimmer, but still allows the vocal to feel up front and to have the reverb feel a little like it's sitting behind it or allowing the main meat of the vocal to be up front and center and then the reverb to live almost around it, maybe a plate is the best way to go. So let's have a listen to a chamber. So this is really interesting. It has a really long decay. However, it doesn't feel as lush and all enveloping as the hall. Let's have a listen to our plate. Oh. Let's listen to our chamber. It feels a lot denser than the plate. The plate feels a little thinner. We've still got this shimmer, this tail, but there isn't as much of this really long, dense reverb. And then our chamber. 129. Let's see if we can match the decay. So there's a lot more of the tail being pronounced, even though the decay is totally the same. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Oh. 
it also feels like it pushes the vocals even further back even though we're completely wet for both let's just have a quick listen oh. There's some more mid-range reflections that are being captured with this chamber. Let's have a flick through a couple more chambers because of course a lot of this stuff is dependent on the model as well. Oh. This feels a lot more spacious, the plate, whereas the chamber feels a lot denser. So you might want to use a chamber on some backing vocals, maybe some harmonies, a stack of vocals that come in in one section that you really want to be drenched and dense with reverb. And you might want to use a plate on a lead vocal where you want something to feel still very prominent and upfront, but a little more expensive to have a little more shimmer and a sense of tail and space around it. And finally, let's move on to our spring reverb. So this is just a stock spring that comes with Logic. And this is really fun to play around with. It's got a very distinct style. So let's have a listen to it 100% wet. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do some it. So we can hear these kind of the springs, the coils actually boinging and resonating, which is really interesting. We've got some different styles. We've got boutique, we've got simple. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Slightly different tonal characteristics. It's adding a little bit of saturation as well. Vintage. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do some it. We hear a little less of those coils, but compared to the simple, you can't really hear the coils as much. Only when you stop and hear the tail can you kind of hear that boingy sound. So let's listen to the boutique. Oh, I'm Vintage. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Slightly different tonal profile. Bright. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. We've got a lusher, longer decay. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. And then resonant. can really hear those coils resonating with this resonant one and of course you can play around with the tone here and we are being really aggressive with it you know we can dial that in oh i'm not looking for anything gonna let it do some abandon it so it almost sounds like someone is recording through a kind of really strange cheap reverb but that's that's a style that's a, a sound that you could play around with if you wanted something to sound like that here you've got resonant spring box oh i'm not looking for anything go oh i'm not looking for anything go let's try bright oh i'm not looking for anything this is adding some shimmer. You can't hear those coils as much in the context of it being blended in. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. A lot thinner. It feels uh, a little less dense. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. Gonna let it do some abandon it. That has a different tonal characteristic. Oh, I'm not looking for anything. 
We can hear those springs coming in, which adds a little bit more movement as well in between these gaps. So you could use a spring, like we said, you know, in something that you want to sound a little more vintage, in something that you want to add a more interesting and strange character to, create a little bit more movement by accentuating those little springs coiling about together. There's no hard and fast rules here. With time and, you know, experimenting with the reverbs that you have and the different types, you'll get a sense for what you like personally as well and develop a sense of taste and also what the song calls for and have some creative ideas as to how you want to process different parts of your vocal and different sections within the song. So there you have it. Here are the reverb types and their associated sounds. Reverb plays a crucial role in vocal production, offering a wide range of creative possibilities for shaping the sound, depth, and emotional impact of vocal performances, creating depth and space. Reverb adds depth and dimension to vocal recordings by simulating the acoustic characteristics of different environments, such as concert halls, rooms, or chambers. It creates a sense of space around the vocals, making them sound more immersive and three-dimensional in the mix. Enhancing presence and ambience. Reverb can enhance the presence and ambience of vocal performances, making them stand out and blend seamlessly with the rest of the instrumentation. By adding a subtle wash of reverb, vocals can be placed within a virtual space, creating a sense of intimacy or grandeur depending on the chosen reverb type. Setting the mood and atmosphere. Reverb can contribute to the mood and atmosphere of a vocal performance, evoking different emotions and sonic textures. For example, a lush hall reverb may impart a sense of elegance and grandiosity to a vocal performance, while a tight room reverb may create a more intimate and cozy vibe. Adding texture and character. Reverb can add texture and character to vocal recordings, enhancing their sonic qualities and making them more interesting to the listener. Different reverb types such as plate, spring or chamber reverbs offer unique sonic characteristics that can complement the style and genre of the vocal performance. Blending and gluing the mix. Reverb helps to blend and glue vocal performances with the rest of the mix, creating a cohesive and unified sound. By simulating the natural reflections and reverberations that occur in real acoustic spaces, reverb helps vocals sit more naturally within the mix creating a sense of sonic cohesion. Adding movement. Reverb can be automated or modulated to create movement and dynamics in vocal productions. By adjusting parameters such as decay time, pre-delay or modulation depth, engineers can create dynamic and evolving reverb effects that enhance the emotional impact of vocal performances. Popular reverb models. Here are a few popular reverb models used in a wide range of genres. Valhalla Room. Valhalla Room is a versatile reverb plugin known for its lush and natural sounding reverbs. It offers a wide range of algorithms inspired by various types of acoustic spaces, from small rooms to large halls. Valhalla Room is widely used in modern production for vocals across a variety of genres. Its customizable parameters and high quality algorithms make it suitable for adding depth, dimension, and ambience to vocal performances. FabFilter Pro R. FabFilter Pro R is a high quality reverb plugin known for its intuitive interface and transparent sound. It features algorithmic reverbs with precise control over parameters such as decay time, brightness, and modulation. FabFilter Pro R is popular among producers and engineers for vocals in modern production. Its clean and natural sounding reverbs are well suited for enhancing vocal performances while maintaining clarity and articulation. Valhalla Vintage Verb Valhalla Vintage Verb is renowned for its authentic vintage reverb. Okay, I actually need to pause you right there because unfortunately YouTube has a 12 hour upload limit. So what you need to do now is hop on over to our website and keep watching there. And we've actually got another four hours or so left of this course. You don't need to enter your email address or anything like that. You can simply click over and start watching. Then if you want to save your progress and stay in the loop about new free courses that we release in the future, you do have the option of creating a free user account. And we 
also have a bunch of other in-depth courses over there on EQ, compression and reverb, along with replays from all of our virtual events, which are full mixes and masters where you can watch everything come together. So if you want to keep watching, you can just go to marshing.com and click free courses, or just click the link in the bio and it will take you straight there. Okay, see you there.